Section 58 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas O. Selfridge for the Killing of Charles Austin. Boston, Massachusetts, 1806. Part 9. Mr. Dexter, gentlemen of the jury, it is my duty to submit to your consideration some observations in the close of the defense of this important and interesting cause. In doing it, though I feel perfectly satisfied that you are men of pure minds, yet I reflect with anxiety that no exertion of zeal on the part of the defendant's counsel can possibly ensure justice unless you likewise perform your duty. Do not suppose that I mean to suggest the least suspicion with respect to your principles or motives. I know you have been selected in a manner most likely to obtain impartial justice, and doubtless you have honestly resolved and endeavored to lay aside all opinions which you may have entertained previous to this trial. But the difficulty of doing this is perhaps not fully estimated. A man deceives himself oftener then he misleads others, and he does injustice from his errors when his principles are all on the side of rectitude. To exhort him to overcome his prejudices is like telling a blind man to see. He may be disposed to overcome them and yet be unable because they are unknown to himself. When prejudice is once known, it is no longer prejudice. It becomes corruption. But so long as it is not known, the possessor cherishes it without guilt. He feels indignation for vice and pays homage to virtue, and yet does injustice. It is the apprehension that you may thus mistake, that you may call your prejudices principles, and believe them such, and that their effects may appear to you the fruits of virtue, which leads us so anxiously to repeat the request that you would examine your hearts, and ascertain that you do not come here with partial minds. In ordinary cases, there is no reason for this precaution. Jurors are so appointed by the institutions of our country as to place them out of the reach of improper influence on common occasions, at least as much so as frail humanity will permit. But when a cause has been a long time the subject of party discussion, when every man among us belongs to one party or the other, or at least is so considered, when the democratic presses throughout the country have teemed with publications, fraught with appeals to the passions and bitter invective against the defendant, when on one side everything has been done that party rage could do to prejudice this case, and on the other little has been said in vindication of the supposed offender, though on one occasion I admit that too much has been said, when silence has been opposed to clamor and patient waiting for a trial to systematic labor to prevent justice, when the friends of the accused, restrained by respect to the laws, have kept silence because it was the exclusive right of a court of justice to speak, when no voice has been heard from the walls of the defendant's prison, but a request that he may not be condemned without a trial. The necessary consequence must be that opinion will progress one way, that the stream of incessant exertion will wear a channel in the public mind, and the current may be strong enough to carry away those who may be jurors, though they not know how or when they receive the impulse that hurries them forward. I am fortunate enough not to know, with respect to most of you, to what political party you belong. Are you Republican Federalists? I ask you to forget it. Leave all your political opinions behind you, for it would be more mischievous that you should acquit the defendant from the influence of these than that an innocent man by mistake should be convicted. In the latter case, his would be the misfortune, and to him would it be confined. But in the other, you violate a principle, and the consequence may be ruin. Consider what would be the effect of an impression on the public mind, that in consequence of party opinion and feelings, 
the defendant was acquitted, would there still be recourse to the laws and to the justice of the country? Would the passions of the citizen, in a moment of frenzy, be calmed by looking forward to the decision of courts of law for justice? Rather, every individual would become the avenger of imaginary transgression. Violence would be repaid with violence. Havoc would produce havoc. And instead of a peaceable recurrence to the tribunals of justice, the specter of civil discord would be seen stalking through our streets, scattering desolation, misery, and crimes. Such may be the consequences of indulging political prejudice on this day. And if so, you are amenable to your country and your God. This I say to you who are Federalist, and have I not as much right to speak thus to those who are Democratic Republicans? That liberty which you cherish with so much ardor depends on your preserving yourselves impartial in a court of justice. It is proved by the history of man, at least civil society, at the moment the judicial powers become corrupt, liberty expires. What is liberty but the enjoyment of your rights, free from outrage or danger? And what security have you for these but an impartial administration of justice? Life, liberty, reputation, property, and domestic happiness are all under its peculiar protection. It is the judicial power, uncorrupted, that brings to the dwelling of every citizen all the blessings of civil society and makes it dear to man. Little has the private citizen to do with the other branches of government. What to him are the great and splendid events that aggrandize a few eminent men and make a figure in history? His domestic happiness is not less real because it will not be recorded for posterity. But this happiness is his no longer than courts of justice protected. It is true, injuries cannot always be prevented, but while the fountains of justice are pure, the sufferer is sure of a recompense. Contemplate the intermediate horrors and final despotism that must result from mutual deeds of vengeance when there is no longer an impartial judiciary to which contending parties may appeal with full confidence that principles will be respected. Fearful must be the interval of anarchy, fierce the alternate pangs of rage and terror, till one party shall destroy the other, and a gloomy despotism terminate the struggles of conflicting factions. Again, I beseech you to abjure your prejudices. In the language once addressed from heaven to the Hebrew prophet, Put off your shoes, for the ground on which you stand is holy. You are the professed friends, the devoted worshippers of civil liberty. Will you violate her sanctuary? Will you profane her temple of justice? Will you commit sacrilege while you kneel at her altar? I will now proceed to state the nature of the charge on which you are to decide, and of the defense which we oppose to it. Then examine the evidence to ascertain the facts, and then inquire what is the law applicable to those facts. The charge is for manslaughter, but it has been stated in the opening that it may be necessary to know something of each species of homicide in order to obtain a correct idea of that which you are now to consider. Homicide, as a general term, includes in law every mode of killing a human being, the highest and most atrocious is murder, the discriminating feature of which is previous malice. With that, the defendant is not charged. The grand jury did not think that by the evidence submitted to them, they were authorized to accuse him of that enormous crime. They have therefore charged him with manslaughter only. The very definition of this crime excludes previous malice. Therefore, it is settled that there cannot with respect to this offense, be an accessory before the fact, because the intention of committing it is first conceived at the moment of the offense and executed in the heat of a sudden passion, or it happens without any such intent in doing some unlawful act. It will not be contended that the defendant is guilty of either of these descriptions of manslaughter. Neither party suggests that the defendant 
was under any particular impulse of passion at the moment, and had not time to reflect. On the contrary, he is said to have been too cool and deliberate. The case in which it is important to inquire whether the act was done in the heat of blood is where the indictment is for murder, and the intent of the defense is to reduce the crime from murder to manslaughter. But Selfridge is not charged with murder. There is nothing in the evidence that has the least tendency to prove an accidental killing while doing some unlawful act. It is difficult to say from this view of manslaughter, when compared with the evidence on what legal ground the defendant can be convicted, unless it be that he is to be considered as proof guilty of a crime which might have been charged as murder, and by law, if he now stood before you under an indictment for murder, you might find him guilty of manslaughter, and therefore you may now convict him. This does not appear to be true, but the evidence would not apply to reduce the offense from murder to manslaughter on either of the aforementioned grounds. Perhaps it may be said that every greater includes the less, and therefore manslaughter is included in murder, and that it is on this principle that a conviction for manslaughter may take place on an indictment for murder. I will not detain you to examine this, for it is not doing justice to the defendant to admit for a moment, even for the sake of argument, that the evidence proves murder. Our time will be more usefully employed in considering the principles of the defense. Let it be admitted, then, as stated by the counsel for government, that, the killing being proved, it is incumbent on the defendant to discharge himself from guilt. Our defense is simply this, that the killing was necessary in self-defense, or in other words, that the defendant was in such imminent danger of being killed or suffering other enormous bodily harm, that he had no reasonable prospect of escaping but by killing the assailant. This is the principle of the defense stripped of all technical language. It is not important to state the difference between justifiable and excusable homicide, or to show to which the evidence will apply, because by our law, either being proved, the defendant is entitled to a general acquittal. Let us now recur to the evidence and see whether this defense be not clearly established. Mr. Dexter then went into a minute examination of the whole evidence. In the course of it, he endeavored to prove that Mr. Selfridge went on the exchange about his lawful business and without any design of engaging in an affray, that he was in the practice of carrying pistols, and that it was uncertain whether he took the weapon in his pocket in consequence of expecting an attack, that if he did, he had a right so to do, provided he made no unlawful use of it, that the attack was so violent and was so dangerous a weapon that he was in imminent danger, that it was so sudden and himself so feeble that retreat would have been attended with extreme hazard, that the pistol was not discharged until it was certain that none would interfere for his relief and that blows, which perhaps might kill him, and probably would fracture his skull, were inevitable in any other way, and that the previous quarrel with the father of the deceased, if it could be considered as affecting the cause, arose from the misbehavior of old Mr. Austin, and that the defendant had been greatly injured in that affair. It cannot be necessary, gentlemen, for the defendant to satisfy you beyond doubt that he received a blow before the discharge of the pistol. There is positive evidence from one witness that the fact was so, and other witnesses say much that renders it probable. But if the defendant waited until the cane was descending, or even uplifted within reach of him, reason and common sense say it is the same thing. No man is bound to wait until he is killed, and being knocked down, would disable him for defense. The killing can be justified only on the ground that was necessary to prevent an injury that was feared, not that it was to punish for one that was past. This would be revenge and not self-defense. The same law authorities which tell you that a man must retreat as far as he can 
say also that if the salt be so violent that he cannot retreat without imminent danger, he is excused from so doing. If this means anything, it is applicable to our case, for perhaps you can hardly imagine a more violent or more sudden assault. Unto this is added the muscular debility of the defendant. It certainly forms a very strong case. He could neither fight nor fly. Had he attempted the latter, he must have been overtaken by his more athletic and active antagonist, and either knocked down or maimed or murdered, as the passions of that antagonist might dictate. But it is said, and some passages from law books are read to prove it, that the necessity which excuses killing a man must not be produced by the party killing, and that he must be without fault. You are then told that the defendant sought the affray and armed himself for it, and that he had been faulty in calling Mr. Austin the father, opprobrious names in the newspaper. As to the affray being sought by the defendant, there is no evidence to support such an assertion, but what arises from his conversations with Mr. Richardson and Mr. Whitman, or from the fact of his having a pistol in his pocket, these only prove that he was prepared to defend himself if attacked, and if he did defend himself lawfully, this is the best evidence to show what was his intention. It cannot be presumed that he took the pistol with an unlawful intent, when he never expressed such intent, and when his subsequent conduct was lawful. He had been informed that he should be attacked by a bully. In such case was his duty. Was he bound to shut himself up in his own house? Was he bound to hire a guard? If he had done so, this would have been urged as the strongest evidence of his intention to commit an affray. Could he obtain surety of the peace from a future assailant, whose name was unknown to him? Or was he bound to go about his business, constitutionally feeble and unarmed, at the peril of his life? There would be more color for this suggestion if the defendant had gone on the exchange and there insulted either old Mr. Austin or his son, or voluntarily engaged in altercation with either of them. But he went peaceably about his ordinary business, and made use of his weapon only when an unavoidable necessity happened. A man went about to travel a road, infested with robbers, lawfully arms himself with pistols. If he should be attacked by a robber, and from necessity kill him? Is he to be charged with having sought this necessity, because he voluntarily undertook the journey, knowing the danger that attended it, and took weapons to defend himself against it? As little is the defendant to be censured for going about his ordinary business, when he knew that it would be attended with danger in arming himself for defense, in case such an emergency should happen as that the laws could not afford him protection. I have here supposed that the pistol was taken for the purpose for which it was used. This, however, is far from being certain from the evidence, as it is in proof that the defendant had daily occasion for pistols in passing between Boston and Medford, a road that has been thought attended with some danger of robbery, and that he sometimes carried pistols in his pocket. There is not the least pretense for saying that he expected an affray with young Mr. Alston. He could not presume that his father would employ him, and it is not probable that he knew in the confusion that the sudden attack must have produced. As to the publication in the newspaper against old Mr. Austin, though this might be in some sense a fault, it is far from being within the principle established by the books when it is said the party must be without fault. It is evidence that nothing more is meant than that he must be without fault in that particular transaction. If we are to leave this and look back, where are we to stop? Are we to go through the life of the party to examine his conduct? If the defendant had libeled Mr. Austin, that was a previous and distinct offense for which he was and yet is liable to an action or an indictment, and unless it be presumed without evidence and against all probability that it was intended to produce this affray, it can have no connection with the principle stated. There is another obvious motive for it, 
and there is nothing in the evidence tending to convince you that it was intended to provoke an attack. The defendant had been defamed. Retaliation was the natural punishment, and there is no reason to presume that anything more was intended unless it was to want the shafts of calumny or Mr. Austin by destroying his credit and standing in society. It is true that it is said by several respectable compilers of law that the party killing must be without fault, but they all refer to one adjudged case, which is found stated in 1 Hawkins PC 440, and by recurring to the statement of this case, it appears that the persons who killed and would have excused it on the ground of necessary self-defense had forcibly entered and deceased the rightful owner of a house and contained forcibly to detain it against him, in an attempt by the owner forcibly to recover possession. Those who held wrongfully were reduced to the necessity of killing, and it was holden that, as they were then engaged in an unlawful act, namely, forcibly detaining the house against him who had a right to enter, they had produced this necessity by their own wrongful conduct, and therefore it should not excuse them so that this principle seems to be related to another, and in reality to be involved in it. I mean the well-known principle, that he who kills another by accident, while performing an unlawful act, should be guilty of manslaughter. It would be absurd that a man who kills by accident, while performing an unlawful act, should be guilty of manslaughter. And yet he who kills from design, while performing unlawful act, however necessary it may have become, should be guiltless. It is settled that if on a sudden affray, A makes an assault on B, and afterwards the assault be driven to the wall so that he can retreat no farther, and then kill B necessarily in his own defense, that is excusable homicide in A. And yet here, A was in fault in this very affray, by making the first assault, but having afterwards retreated as far as he could, the law extends to him the right of self-defense. This shows that unless at the moment of killing the party be doing wrong, the principle contended for on the other side does not apply. In proof of this, I will also read to you an authority from one Hales PC 479. There is malice between A and B. They meet casually. A assaults B and drives him to the wall. B in his own defense kills A. This is se defendendo, and shall not be heightened by the form of malice into murder or homicide at large, but was not a killing on a form of malice, but upon a necessity imposed upon him by the assault of A. A assaults B, and B presently thereupon strikes A without flight, whereof a dies. This is manslaughter in B, and not, C defendendo. But if B strikes A again, but not mortally, and blows past between them, and at length B retires to the wall, and being pressed upon by A, gives him a mortal wound whereof A dies, there is only homicide, se defendendo. Although that B had given divers other strokes, that were not mortal before he retired to the wall, or as far as he could. But now suppose that A, by malice, makes a sudden assault upon B, who strikes again in pursuing hard upon A. A retreats to the wall, and in saving his own life, kills B. Some have said this to be murder, and not say defendendo, because A gave the first assault. Crop Fall 22b, grounding upon the book of 3 Edward 3, itinerary North Corona, 287. But Mr. Dalton, ubi subra, thinketh it to be se defendendo, though A made the first assault either with or without malice, and then retreated. I am bound in candor to add that the law, as above laid down on the authority of Dalton, has since been doubted as to that part of it which supposes previous malice. This passage has been reviewed by Hawkins at East in their several treatises 
on common law, and I have chosen it to read from this very circumstance, because it appears that it has been well considered, and when subsequent and eminent writers of full examination reject a part and admit the residue to be law, it is strong confirmation of that residue. It is that alone on which I rely, and it is amply sufficient to prove what I have before stated, that if A first assault B on a sudden affray without malice, A may still excuse killing B from a subsequent necessity in his own defense, and yet none will deny the first assaulting B, though without malice, was a fault. On this point, I submit to your consideration one further remark. The publication in the newspaper is nothing more than provoking language. Now, if the defendant had immediately before the affray made use of the same language to old Mr. Austin, no lawyer will pretend that this would have been such a fault as would have precluded the defendant from excusing himself for the subsequent necessary killing on the principle of self-defense. If it were so, we should find it so stated in books of authority that treat on this subject, but the case must often have happened as provoking language generally precedes blows. On the contrary, we find it settled that even making the first assault does not deprive the party of this defense. It would be absurd, then, to say that rude and offensive language, which cannot even justify an assault, should produce this effect. It can hardly be necessary to add that, if these words spoken at the moment would not have deprived the defendant of this defense, having published them before in a newspaper, cannot produce this consequence. I have hitherto admitted that the publication in the newspaper was a fault in the defendant, nor am I disposed entirely to justify it. Its circumstances existed, which went far to extenuate it. It had been defamed on a subject, the delicacy of which, perhaps, will not be understood by you, as you are not lawyers without some explanation. Exciting persons to bring suits is an infamous offense for which a lawyer is liable to indictment and to be turned away from the bar. It is so fatal to the reputation of a lawyer that it is wounding him in the nicest point to charge him with it. It is the point of honor, and charging him with barratry or stirring up suits is like calling a soldier a coward. Mr. Austin, the father, had accused the defendant publicly of this offense, respecting a transition in which his conduct had been punctiliously correct. The defendant first applied to him in person, and with good temper, to retract the charge. Afterwards, in conversation with Mr. Welsh, Mr. Austin acknowledged the accusation to be false, and promised to contradict it publicly as he had made it. Yet he neglected to do it, Again he said he had done it, but the fact appeared to be otherwise. This induced the defendant to demand a denial of it in writing. Though Mr. Austin privately acknowledged he had injured Mr. Selfridge, yet he refused to make him an adequate recompense when he neglected to make the denial as public as the charge. This was a state of war between them upon the subject, in which the more the defendant annoyed his enemy, the less power he had to hurt him. It was therefore a species of self-defense, and Mr. Austin, who had first been guilty of defamation, perhaps had little cause to complain. To try the correctness of this, we will imagine an extreme case. Suppose a man should have established his reputation as a common slanderer and calumniator by libeling the most virtuous and eminent characters of his country from Washington and Adams, down through the whole list of American patriots. Suppose such a one to have stood for twenty years in the kennel, and thrown mud at every well-dressed passenger. Suppose him to have published libels, until this style of defamation has become as notorious as his face. Would not every one, that such conduct was some excuse for bespattering him in turn? I do not apply this to any individual but it is a strong case to try a principle, and if such conduct would amount almost to a justification of him who should retaliate, 
will not the slander of Mr. Austin against Mr. Selfridge furnish some excuse for him? It has also been stated to you, gentlemen, and some books have been read to prove it, that a man cannot be justified or excused in killing another in his own defense unless a felony was attempted or intended. Some confusion seems to have been produced by this, which I will attempt to dissipate. It has been settled that if a felony be attempted, the party injured may kill the offender without retreating as far as he safely can. But that if the offense attended be not a felony, he cannot excuse the killing in his own defense, unless he so retreat, provided circumstances will permit. On this principle, all the books that have been read to this point may easily be reconciled, but the position contended for by the opposing counsel is in direct contradiction to one authority which they themselves have read in the fourth volume of Blackstone's Commentaries, page 185. The law is laid down as follows. The party assaulted must therefore flee as far as he conveniently can, either by reason of some wall, ditch, or other impediment, or as far as the fierceness of the result will permit him, for it may be so fierce as not to allow him to yield a step, without manifest danger of his life or enormous bodily harm, and then in his defense he may kill his assailant instantly, and this is the doctrine of universal justice. And now I am to consider homicide se defendendo, which seems to be where one, who has no other possible means of preserving his life, from one who combats with him on a sudden quarrel, or of defending his person from one who attempts to beat him, especially if such attempt be made upon him in his own house, kills the person by whom he is reduced to such an inevitable necessity. From these two highly respectable authorities, it appears that, Though nothing more be attempted than to do great bodily injury, or even to beat a man, and there be no possibility of avoiding it, but by killing the assailant, it is excusable so to do, when the weight and strength of the cane, or rather cudgel, which the deceased selected, is considered, and the violence with which it was used, can it be doubted that great bodily harm would have been the consequence if Selfridge had not defended himself. The difference between this weapon and the pistol made use of by the defendant, perhaps, is greatly exaggerated by the imagination. The danger from the former might be nearly as great as from the latter. When a pistol is discharged at a man in a moment of confusion and agitation, it is very uncertain whether it will take effect at all. And if it should, the chances are perhaps four to one that the wound will not be mortal. Still further, when the pistol is once discharged, it is of little or no use, but with the cane a man, within reach of his object, can hardly miss him, and if the first blow should prove ineffectual, he can repeat his strokes until he has destroyed his enemy. If it were intended to excite contempt for the laws of the country, a more effectual method could hardly be taken than to tell a man who has a soul within him that if one attempts to rob him of a ten-dollar bill, this is a felony, and therefore esteemed by the law an injury of so exaggerated a nature that he may lawfully kill the aggressor, but that if the same man should whip and kick him on the public exchange, this is only a trespass to which he is bound to submit rather than put in jeopardy the life of the assailant, and the laws will recompense him in damages. Imagine that you read in a Washington newspaper that on a certain day, immediately on the rising of Congress, Mr. A. of Virginia called Mr. B. of Massachusetts a scoundrel for voting against his resolution and proceeded deliberately to cut off his ears. Mr. B. was armed with a good sword cane, but observed that his duty as a citizen forbade him to endanger the life of Mr. A., but that cutting off a man's ears was by law no felony, and he had read in law books that courts of justice were the only proper vindici in jury arum, and that he doubted not that by means of a lawsuit 
he should obtain a reasonable compensation for his ears. What are the emotions excited in your breast at this supposed indignity? An exemplary patience of the representative of your country. Would you bow to him with profound respect on his return? Or rather, would not his dignity and usefulness by universal consent be lost for ever? We have now taken a view of the facts and the positive rules of law that apply to them, and it is submitted to you with great confidence that the defendant has brought himself within the strictest rules and completely substantiated his defense by showing that he was under a terrible necessity of doing the act, and that by law he is excused. It must have occurred to you, however, in the course of this investigation, that our law has not been abundant in its provisions for protecting a man from gross insult and disgrace. Indeed, it was hardly to be expected that the sturdy hunters who laid the foundations of the common law would be very refined in their notions. There is, in truth, much intrinsic difficulty in legislating on this subject. Laws must be made to operate equally on all members of the community, and such is the difference in the situations and feelings of men that no general rule on this subject can properly apply to all. That which is an irreparable injury to one man and which he would feel himself bound to repel even by the instantaneous death of the aggressor, or by his own, would be a very trivial misfortune to another. There are men in every civilized community whose happiness and usefulness would be forever destroyed by a beating, which another member of the same community would voluntarily receive for a five-dollar bill. With the laws to authorize a man of elevated mind, and we find feelings of honor to defend himself from indignity by the death of the aggressor, they must at the same time furnish an excuse to the meanest chimney sweeper in the country for punishing his sooty companion, who should fillip him on the cheek by instantly thrusting his scraper into his belly. But it is too much to conclude from this difficulty in stating exceptions to the general rule that extreme cases do not furnish them. It is vain and worse than vain to prescribe laws to a community which will require a dereliction of all dignity of character and subject the most elevated to outrages from the most vile. If such laws did exist, the best that could be hoped would be that they would be broken. Extreme cases are in their nature exceptions to all rules. And when a good citizen says that, the law not having specified them, he must have a right to use his own discretion on the subject. He only treats the law of his country in the same manner in which every Christian necessarily treats the precepts of his religion. The law of his master is, resist not evil. If a man smite thee on one cheek, turn to him the other also. No exceptions to these rules are stated. It does not every rational Christian necessarily make them. I have been led to make these observations, not because I think them necessary in the defense of Mr. Selfridge, but because I will have no voluntary agency in degrading the spirit of my country. The greatest of all public calamities would be pusillanimous spirit that would tamely surrender personal dignity to every invader. The opposing counsel have read to you from books of acknowledged authority that the right of self-defense was not given by the law of civil society, and that that law cannot take it away. It is founded, then, on the law of nature, which is of higher authority than any human institution. This law enjoins us to be useful in proportion to our capacities to protect the powers of being useful by all means that nature has given us, and to secure our own happiness as well as that of others. These sacred precepts cannot be obeyed without securing to ourselves the respect of others. Surely I need not say to you that the man who is daily beaten on the public exchange cannot retain his standing in society by recurring to the laws. Recovering daily damages will rather aggravate the contempt that the community will heap upon him, nor need I say 
that when a man has patiently suffered one beating, he has almost ensured a repetition of the insult. It is a most serious calamity for a man of high qualifications for usefulness and delicate sense of honor to be driven to such a crisis. It should it become inevitable. He is bound to meet it like a man, to summon all the energies of the soul, rise above ordinary maxims, poise himself on his own magnanimity, and hold himself responsible only to his God. Whatever may be the consequences, he is bound to bear them, to stand like Mount Atlas. When storms and tempests thunder on its brow, and oceans break their billows at his feet, do not believe that I am inculcating opinions tending to disturb the peace of society. On the contrary, they are the only principles that can preserve it. It is more dangerous for the laws to give security to a man disposed to commit outrages on the person of his fellow citizens than to authorize those who must otherwise meet irreparable injury to defend themselves at every hazard. Men of eminent talents and virtues on whose exertions in perilous times the honor and happiness of their country must depend will always be liable to be degraded by every daring miscreant if they cannot defend themselves from personal insult and outrage. Men of this description must always feel that to submit to degradation and dishonor is impossible. Nor is this feeling confined to men of that eminent grade. We have thousands in our country who possess this spirit, and without them we should soon deservedly cease to exist as an independent nation. I respect the laws of my country and revere the precepts of our holy religion. I should shudder at shedding human blood. I would practice moderation and forbearance to avoid so terrible a calamity. Yet, should I ever be driven to that impassable point, where degradation and disgrace begin, may this arm shrink palsy from its socket if I fail to defend my own honor. It has been intimated that the principles of Christianity condemn the defendant. If he is to be tried by this law, he certainly has a right to avail himself of one of its fundamental principles. I call on you then to do to him as in similar circumstances you would expect others to do to you. Change situations for a moment and ask yourselves, what would you have done if attacked as he was? And instead of being necessitated to act at the moment and without reflection, take time to deliberate. Permit me to state for you your train of thought. You would say to this man who attacks me, appears young, athletic, active and violent. I am feeble and incapable of resisting him. He has a heavy cane, which is undoubtedly a strong one, as he had leisure to select it for the purpose. He may intend to kill me. He may, from the violence of his passion, destroy me without intending it. He may maim or greatly injure me. By beating me, he must disgrace me. This alone destroys all my prospects, all my happiness, and all my usefulness. Where shall I fly when thus rendered contemptible? Shall I go abroad? Everyone will point at me the finger of scorn. Shall I go home? My children, I have taught them to shrink from dishonor. Will they call me father? What is life to me after suffering this outrage? Why should I endure this accumulated wretchedness which is worse than death, rather than to put in hazard the life of my enemy. Ask yourselves whether you would not make use of any weapon that might be within your power to repel the injury, and if it should happen to be a pistol, might you not, with sincere feelings of piety, call on the Father of mercies to direct the stroke? While we reverence the precepts of Christianity, let us not make them void by impractical construction. They cannot be set in opposition to the law of our nature. They are a second edition of that law. They both proceed from the same author. Gentlemen, all that is dear to the defendant in his future life is by the law of his country placed in your power. He cheerfully leaves it there. Hitherto he has suffered all that his duty as a good citizen required 
with fortitude and patience, and if more be yet in store for him, he will exhibit to his accusers an example of patient submission to the laws. Yet permit me to say in concluding his defense that he feels full confidence that your verdict will terminate his sufferings. End of section 58《Section 59 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas O. Selfridge for the Killing of Charles Austin, Boston, Massachusetts, 1806, Part 10. The Attorney General. Gentlemen of the jury, it is my official duty to close this cause on the part of the government. If I can perform this duty by a simple, accurate, and intelligible arrangement of the facts, and a just and pertinent application of the legal principles which they are governed, I shall be satisfied. I will not play the orator before you, or pretend to make the speech if I was capable. I would not do it on this occasion. Circumstanced as I am, nothing but my duty could induce me to undertake the task. No pecuniary reward could engage me in the cause. Nothing, I repeat it, but the sense I have of my official duty and a compliance with the public expectation could induce me to appear this day before you on this occasion. But I thank God that through a course of what may be called a long life, I have had firmness to do my duty when I had a duty to do. The prosecution of this cause on the part of the government has been conducted in every respect similar to prosecutions in other cases on like occasions. When it was said that one of our fellow citizens in the open street at noonday had undertaken to destroy the life of another, it was necessary to inquire by what authority he did it, what legal process or warrant of law he had, but conduct of such consequence to the public, as well as to an individual citizen. Is there any cause of wonder that on the day it happened, he should be apprehended and carried before a magistrate, who exercised the same power in this particular as he would have been obliged to do had it been the case of either you gentlemen of the jury or any other member of the community. The magistrate found the killing to have been voluntary and not occasioned by any accident. What ought the magistrate to do? Was he to undertake to decide the difficulties which you have to encounter in this case? Was he to undertake to say that the act of the killing amounted to murder or manslaughter? or to justifiable or excusable homicide. The magistrate was bound to commit him to take his trial, to which he is now brought. Was there anything wrong in this? If there was, he had the remedy in his own power. The Supreme Court, upon a habeas corpus, might have set him at liberty. It is a writ of right, and would have been granted if by law it ought, as of course if he had applied for it. If he chose to decline the application and lay in prison, he had his reasons for it. He as a lawyer must have known the consequences. Would not every other man in the community have had to suffer a like inconvenience with that sustained by the defendant under similar circumstances? Certainly they would. Why then this warm and eloquent address to the passions and feelings of the public? Do they expect to influence you, gentlemen of the jury? and divert your attention from the justice of the case by an appeal to the feebleness of his health and the weakness of his person? Is it to injure the reputation of the officer who, ex officio, moved the commitment of the defendant to prison that his counsel apply to your compassion and tender feelings? Be it so, but I hope that I shall continue conscientiously to discharge the duties of my public function regardless of every other consideration than that of the duty which I owe the commonwealth. It is said that a great crowd has attended the court during this trial, and we are asked the reason. Many, I suppose, attend from curiosity. 
Is it to be wondered at that a crowd attended? Also at the exchange on the day that the defendant shot the young man in State Street, the human mind naturally shudders at death, and when a man destroys his fellow citizen, it naturally draws the attention of all men to the fact. The insinuation respecting a crowd in this courtroom seems to glance at party spirit, but had party spirit anything to do with the crowd that assembled on the exchange? One man, man has struck another out of being, so far as being depends upon his existence in this world. Is it marvelous that the public attention should be on tiptoe on this occasion? Is the agitation anything more than the effect of nature's laws? Is it anything more than the uniform principle of our wholly revealed religion? Is it not the voice of God? It is true, when the crowd assembled in State Street, an inquiry was made. Who was the man that did this? The defendant boldly stood forth and said, I am the man. And it appears that he raised himself in the middle of the crowd to make the declaration. He had courage in the midst of this universal cry of who is the man that has done this, to stand forth and avow himself the perpetrator. But courage is not the criterion of truth. This firmness of nerve, this unexampled boldness has not changed the nature of the cry, nor can give it us the law to govern the fact. Does the definition of an offense or the rights of men in civil society depend on the character of individuals or the different constitutions of men? The question before you is this. Has the government produced evidence to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant killed Charles Austin in the manner and form as set forth in the indictment? If you are satisfied of this question, then the burden of this cause has devolved upon you, and you must undertake it, whatever may be the consequences. If you are not satisfied of this fact, there is no further inquiry to be made. But if you are, then there is a second question. Has the defendant shown you beyond a reasonable doubt that the fact of killing, independent of any previous circumstances against him, attached to it, was done in such a manner as will render the killing lawful and excuse him from any share of guilt? Why this devolves upon him, I will show from an authority in which it is better expressed than I can express it in my own language. Faust, C.L. 255 In every charge of murder, the fact of killing being first proved, all circumstances of accident, necessity, or infirmity are to be satisfactorily proved by the prisoner, unless they arise out of the evidence produced against him, for the law presumes the fact to have been founded in malice, until the contrary appeareth. And very right it is that the law should so presume. The defendant in this instance standeth upon just the same foot that every other defendant doth. The matters tending to justify, excuse, or alleviate must appear in evidence before he can avail himself of them. And why must it devolve upon him? Because if he had a legal warrant, he could produce it whether there was malice or not. In killing, upon any legal authority, depends upon the feelings of the heart, and no man can be so well acquainted with them as the person who perpetrates the act. I will adduce another authority to the same point from 1 East CL 224. The implication of malice arises in every instance of homicide, amounting in point of law to murder, and in every charge of murder. The fact of killing be first proved, all the circumstances of accident, necessity, or infirmity are to be satisfactorily proved by the prisoner, unless they arise out of the evidence produced against him. The question you have before you is whether the defendant has proved either accident or necessity, as fully as the government has proved the fact of killing. If he has not, he is guilty of the homicide charged in the indictment. Has he proved circumstances that will reduce it to excusable homicide, or that he has done nothing but what he had a right to do? If there was any premeditation, a share of blame attaches itself to the fact, though it were but momentary. The law makes it a crime in that case, 
and it cannot be less than manslaughter. But if the defendant has proof beyond a reasonable doubt by the evidence he has offered, or what arose out of the evidence offered on the part of the government, that the fact of killing, in the manner it was committed, independent of any previous circumstances attached to it, or explanatory of it, was excusable homicide. Yet if the government has given convincing proof of a premeditation, his excuse cannot avail him. First, have we proved the fact of killing? That is admitted to be proved beyond doubt. And you have secondly to inquire whether the defendant has given evidence to justify what he has done, or to show it to be excusable from a legal necessity. Thirdly, you will inquire whether the government has given evidence of such facts and circumstances previous to the transaction as will take from the defendant all his claim of excuse and render him guilty of a felonious homicide. These three questions include every fact and every principle of law that can arise in the cause. They will embrace and call into examination every circumstance which has been given in evidence by the witnesses and every principle of law by which the facts are to be governed and decided upon. This cause is an important one, and presents to our discussion a question of principles. It is of no consequence who are the parties, or what the facts are, on which the issue rests, otherwise than to call into examination the principles that are to guide you to a verdict. It would be desirable to lay out of the question the persons of the deceased and the defendant, and to consider the cause in the abstract, as if between persons of whom you had never before heard. The principles on which this cause is to be tried must stand or fall by themselves, without any regard to the parties. The principles on which the issue rests must be fixed and determined. Without fixed and permanent principles, religion itself is a delusion. Morality is a cheat. Politics are a source of oppression and cruelty, and the forms of law but the vehicle of corruption, the mask of chicane and injustice. Principles are no other but the primordial nature of things upon which systems are predicated for the use and happiness of rational nature. Without those, all is insecurity and confusion. The world is a waste. Society is a curse, and life itself but a dream of misery, while religion, founded in the self-existence of the deity and the relation of man to the divine nature, while morals, predicated upon the connection between man and man as brethren, while stubborn nature, fixed on eternal and unchangeable laws, deny to yield to man the inflexibility of their principles, he is left to raise for himself those systems of civil social government and jurisprudence which are best adapted to his situation and circumstances, and in this society is left to decide for itself. When the sovereign will of the civil community has arranged these, the obligation of each member to submission becomes a moral obligation. Crimes result from disobedience. To disobedience penalties must be attached. Despotism is adapted to a state of savage barbarity, where fear is the only motive to action or forbearance. Yet even there, the will of the people, let it be founded in what it may, either in prudence or in cowardice, is the foundation of the sovereignty. A monarchy and aristocracy, mixed together to form a government, supports a state of servile dependence where the hopes of favor and interest exclude the idea of reward for merit, bring patriotism and public virtue into base contempt, and render fraud, deceit, chicane, and cunning the insolent claimants of the rights of truth, talents, and integrity. In a free government only, it is that principles founded in the nature of social virtue can claim the decision of what is right between man and man or between an individual and civil society, without the corruptions arising from the destruction or irregularity of rights and privileges, from party distinctions, from the frauds of chicanery, 
incident to factitious morals and cunningly devised systems of religion and policy. I will not spend any more of your time by such an appeal as has been made by the counsel for the defendant who have preceded me. I will not invoke you to put aside your prejudices if you have any. An appeal on this head is altogether nugatory, but if you will not obey the obligation which devolves upon you from your situation resting on your consciences by the sacred solemnity of an oath, you are not to be reasoned into it by the powers of rhetoric. I therefore consider it as improper to attempt it. I conceive that it must necessarily follow from the circumstances of your situation that a verdict will be given upon the facts according to the rules of law. To a jury acquainted with the obligations of an oath, a caution against being led astray by their prejudices is to caution them against acting corruptly and against doing willfully wrong. If their oath cannot guide their consciences, I should despair of guiding them by anything that I can say. I should have spared myself these observations as altogether irrelevant to the issue, had not the defendant's counsel gone largely and learnedly into the subject, and urge you to do your duty free from the influence of party prejudices, regardless of the clamors of newspaper writers or addresses to the people. In this caution, the counsel for the government heartily concur. The misconduct of newspapers in publishing matters relative to a trial, while it is pending, is to be deprecated. So is all conversation tending to spread false reports. Yet such are the feelings of mankind throughout the world that they will talk and also print on such subjects where the press is free. It is one of those alloys which mingle with the precious metals. Better it is to enjoy the freedom of the press though attended with this inconvenience, than to restrain it by governmental laws, as is the case in every other country. The impressions made in that way are very inconsiderable. The enlightened minds of this jury are above all considerations. Arising from that source, whatever you may have heard out of doors is left at the threshold of this sanctuary of justice and passes by like the idle wind and is no more regarded than the whistling of a schoolboy trudging along with his satchel in his hand. As the report of this cause will probably be published, the world will judge how far your decision is made up from the testimony you have heard at this bar. They will know how to estimate the various reports you have heard, and the newspaper clamors, and the artfully devised handbills. These, with the papers themselves, will be consigned ultimately to the neglect they deserve. One man has killed another. The laws of God and of our government call upon you to inquire if he can excuse himself. This is no light subject. There is an omniscient judge before whose seat we shall all appear to answer for our conduct on this solemn day. We must therefore decide with purity and integrity if we expect to avoid the judgment pronounced against those who corrupt the tribunals of human justice. I will place a mirror before your eyes, by which each of us can compare the fairness and justice of his intentions in the case, and perceive how far he is misled by his prejudices or political principles. Suppose the slander which is said to be traced to the father of the deceased was correct, and suppose B. Austin to have gone forth armed with a deadly weapon in expectation of an assault from Selfridge or his friends, that Selfridge had made an attack on him, as young Austin did on Selfridge, and Austin the father had with the weapon carried as Selfridge carried his, killed him at noonday in a crowded street. What would be your verdict on such a case? I flatter myself. Your verdict will be the same as that which you will give in this cause. This is the standard of security. This is the solid tenure by which our fellow citizens hold their equal right to public justice, ensured to us by our Constitution and our laws. End of section 59
Section 60 of America's State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas O. Selfridge for the Killing of Charles Austin. Boston, Massachusetts, 1806, Part 11. The counsel for the defendant has addressed you with warmth and energy, as a politician. He supposes you to consist of two conflicting parties, and with elegance of manner and strength of language, peculiar to himself. He has conjured you to lay aside all political impressions, whether they be favorable to the Federal Republican or Democratic Party. He particularly addressed himself to those who are of the same way of thinking as himself. I will imitate him in some degree, but I will address you as being all of the same way of thinking as myself, for I believe none of you wish to subvert the government or infringe the law. If, then, you mean to support our happy constitution and obey the dictates of our holy religion, you are of the same party as myself. Would you break up the foundation of the great deep and destroy the basis of the present federal government, and leave it to chance, when or how we should obtain another. You may think the present constitution might be made better, but it might be made worse, and though like other human inventions it has its imperfections, you would not necessarily encounter the hazard. I say then, you are all of my party. If you prefer our democratic government to a monarchy, an aristocracy or a mixed government, then we all think alike. Is there one of you who would alter our system of jurisprudence or relinquish the inestimable right of trial by jury? If there is not, then, you all think as I do. If there is one of you who thinks the millions of money expended at the city of Washington in the public buildings and improvements for the accommodation of the general government which serves to tie the several states of this continent in the indissoluble knot of perpetual union and amity. If you think that money well employed is a mean of producing that grand effect, I think so also. Is there one of you but believes that State House on Beacon Hill was intended for and will produce the happy purpose of combining the interests of the several parts of the state of Massachusetts? Although attended with expense, it may prove a blessing. All of you join in this belief. I also am of your opinion. The gentlemen who are strangers and reporting this cause will pardon me for being so local. They are not perhaps acquainted with our domestic politics, but I love and feel for my native state, and the circumstance I have alluded to has been of importance. If you think of your union at home in our foreign relations, as Washington the great and good thought, and as he has written in his farewell address to the citizens of the United States, you will engrave it on the tablet of your memory, teach it to your children, and bind it as a talisman to your heart, in order to perpetuate the freedom of our common country to the end of time. Is there one of you who would engage your country in foreign wars, in order to benefit a few great men who would become the leaders, as they have been the agitators of such a desperate measure. The consequences of war are known to many who hear me. Never more do I wish to see the parched earth of my country, drenched with the blood of my fellow men, the tender mothers, wives, and children, flying from their dwellings into the wilderness to escape the foe. You, gentlemen of the jury, are friends to the peace of your country, and therein I cordially join with you. I address you as the lovers of your country, and there is no difference in our opinions. To return from this episode to the question in the cause, I will proceed to inquire whether the fact of T.O. Selfridge's killing young Austin is proved by the government. That catastrophe has been clearly made manifest by the testimony of Dr. Danforth, Edward Howe, John Lane, Ichabod Frost, Isaac Warren, and many others. I will not attempt an argument on it. The second question is, has the defendant shown you, 
beyond a reasonable doubt, that the fact of killing was done under such circumstances as that it was lawful, and he is excusable of blame? In this inquiry, and certainly it is an important one, we must have some guide, some settled rule, some law, some known established principles, or society no longer exists. A confused state of nature reigns. Every man's arm, his art, or his cunning is his own safety, and every man is the avenger of his own wrongs. Had I the sentiments expressed by my learned brother, Dexter, feeble and imbecile as I am, I would go forth from day to day in arms, trusting in mine own arm alone, with the aid of such weapons as my strength would bear. Magistrates should be avoided, and the volumes of laws become pavement for the soles of my shoes. Many things are said by the professional men, in the feelings and warmth of debate, which, in their cooler moments, they would gladly retract. Upon the manner and measure of resentment or self-defense, is there no law fixed but the different feelings of men? Are there men, nay, a multitude of men, who have a natural right, from their feelings and a high sense of honor, to defend themselves when and where others of less feelings could not do it in the same manner? And is this the voice of nature which makes the exception? Is this sense of honor in those feelings a privileged exception to those individuals above the rules of the gospel? Is the rule, do to others as you would be done unto, reduced to the standing that a juror shall acquit the defendant if he believes he should have acted himself by the same motives or been seduced by the same temptation? Is there then a distinction between the would-be nobleman and the chimney-sweeper? For I suppose these from the distinction taken by the defendant's counsel to the alpha and omega, the head and the tail, are the links that form civil society. Is there a distinction between them as to the privilege of self-defense? And is the push of the sweep, or a stroke with the scraper, at the head of his comrade to be murder in him, whilst the would-be noble shall be allowed with his gold-hilted cane? or his elegantly mounted pistol in defense of his honor, to play a secure but mortal game, and be justified in killing, on a like provocation, either his friend or his foe, or, as in this case, a man he is said hardly to know. You are not then to determine his case by the circumstances attending it, but by the nice sense of honor of the gentleman, or the distinction and dignity of his station in life. What then has become of that part of the Constitution, which declares ours to be a government of laws, and not of men? If the law does not apply equally to A and B, and so through every letter of the alphabet, how can it be said that every man holds his life and fortune by the same tenure as his fellow citizens, whatever may be his rank or his condition or standing in society? We are told that there are a number of men in society who will, with their own arm, vindicate their rights and stand the guardians of their own honor. There may be such men, but I do not know them. I hope I shall not meet with any citizen who does not rely for his safety on the laws of the government and the justice of civil society. But we are told that the laws of Christianity lend us a defense by our own arm, and we are asked how then, the laws of society can regulate this matter. I do not admit this position to be just. All men are bound to surrender their natural rights upon entering into civil society, and the laws become the guardians of the equal rights of all men. Why are duels criminal if the men who engage in them have this privilege of maintaining their own honor? It is said the defendant was driven to such an awful crisis that he could not extricate his honor, and his counsel asked, what could he do? I answer, appeal to the laws. But say they, the laws are ineffectual, suits are slow of remedy, and uncertain in their end. Where would such reasoning lead us? You have it in testimony that the defendant reasoned in this way, and that mode of reasoning brought on this sad event. 
You have heard his counsel in a strain of eloquence, advance the same idea, and make a personal application of the principle. No man, said he, is bound to surrender his own honor. If I do, I wish my arm may be shriveled by the palsy and dropped from its socket. No, I will vindicate my own honor to the death. I would rather that he should retain the use of his limbs, as well as the faculties of his mind, in order to employ them in the true field of honor, the defense of his country, when necessity may require their exertion. The defendant's counsel are obliged to adopt the same erroneous course of reasoning in order to justify him. Have we, then, as a civil society, higher authorities than our own law books to appeal to, on such an occasion? Are there such as the counsel on the other side would not shrink from, on the penalty of his life? We will not take up the glove. We will rest our defense, both of the lives and honor of our fellow citizens, upon the laws of the land. We will trust to them rather than to a deadly weapon for our protection. Such declarations as are made by the gentlemen on the other side would countenance all the duels that have been fought in the world and render unavailing all the laws that have been enacted for the punishment of illegal and savage combats. It is said that the defendant adopted this course because the tardy steps of the law were too slow to keep pace with his rapid stride to obtain immediate vengeance. What if his fame and character had been injured? Has he superior privileges? Or ought he not take the common lot of his countrymen? Has he any excuse more than others? Has he the excuse even of an officer? He is both a lawyer and a gentleman, but this does not give him a right beyond what all the individuals of this society possess. If the defendant suffers on this occasion, he will have to suffer no more than what every other person who should perpetrate a similar act must suffer, while controlled by the laws of his country. If he is innocent, he will be acquitted. If he is guilty, he will take the common lot of other men. I do not feel any interest in what your verdict may be, further than that justice in the common way and on general principles should be done. Is the measure of a man's conduct, when he leaps the bounds of written established law, to receive a standard from the feelings of his wife and children, or the notions of honor in the congregation of fashionable men? And can a man appeal to heaven in this way? and be a pious Christian? When I heard that this doctrine had been advised on this occasion by professional men, I shuddered at it. Gentlemen, not being able to fathom this abyss of troubled waters, not having the courage and firmness to cast away the guardianship of social protection and the laws, not having an imagination that can show the lines of security beyond those of the civil government, I will yet believe the laws to be fully adequate, where we have time to apply to them, and I will fondly suppose that I am, to every possible purpose, in a state of civil society and social security. The laws may be so imperfect, but human nature is so, that the remedy may be slow, and below my wishes, but I will not claim to be my own judge. I will not say that I have a right to appeal to this arm to avenge an injury whilst the law affords me a complete remedy. The defendant's counsel asked how he could have gone home to his wife and children, with his honor stained by the blow he had received on the public exchange from young Austin. I put a case hypothetically. If a man of honor and great irritability of nerves should have received a blow, could he appeal to the laws of his country without tarnishing his honor or injuring his family? If his wife was a virtuous woman, she would applaud his moderation and be gratified in teaching her children to pursue a similar course through their future lives. No person would deem him disgraced by the blow, though he had not destroyed his adversary. If we are to return to the barbarous times so well described by Robertson in his history of Charles V, where every great man was to go armed with his trained bands behind him, in order to encounter any whom he might meet, without regard to laws either human or divine. 
if heroism and honor and chivalry are to return. We may expect to see again those combats so well described in the well-known ballad of Trevi Chase, and this promised land flowing with milk and honey to be turned into a field of battle and crimsoned by the blood of our fellow citizens. I trust we are now too far advanced in civilization to return from the light of this day to the barbarisms of the 13th century, when the interposition of the authority of the Pope and his council became necessary in order to prohibit these misadventures. Whatever opinions we may have of the Roman Catholic religion, we are indebted to its influence for this one good deed, which all the potentates of Europe combined together could not have effected. There is something in this cause which has unnecessarily been introduced, and which I wish to lay out of the question before we proceed. The gentleman on the other side is above personalities in a cause of this importance, but he draws a picture in the darkest colors, and leaves you to point to the original. He says that someone has been standing in the gutter for twenty years past, throwing mud at every well-dressed gentleman that passed by, and that he can have no ground of complaint if he should be a little spattered himself. I ask whether if this was true, that a man had done this, is he to be outlawed? Is he and his family to be hunted and shot down at noonday? That is not the punishment for libels. If he is to be condemned for libeling, let the innocent man among his accusers cast the first stone. I have had my share of such opprobrium, but it never came into my mind to redress myself by shooting one of my fellow citizens. He wrote against Washington, they say. So did Hamilton. He wrote against Adams and others of his administration. So did Alexander Hamilton and others. But Austin authorizes me to deny the charge of his writing against Washington. Who wrote against Hancock and Samuel Adams and Washington and all the great men who produced the revolution? Are all those writers outlawed? If any of them were punished, it was in pursuance of the laws of the country. We have no check beyond that. Who is there of consequence enough to deserve notice, but is the object of daily slander? Does Benjamin Austin do all this? Where will these ideas carry us? Are they compatible with the elegant expostulations of both my brethren against party political prejudice? I think they would carry us back to the barbarous ages, in which case it will become necessary for every man to become an expert combatant. These ideas will, I presume, excuse robbery in those who are too proud to beg. Shall we lower our notions of honor and condescend to bring our feelings to the rules of law? We should then have to inquire whether the defendant has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the fact of killing was committed in such a manner as to render it lawful and excuse him of all blame. In this, the first inquiry is, was the death a voluntary killing? That is to be decided by the weapon and manner. Was it by justifiable or legal warrant? Was it an accident? Was it on a sudden provocation? Was it on a sudden combat? Or was it done in pursuance of a design unlawful in itself and unjustifiable by the established laws of our government? Should you be satisfied from the opinion of the court that it is of no consequence as the evidence is whether the pistol was fired before a blow was given by the deceased? You will be much relieved, but if that fact should be considered as important in this case, you will then have to inquire. First, was the assault previous to the mortal wound? Second, was it at the same instant? Or, third, was it after the mortal stroke? In these inquiries, what shall guide you? Are you left to the nice feelings of a man of honor, to be decided on his apprehensions of the moment? to make a separate law in each case as it arises? Or are there established laws to guide you? The Constitution has fixed a system by which the courts of justice are to be governed. These books which have been cited contain those laws, which are laws, though they were not made by the legislative authority. They were made by the voice of the people. And this, which is the highest authority, 
has said that these books shall be the law of the land. But this I refer you to the sixth section of the sixth chapter of the Constitution, where it is declared that all the laws, rules, and practices in the Judiciary Department, which have been heretofore adopted, shall continue to be law, until they shall be altered by the general court of this commonwealth. They were brought by your ancestors from the land of slavery. They have been wet with the mists of the Red Sea, washed in the waters of Jordan, and are now our garments of comfort in the promised land. Yes, in the promised land. You, young men, who have only heard of the revolution, may smile at the simile, but the venerable and aged members of this community, many of whom I see around me, know what it was to have passed through the wilderness, through difficulties and dangers almost unparalleled. Those will not willingly relinquish their principles. But these rules of the defendant entertained a grudge or ill will against the father of the deceased. Can the malice in such a case be transferred to the son? If it should appear that the defendant went out armed with a deadly weapon, with an expectation of beating the elder Mr. Austin, and did therefore kill the son, it would be such a malice as to constitute the crime of manslaughter at least. Now we come to an examination of the testimony which has been laid before you, and from which you will have to determine the degree of guilt incurred by the defendant. Was the assault of young Austin made upon Selfridge, previously to the firing of the pistol, that instrument which gave the mortal wound? To this point we had the testimony of John M. Lane and Joe Bass. I will make one or two observations on Lane's evidence. Mr. Lane said he was standing in his shop door and saw Selfridge fire the pistol, and the person who was fired at raised the stick and struck at Selfridge after the pistol was discharged. The evidence of shooting before the blow is from the testimony of Bass and Lane. How? Frost and others say they did not see any blow struck before the pistol was fired, but perhaps these two witnesses will be sufficient to satisfy your minds that the deadly wound was given before a blow was struck. And there is a distinction in law between an assault and battery. The counsel for the defendant have attempted to disparage the testimony of Mr. Lane without intending to impeach his moral character. Mr. Lane standing in society is above imputations of that sort. For my part, I am astonished that the circumstances of this case should not have been attended with greater variations than they appear to have from the witnesses on both sides. It is an extraordinary thing in a scuffle of this kind, at noonday, on the public exchange, done on the sudden that the testimony should come so near together as they do in respect to the time, place, etc. I shall not, however, insist that the pistol was fired before the assault was made. I come now to the second question, whether the killing and the blow were at the same instant of time, and here you have the testimony of a number of witnesses to prove that both happened at the same moment. I do not deny that from their testimonies an assault may be inferred, and that there was an intention on the part of young Mr. Austin to commit a battery. But I do deny that it was such an assault as it would justify the defendant in putting the assailant to death with a deadly mortal weapon prepared and charged on premeditation for the purpose. I now come to the consideration of another point, that the blow was given by Mr. Austin before the defendant gave the mortal wound. On this head, you have only the solitary testimony of Lewis Glover. I know nothing of his prejudices or party feelings, but he is quite a stranger to me. While on the stand, he told you that he had expected something would take place in the course of the day between Selfridge and Austin, the father of the deceased, that he meant to amuse himself by attending the exhibition. As in former days, the Romans had gladiators to amuse the public, so this witness watched the parties that he might see them sink below the character of men. He owns, however, that he might have been better employed. There, I agree with him. I think he would have been better employed if he had gone to a magistrate and apprised him of his suspicions, 
in which case the magistrate would have taken the necessary precaution to prevent the town of Boston being disgraced by actions of this kind. He says that he saw the deceased give one violent blow, which struck Selfridge on the hat, that he recovered his cane in order to repeat the stroke, and that the second blow and pistol went together. This, I say, is the solitary testimony of Glover, unless you take the testimony of Mr. Wigan as a corroboration of it. And even then, there are upwards of thirty others who were present at the time that know nothing of the circumstance. Mr. Wigan has said that he thought he heard a blow which sounded as if it had been struck upon a coat. Mr. Glover may be right and Mr. Wigan correct. Their stories are consistent, for Glover says the first blow was not so severe as those which followed. Therefore, its sound might be softened. There is another circumstance urged in the defense as going in support of this testimony. The defendant's hat was indented and broken, and there was a contusion on his forehead. This is answered in this way. All the witnesses agree to the fact that the subsequent blows were given with increased violence, so much so that several of the witnesses thought the charge had not taken effect, or the pistol had been only loaded with powder. You have heard the opinion of the physicians, and you learn from them that a wound in the lungs is not always mortal. They have mentioned a case where a part of the lobe of the lungs has been separated and the patient survived. You have heard of animals being mortally wounded, and yet leaping from the ground with increased muscular strength six or eight feet high. Similar observations must be familiar to every one of you gentlemen. Even the worm that you crush beneath your feet springs with manifest vigor from the assault. We need no argument in support of these remarks. Give pain to a fly or a spider, and you have ocular proof. Have we not, then, very full proof that this fracture of the hat and contusion of the forehead was the consequence of one or more of the blows subsequent to the discharge of the pistol? In that case, as it must have been done after the pistol was fired and the deceased had received his death wound, However grievous and heavy the stroke might be, it furnishes no excuse for a mortal wound previously given. I am requested to make an observation upon the testimony of young Mr. Fales, the favorite and classmate of the deceased. I do this merely because it is desired, not because it is necessary. The court and you have already seen that his testimony is correct. It is on facts which happened on the agitation of hurry and confusion, and can only be according to the best of his recollection. The defendant has brought Perkins Nichols and J. Osborne in order to discredit the testimony of young Fales. They say that they went to Mr. Austin's house, not, I apprehend, as the friends of Mr. Austin, to condole with him on the unfortunate death of his son, but to find and lay hold of any circumstance that might be beneficial at this trial, to their friend Selfridge. One of them, Mr. Nichols, made a memorandum of the conversation that had taken place, and he swears from that memorandum that Mr. Fales had said that the young man, meaning Mr. C. Austin, struck Selfridge before the pistol was fired, that at the time of this conversation, Mr. Fales appeared to be extremely agitated. There are two other witnesses, however, who were present at the same time, that declare that they did not hear any such declaration. But suppose such a declaration had been made by Mr. Fales to the father of the deceased. Can it not be accounted for by supposing that Mr. Fales, in order to soothe the parrot, who perhaps was half distracted at the horrid circumstance, that he should insinuate that his son was not wholly free from blame? and that he had struck at the defendant before the pistol was discharged. The character of that young gentleman would have been safe if I had said nothing about it. You have seen with what caution and diffidence he has delivered his testimony. It appears that his mind was in a state of confusion, occasioned by the death of his friend, and that he does not even to this day pretend to have a perfect recollection of the order of time in which the facts took place but admitting that the assault was made by the deceased before the defendant gave the mortal wound. 
you will have to inquire whether it was such an assault or such a battery as would justify the defendant in killing the deceased at that time, in such a place, and in that manner, with a formed intention and with a deadly weapon. My state of health and want of strength seem to forbid my doing full justice to a cause of this magnitude. I will, however, endeavor to add something more. To do this, I return to the inquiry, whether it is of any consequence that the blow was given after or before the mortal wound. This brings us to another question, whether, if the assault was made before the discharge of the pistol, the killing in that manner, and with such a weapon, was excusable. Was the defendant in such imminent danger of his life that he was obliged to slay the deceased as the only means of saving himself? The law in this point will be found in Foster's C.L., pages 276, 277, and 278. Two cases of self-defense are supposed, in the one a forfeiture of goods was incurred, in the other not. What, therefore, is the true import of the word self-defense upon chance medley, which the statute uses as description of that offense which did incur the forfeiture homicide? Per importunism, which hath been styled chance medley, cannot possibly be meant, for in that case the party killing is supposed to have no intention of hurt, whereas in the case the statue mentioneth, he is presumed to have an intention to kill or do some great bodily harm, at the time that death happened at least, but to have done for the preservation of his own life. The word chance medley, therefore, as it standeth in this statute, connected with self-defense, must be understood in the sense which coke and killing, in the passage already cited, say was the original import of it a sudden casual fray commenced, and carried on in heat of blood, and consequently self-defense, upon chance medley must, as I apprehend, imply that the person when engaged in a sudden affray, quitted the combat before a mortal wound be given, and retreated or fled as far as he could with safety, and then urged by mere necessity, killed his adversary for the preservation of his own life. This case bordereth very nearly upon manslaughter, and in fact in experience the boundaries are in some instances scarcely perceivable, but in consideration of law they have been fixed. In both cases it is supposed that passion hath kindled on each side, and blows have passed between the parties. But in the case of manslaughter, it is either presumed that the combat on both sides hath continued to the time the mortal stroke was given, or that the party giving such stroke was not at that time in eminent danger of death. He therefore, who in the case of a mutual conflict, would excuse himself upon the fault of self-defense, must show that before a mortal stroke given, he had declined any farther combat, and retreated as far as he could with safety, and also that he killed his adversary, through mere necessity and to avoid immediate death. If he faileth in either of these circumstances, he will incur the penalties of manslaughter. End of section 60《Section 61 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Thomas O. Selfridge for the Killing of Charles Austin, Boston, Massachusetts, 1806. Part 12. Whatever may have been advanced by the counsel to the contrary in this trial, yet by all the authorities it appears that while a man may defend himself against a felonious attack, there is a difference in the law between a felonious and a simple assault, and that this difference is determined by the circumstances of each case. If a man is assaulted by another with his fist or stick, not likely to kill, the other is not justified in employing a deadly weapon to kill the assailant. This runs through all the books, 
and it marks the intention of the person who employs such a weapon as being malicious. What were the facts in the rencontre between the defendant and the deceased? Supposing the former to have been attacked, was he likely to have been killed? You have seen the cane with which the deceased struck Selfridge. You know the place where the affray happened, and you have heard that it was done in the presence of numerous witnesses. Is it possible that under all the circumstances of this case, the defendant can be justified by the defense in preservation of his life, or that of his person for great bodily harm? Does it not absolutely appear to you in testimony that the defendant went to the exchange with a deadly weapon, concealed in his pocket or behind him, and that he was assaulted by young Austin with a walking cane? I will not stop to inquire whether the defendant was lawfully on the exchange, though an attempt has been made to prove to you that he was there by appointment on its lawful occasions. They have produced Mr. Ingraham to show that there was an appointment to meet at the exchange, that the appointment was made on Sunday, 3rd August, to meet the next day, in order to receive an execution which the defendant was to procure for Mr. Ingraham. This, the jury will observe, was an arrangement made by the defendant subsequent to his writing the advertisement against Austin, which appeared in Monday's paper and from the publication of which the affray is supposed to have arisen, and which he intentionally provoked by that piece of abuse. Laying aside every suspicion which may arise from these circumstances, yet we must inquire whether it was lawful for him to be there with a loaded pistol concealed in his pocket. Had he reason to apprehend, when he went on change, that he was in imminent danger of his life? From the testimonies of Mr. Richardson and Cabot, it does appear that this danger could have been avoided by a more prudent mode of conduct, and what was not his taking such measures, full evidence of a heart void of social duty, and so fatally bent on mischief as to be completely that kind of malice known in law under the description of malice aforethought. In the conversation he had with Cabot and Welsh, it was observed very clearly and deliberately that an attack would be made upon his person by someone employed by Mr. Austin. It does not appear, however, from the testimony that this information was correct, and the words used in the conversations were varied by the imagination of the reporter, who is one of those witnesses. He went so far in his supposition as to believe that a gentleman standing on the opposite side of the way with a whip in his hand, was the person employed to chastise the defendant and cautioned the defendant against it. Selfridge replied to him with a nod and air of indifference that he was prepared for the attack. Now, gentlemen of the jury, under these circumstances, what would you do? Would you conceal a weapon to kill your antagonist, as if you would act the assassin? Or would you not say openly, I am not good at fisticuffs, Neither have I learned the art of cudgeling, but if I am attacked and my life put in jeopardy, I carry openly in my hand a loaded pistol to defend myself against any felonious attack which may be attempted, if I cannot save myself without. Gentlemen, you would not have put a deadly murderous weapon in your pocket to conceal it until the voice of death should give utterance to a municipal right, circumstanced in this way. You would carry it openly in your hand, and by such manly, open conduct, would preserve yourself from any assault. But if the defendant brought the assault upon himself, by his previous conduct, in the publication of an advertisement, calling the father of the deceased a liar, scoundrel, and a coward, if he has provoked to combat by such opprobrious and abusive language, where are his grounds of defense? From the conversation he had a few minutes before with Mr. Richardson and Cabot, it is apparent that he was determined on shooting any person who might assault him in any manner, however lightly, on the exchange, that he had prepared himself for that purpose, and that he intended this two days before when he purchased the lead or the shot for casting the bullet. What is the law on this premeditation? 
clearly that the party was guilty of murder, that without such premeditation, if it was done on a sudden affray, the slayer is guilty of manslaughter. Will this feeble habit of body be a justification unto this premeditation? A man who is a cripple and can walk only with a crutch will be privileged to arm himself with a deadly weapon in order to kill any man who may assault him. He cannot be required to retreat to the wall because his lameness prevents him from running. The ground upon which he stands or the crutch upon which he leans is to him a wall, and he may shoot down his assailant. Thus the misfortune of decrepitude throws a subject into a state of nature and raises him above the control of or dependence on the laws of his country. Ought not the defendant in this case to have made some attempt to retreat or have called for help before he employed his deadly weapon in shooting the deceased? It will not be pretended that the attack was made with a felonious attempt, that Austin intended to rob or to kill him, Neither did the defendant understand it in that way, for he said in the conversation with Cabot and Richardson, which I have already alluded to, that he was not good at fisticuffs or cudgeling, but had prepared himself in another way. By this it appears clearly that the defendant expected to be attacked with a whip or a cane, and that he had determined to kill anyone who assaulted him in that manner was not the language he had used in the scurrilous advertisement calling B. Austin a liar, a coward, and a scoundrel. Such abuse as he might and did expect would be resented by a kicking or a caning. Is this reasonable view of a situation? He courted. How is it possible that the defendant could apprehend any other assault than a chastisement for his insolence, not an assault with a felonious intention? Even if the defendant had reason to fear a felonious attack, was there not such a want of caution and such premeditation, such malice on a previous quarrel, as will deprive him of the excuse he would otherwise have had? Shall we go into an examination of the right of one man to kill another for a simple assault? The counsel for the defendant have advanced this doctrine, the authorities they rely on are Grotius, Hawkins, and Fourth Blackstone, where a man is unexpectedly assaulted and kills another with a weapon he has in hand, and without time to reflect, these authorities do not infer malice from the nature of the instrument. But where a deadly weapon is prepared for the purpose, the case is widely different. Whether it was prepared for the purpose and whether it was worn as a part of dress, are prime considerations in all questions of this kind. We have much law on this point. In the trial of the soldiers in this town for homicide, which took place on March 5, 1770, on the very place where Austin was killed. In Wire's case and Abbott's case, more recently the distinction I now make were agreed to. In the trial of the soldiers it was agreed that their arms were legally in their hands that they marched into the street in obedience to the orders of Captain Preston, that they were sent to support and protect the sentries stationed at the door of the custom house. And it was admitted by the court that if they had not been there in obedience to the captain's order, they would have been guilty of murder, that the instruments they used were lawful instruments of labor, being such as by which they obtained their living. Had they laid down their guns and taken up other weapons, such as axes, hatchets, spades, or hammers, that would have brought the crime up to murder. It is true only two of them were convicted of manslaughter, but that arose from the particular circumstance of the case. Those men at that time were found guilty of manslaughter for doing that which was deemed to be their duty and attempted to be justified by the repeated assaults made by the town's people, by throwing lumps of ice, brick bats, and other missiles, and though, in fact, they did retreat to the wall, it was held to be manslaughter. Are the times so changed, and the laws so altered, that what was then held to be a felonious homicide shall now be considered in this town without any extenuating circumstances justifiable homicide? Has the distinction between Republicans and Federalists overset our Constitution? 
is the one under the protection of the law and the other left to a simple state of nature for his protection. I now come to a question which will fix the different shades of guilt on the various views of the fact. Was the defendant in nothing to blame in this unfortunate and bloody catastrophe? Was he, or was he not the provoker of this quarrel? If he was in any wise to blame in that respect, all the books concur that he cannot avail himself of any circumstances that may be set up in justification or excuse under pretense of necessity. And is there nothing to show that he promoted this quarrel? What is the nature of the advertisement that he wrote and caused to be published? Did he not understand and expect in the morning of the publication that it would provoke an assault, in consequence of which he unlawfully armed himself to be his own avenger? Before he put in this advertisement, could he not have informed Mr. Austin that he would defend himself as a gentleman? Or did he not write his advertisement in another manner? Could he not say that my reputation as a lawyer is of the first consequence to me, that Mr. Austin has represented that I solicited a lawsuit from the man who furnished the entertainment of the Republicans on the fourth day of July, that have prevailed upon the man to bring this suit against the Republican Committee, that I had convinced Mr. Austin that he was mistaken in the fact, and he promised me to contradict it, which he has hitherto neglected to do. Would not this statement have obtained the same credit with those who knew him? Where was the necessity of calling Mr. Austin a liar, coward, and a scoundrel, admitting the mistake? Why was it necessary to use the epithet coward unless he meant to provoke him up to an act of violence? Then he might have a pretext to kill him. That a combat of some kind was intended by the defendant is very apparent. Several of the witnesses have told you that they expected an attack by Mr. Austin upon Selfridge as the inevitable consequence of that publication. Did he recollect? when he gave this challenge the feebleness of his frame or the weakness of his nerves and limbs? And why did he not add in order to put Miss Austin upon his guard? I will not join with you in fisticuffs or cudgeling, but I carry a loaded pistol concealed in my pocket to kill anyone who shall dare attempt to horsewhip or cane me. Is it not true that the advertisement was the origin of this quarrel? If he was to blame in provoking it, if he went out unlawfully armed with a deadly weapon concealed in his pocket, expecting to be assaulted, and thereupon was assaulted, under a determined resolution to shoot the person who should assault him, and did actually kill the deceased the instant the assault was made, pursuant to a premeditated but concealed design, where is his ground of excuse or justification? If he has not made out to you, beyond any reasonable doubt, that he was compelled to kill young Austin in his own defense, it is your duty, and you are bound by your oath, to return a verdict that he is guilty. If he is not guilty of manslaughter, he is guilty of nothing on this indictment. His being guilty of murder cannot excuse him on this issue. Suppose the assault was not felonious, but the person assaulted has some reason to suppose it so. Is the person who is put upon his defense warranted in killing the assailant? It is a fixed principle in our laws that no man can be justified in killing another, but from unavoidable necessity to preserve his own life or property, which may be feloniously attacked. In every affray, where there is no felonious intent, it is a fixed principle that the person put upon his defense shall retreat as far as possible before he is justified in killing the assailant. A robber on the highway may be killed the instant he makes the assault. So may a burglar in the attempt to rob a house. So a woman may kill a man in the necessary defense of her chastity. But a woman knowing her chastity is to be assaulted must not put herself in the way of the assailant and kill him. For in that case, it will be considered that she had premeditated the destruction of the man's life, and this would constitute the crime of murder. And in like manner, 
If another expects to be assaulted, he must not go in way of the assailant with intention of killing by a concealed deadly weapon. Was such homicide to be allowed as lawful? Where would it lead us? Tools might openly and excusably be fought at noonday in the open street in the bosom of the town. Suppose a truckman to be taken by the nose and with the butt of his whip he strikes the person who assaults him and kills him dead with the stroke he is held guilty of manslaughter only. It is not excusable homicide, because the assault was not of that dangerous nature as to put his life in jeopardy. The instrument I have mentioned in this case is one belonging to his profession, and which he lawfully uses in pursuing his ordinary avocation. But suppose a truckman, imitating those gentlemen of nice honor, we have heard of, was to drive his truck about the streets armed with a sword by his side, and another truckman had run against his horses or his truck. The first had drawn his sword and killed the other with the thrust. This certainly would change the nature of the offense. Instead of manslaughter, it would be murder. Thus the degree of guilt resulting from the nature of the instrument is fully exemplified. A loaded pistol against a cane is equal to a sword against a truckman's whip. The truckman has nothing to do with the sword. The lawyer has no concern with this pistol. If a gentleman riding in his carriage should be run against by a hackney coachman, and he conceives that it was intended to injure his property in the carriage, or intended to kill his wife or children who may be with him, has he a right to fire his pistol and kill the hackney coachman on his box? This principle is contended for by the counsel on the other side, if supported, will go a much greater length than they acknowledge. He is not only justified in killing the coachman upon the assault, but he may be justified upon the mere apprehension. And supposing that the hackney coachman intend to cross him and struck the wheels of his carriage, he may spring out, and with a sword, which is a gentlemanly weapon, run the coachman through the body, under a pretense of apparent necessity to save his wife or children. Shall I add anything more in order to expose these extravagant and novel ideas of the privilege of self-defense? If, on every small misadventure or trifling assault, a man has a right to lay another dead at his feet, what nice calculations we are under necessity to be compelled to make. A man desirous of killing another, should only go to a lawyer and inquire the degrees of assault that would bring down murder to manslaughter, and manslaughter to excusable or justifiable homicide. One man has a higher notion of honor than another, and the various notions of honor must be the graduated scale upon which a jury is to determine the true degrees of guilt on homicide. This cannot be the law of our country. Yet some authorities have been read by the defendant's counsel to give it this coloring. I thought when they were read, they were but partially quoted. Grotius has been cited to show that the right of self-defense is what nature has implanted in every creature without any regard to the intention of the aggressors. I suspected that this general rule had some qualifications, and a little further on I find in the same author that the danger to which the person is exposed must be that of losing a limb or a principal member of his body or his life, and that there must be no possibility of avoiding the misfortune otherwise. These are the circumstances that authorize him lawfully and instantly to kill the aggressor. Further on, he observes that self-defense may sometimes be omitted, that it is not lawful for a Christian to murder a man for a box on the ear, or such other slight injury, or to avoid his running away. That murder in defense of our goods is permitted by the law of nature, but even here there must be an absolute necessity of killing the thief to save the goods. But this treatise of Grotius on the rights of war and peace, explaining the laws and claims of nature and of nations, and the principles that relate either to the civil government or the conduct of private life, is a treatise that was written on what was the law among the Romans and other ancient nations, 
particularly what is termed the civil law. He explains what is the law of nature, and he describes God as nature herself, and infers that men have all the rights in society which they possessed unto the revealed will of their creator. Where the protecting laws of the government cannot be applied, in this case, Selfridge had the whole state to protect him, even in a quarrel he provoked himself. In 1 Hawkins B. 1, Chapter 30, Section 1, it is held that homicide against the life of another, amounting to felony, is either with or without malice. That which is without malice is called manslaughter, or sometimes chance medley, by which we understand such killing as happens either on a sudden quarrel or in the commission of an unlawful act, without any deliberate intention of doing any mischief at all. The same author lays it down, that if he, who kills another on a sudden quarrel, was master of his temper at the time, he is guilty of murder, as if after the quarrel he fall into other discourse and talk calmly thereon. In 4 Blackstone 184, it is laid down as a principle that the person who kills another in his own defense should have retired as far as he conveniently or safely can to avoid the violence of the assault before it turns upon the assailant. There is a distinction in the law between a combat and a sudden affray. A combat is when two men meet by agreement to fight. In the present case, the defendant appears to be within the meaning of the word combat, for it appears he was told that there would be an assault. And to make it a combat, he went armed with a loaded pistol. The same author proceeds to say that the person shall not fictitiously appear to retire or to avoid the affray in order to catch his opportunity of killing the assailant, but from a real tenderness of shedding his brother's blood. Apply this doctrine to the present case and examine whether the evidence has shown to you that the defendant entertained this tenderness in shedding the blood of young Austin when he armed himself with a deadly weapon and concealed it in his pocket in order to shoot down anyone who should assault him. Can it be thought he had a tenderness against shedding human blood when he declined having a recourse to the laws of his country for protection, when he chose to take the vengeance into his own hands and perpetrated this act? Can it be thought He had that tenderness which the law requires in him, who shall unfortunately be driven from the necessity to shed his brother's blood. If the defendant had not written the advertisement, this quarrel would not have taken place. It was that which produced it. It appears that the consequences were produced exactly as he intended they should be, except that he killed one man instead of another. We trace the whole of the transaction and you will see the defendant bent on a bloody purpose. The letters of the 29th and 30th of July appear to have been intended to provoke a duel, but his counsel tell you that he was provoked to take these measures on account of the injurious words spoken by B. Austin. Suppose it true that Mr. Austin had spoken disrespectfully of the defendant, or that he had printed the most opprobrious slander of him, would it justify the defendant's going armed with the loaded pistol concealed in his pocket? The law holds that words either spoken or written can never justify an assault. It is of no consequence, therefore, whether B. Austin was to blame or not. The defendant ought not to have defended himself in this way. It is true that the reputation of a lawyer is of great importance to himself and to some of the community. As one of the profession, I wish the order was more respectable than the conduct of some of its members have lately rendered it. In that case, we should not at this day have heard the outcry against them, which seems to prevail too much throughout the United States. To me, the original conversation which is said to have occasioned this unhappy event does not appear necessarily to have involved the affront which the defendant seems to have conceived. From the testimony of Mr. Scott, we find that same gentleman had been joking Mr. Austin at Russell's insurance office on the Republican committee being sued for the expense of the dinner 
the party had on Copp's Hill, and that Mr. Austin, when he was going away, laughingly retorted that if a federal lawyer had not interfered, it would not have happened. It was a reply upon the other party, and was not a personal attack upon Mr. Selfridge. Mr. Scott inferred that he alluded to Mr. Selfridge, because he thought Mr. Austin addressed himself to him, as he was one of the federal party. Mr. Selfridge's reputation was not affected, but he pursues him with a dreadful vengeance, and throughout the whole appears to be determined to have him at his feet, alive or dead. How could he have suffered in his character or his business? Is there any Federalist who thinks it dishonorable to sue a Democrat? Or is there any Federalist who would decline to employ suffrage on that account? For my part, I apprehend from what I have seen on the present trial, there was no ground for what is said to be the apprehension of the defendant. On further observation, Mr. Carroll says that he heard the report of the pistol when he was at the post office, immediately after he saw Mr. Ritchie and Selfridge together, and Mr. Ritchie said to the defendant that he was extremely agitated, to which the defendant replied, I am not agitated. I have done what I intended to do or meant to do. Mr. Hastings says that he heard Selfridge speak also when it was inquired who had done the deed and say, I am the man. I am not agitated. Mr. Ritchie says that the defendant said, I know what I have done. I am not so much agitated as you are, and that he stood firm, erect, and upright. Does this look as if the killing was done upon a sudden affray? Would either of you gentlemen, who should have been driving your carriage, and had the misfortune to run over a poor child begging alms in the street, and kill him, stop short and say, I am the man who has done it. I know what I have done. I am not agitated. I am totally unacquainted with human nature, even at this advanced period of life, if there is a man among you but who would shudder at the accident and lament the effect of such carelessness. If any of you, in firing a gun, should be so unfortunate as to kill one of your neighbors without intending it, your hearts would be too full and you would be too much affected to flaunt in a confident manner that you were the man that had done it, that you had done nothing more than what you intended. If the defendant had killed young Austin by accident, he must have shown some degree of agitation, but he was cool and collected, and did no more than what he intended to do. This was true, or why did he carry with him a loaded pistol? If there is, in your opinion, any degree of premeditation, he must be at least guilty of manslaughter. I have, I think, candidly examined the case, and have done only that which appeared to me to be my duty to do. I did expect that the indictment would have been for murder. It ought on every principle to have been so. There is no precedent to the contrary. The testimony I had heard rendered such an indictment proper. Not that I wished that he should have been convicted of that offense, but because I thought it would furnish an opportunity for a full examination of the unfortunate event. The grand jury, having found a bill for manslaughter only, have, in some measure, restrained us from such an inquiry, and the opportunity we may have had of conducting the trial before a full bench of the Supreme Court. I have no doubt but what his honor, the judge who presides, will give you correct directions in his charge. But still it is not the charge of a full bench, and therefore cannot be so satisfactory as it might have been. I ought to have no expectation either that a wrong verdict will be given, or that the verdict, be it what it may, will throw the community into convulsions. Fear of consequences is an inadmissible principle in our judicial proceedings. Higher motives must urge us to our duty, and the base principle of fear can have no effect in the trial. If the defendant has suffered or must suffer, is it not the consequence of his own fault? And is it not right that one who avowedly raises himself above the law should suffer, rather than that the essential laws of society, the first laws of natural reason, 
and the law of God, promulgated by the highest sanctions, shall be set at defiance? Gentlemen, I consign this cause to you, to be decided according to the laws of our country. Which laws his honor will state to you from the bench? You will decide as in the presence of him who knows all our motives, and before whom we must all soon appear and have to answer, and in the presence of the whole human race, for the motives on which the present decision shall be formed. End of section 61section sixty two of american state trials volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org american state trials volume two by john d lawson trial of thomas o selfridge for the killing of charles austin boston massachusetts eighteen o six part thirteen the judge's charge parker j gentlemen of the jury as this most interesting trial has already occupied four days and as you must by this time be nearly exhausted i shall endeavor in discharging the duty incumbent on me to consume as little more of your time as may be consistent with the clear exposition of the principles necessary to be understood in order to form a just and legal decision you have heard the important facts in the case, minutely and distinctly stated by the witnesses, ably and ingeniously commented upon by the counsel, and the principles of law, elaborately discussed and illustrated in as forcible and eloquent arguments as were ever witnessed in any court of justice in our country. It is now left to you upon the whole view of the case, both of the law as it shall be declared to you by the court, and the facts is proved by the testimony to pronounce a verdict between the defendant and your country that in so important a trial it should have devolved upon me alone to preside over its forms as well as to declare the principles upon which your decision is to rest is by no means a subject of congratulation it is a situation which of all others i should have avoided had not official duty imperiously imposed it upon me. But the organization of the court and distribution of the services of its members are such as to have rendered any such arrangement difficult, if not impossible. Under our present judiciary establishment, all criminal cases other than capital are triable before one judge. And this system has proved itself to be eminently calculated for the dispatch of public business. Other provisions in the system ensure as great a degree of correctness as can be expected of any human institution. It is true that although at a term holden by one judge, if others are present, they may proceed together. But at this time, the court being in session in three, if not four several counties, it was impracticable. Had it been desirable to have more than two judges engaged in the present trial, the great delay which would have taken place, in consequence of a division of opinion, a case not unlikely to happen in the course of any trial, between two judges, rendered it altogether inexpedient that more than one should attend, and as this term has been previously assigned to me, the unpleasant task of officiating in the present case seemed unavoidably to belong to me, since it has thus fallen to me to execute a painful and anxious duty. I shall not shrink from the task of declaring to you the principles of law by which you are to be governed in your investigation and decision of this case. If in doing this I shall be found capable, in order to retain the favor of one class of the community, or to court that of another, of abusing my office by stating that to be law which I know to be otherwise. This is the last time I should be suffered to sit upon this bench, and I ought to meet the execration and contempt of the society to which I belong. The crime charged by the grand jury upon the defendant is manslaughter, a crime of high consideration in the eye of the law. 
This crime, however, is not defined by our statute, but its punishment is by it provided for. In order, therefore, to ascertain the nature and character of the crime, it is necessary to resort to the books of the common law, the principles of which, by the constitution of our government, are made the law of our land, until they shall be changed or repealed by our own legislature. The counsel for the government, as well as for the defendant, and therefore wisely and properly search the most approved authorities of the common law, for the principles upon which the prosecution or the defense must be supported. It is from those books alone that any clear ideas of the offense which is on trial or the defense which has been set up can be attained. The crime of manslaughter, according to those authorities, consists in the unlawful and willful killing of a reasonable being, without malice expressed or implied, and without any justification or excuse. That the killing of a human being, under some circumstances, is not only excusable, but justifiable, is proved by the very terms of this definition. Some persons, however, have affected to entertain the visionary notion that it is in no instance lawful to destroy the life of another, grounding their opinion upon the general proposition in the Mosaic Code, that whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall have his blood be shed. There is always danger in taking general propositions as the rules of faith or action, without attending to those exceptions, which if not expressly declared, necessarily grow out of the subject matter of the proposition. Were the physician above alluded to, true, in the extent contended for by some, then the judge who sits in the trial of a capital offense, the jury who may convict, the magistrate who shall order execution, and the sheriff who shall execute, will all fall within this general denunciation, as by their instrumentality the blood of man has been shed. The same observations may be applied to one of the precepts in the Decalogue. Thou shalt not kill, is the mandate of God himself. Should this be construed literally and strictly, then a man who, attacked by a robber, or in defense of the chastity of his wife, or of his habitation from the midnight invader, should kill the assailant, would offend against the divine command, and be obnoxious to punishment. But the common understanding of mankind will readily perceive that the very nature of man and principles of self-preservation will supply exceptions to these general denunciations. Our laws, like those of all other civilized countries, abundantly negative such unqualified definitions of crime and adopted certain principles by which the same act may be ascertained to be more or less criminal or entirely innocent, according to the motive and intent of the party committing it. Thus, when the killing is the effect of particular malice or general depravity, it is murder and punished with death. When, without malice, but caused by sudden passion and heat of blood, it is manslaughter. When in defense of life, it is excusable. When in advancement of public justice, in obedience to laws of the government, it is justifiable. These principles are all sanctioned by law and morality, and yet they all contradict the dogma that whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. It is not necessary for you to run a nice distinction between justifiable and excusable homicide. If the one now on trial be either the one or the other, it is sufficient for the purpose of the defendant. A distinction existed in England, which does not exist here. There the man who had committed an excusable homicide forfeited his goods and chattels, while he who had a justification forfeited nothing. Here, whether the homicide be justifiable or excusable, there must be an entire acquittal. Numerous authorities, ancient and modern, have been read to you upon this subject. Were it necessary for you to take those books with you and compare the different principles and cases which have been cited, your minds might meet with some embarrassments, there being in some instances an apparent, though in none, a real incongruity. 
but I apprehend you need not trouble yourselves with the books out of court, for I think I shall be able to state all the principles you will have occasion to consider, there being, in fact, no disagreement about them from the time of Sir Edward Coke, one of the earliest sages of the law, down to Sir William Blackstone, one of its brightest ornaments. These same principles, although taken from English books, have been immemorially discussed and practiced upon by our lawyers, adopted and enforced by our courts and juries, and recognized by our legislature. To prove this, I now need say no more than that the same learned Judge Trowbridge, who was quoted by the Attorney General in his charge to the jury in the trial of the soldiers of the massacre of 1770, laid down disgust and illustrated with great precision and clearness every principle which can come in question in the present trial. These principles I will endeavor to simplify for your consideration. First, a man who in the lawful pursuit of his business is attacked by another under circumstances which denote an intention to take away his life or do him some enormous bodily harm, may lawfully kill the assailant provided he use all the means in his power otherwise to save his own life or prevent the intended harm, such as retreating as far as he can or disabling his adversary without killing him, if it be in his power. Secondly, when the attack upon him is so sudden, fierce and violent, that a retreat would not diminish but increase his danger, he may instantly kill his adversary without retreating at all. Thirdly, when from the nature of the attack there is reasonable ground to believe that there is a design to destroy his life or commit any felony upon his person, the killing the assailant will be excusable homicide, although it should afterwards appear that no felony was intended. Of these three propositions, the last is the only one which will be contested anywhere, and this will not be doubted by any who are conversant in the principles of criminal law. Indeed, if this last proposition be not true, the preceding ones, however true when universally admitted, would in most cases be entirely inefficacious. And when it is considered that the jury who try the cause are to decide upon the grounds of apprehension, no danger can flow from the example. To illustrate this principle, take the following case. A, in the peaceable pursuit of his affairs, sees B running rapidly towards him, with an outstretched arm and a pistol in his hand, and using violent menaces against his life as he advances. Having approached near enough, in the same attitude, A, who has a club in his hand, strikes B, over the head before or at the instant the pistol is discharged, and of the wound B dies. It turns out that the pistol was loaded with powder only, and that the real design of B was only to terrify A. Will any reasonable man say that A is more criminal than he would have been if there had been a bullet in the pistol? Those who hold such doctrines must require that a man so attacked must, before he strike the assailant, stop and ascertain how the pistol is loaded a doctrine which would entirely take away the essential right of self-defense. And when it is considered that the jury who try the cause, and not the party killing, are to judge of the reasonable grounds of his apprehension, no danger can be supposed to flow from this principle. These are the principles of law, gentlemen, to which I call your attention. Having done this, I might leave the cause with you, were it not necessary to take a brief view of some other parts of it. As to the evidence, I have no intention to guide or interfere with its just and natural operation upon your minds. I hold the privilege of the jury to ascertain the facts, and that of the court to declare the law, to be distinct and independent. Should I interfere with my opinion on the testimony, in order to influence your minds to incline either way, I would certainly step out of the province of a judge into that of an advocate, all which I conceive necessary or proper for me to do in this part of the cause is to call your attention to the points of fact on which the cause may turn 
state the prominent testimony in the case which may tend to establish or disprove those points, give you some rules by which you are to weigh testimony, if a contrariety should have occurred, and leave you to form a decision according to your best judgment, without giving you to understand if it can be avoided what my opinion of the subject is. Where the inquiry is merely into matters of fact, or where the facts of the law can be clearly discriminated, I should always wish the jury to leave the stand without being able to ascertain what the opinion of the court as to those facts may be, that their minds may be left entirely unprejudiced, to weigh the testimony and settle the merits of the case. An important rule in the present trial is that on a charge for murder or manslaughter, the killing being confessed or proved, the law presumes that the crime as charged in the indictment has been committed, unless it should appear by the evidence for the prosecutor, or be shown by the defendant on trial, that the killing was under such circumstances as entitle him to justification or excuse. On the point of killing, there is no doubt in this case, the young man named in the indictment unquestionably came to his death by means of the discharge of a pistol by the defendant at the bar. This part is confessed as well as proved. The great question in the case is whether according to the facts shown to you on the part of the prosecution or by the defendant, any reasonable legal justification or excuse has been proved. Whether the killing were malicious or not is no farther a subject of inquiry than that if you have evidence of malice Although the crime charge does not imply malice, it may be considered as proving this crime, because it effectually disproves the only defense which can be set up after killing is established. From the testimony of several witnesses examined by the solicitor and attorney generals, it appears that on the day set forth in the indictment, the defendant was in his office a little before one o'clock that in a conversation about his quarrel with the father of the deceased, he intimated that he had been informed an attack upon him was intended, and that he was prepared, that a short time afterward he went down from his office, which is in the old state house, crossing State Street diagonally, tending towards the United States Bank, that, as he passed down, his hands were behind him, outside of his coat, without anything in them, is proved by the testimony of Mr. Brooks, who saw him pass down, and by that of young Mr. Irving, who saw him when the deceased approached, put his right hand in his pocket and take out his pistol, while his left arm was raised to protect his head from an impending blow. The manner of his going down upon change, the weapon which he had with him, the previous intimation of an attack which he seems to have received from Mr. Cabot or Mr. Welsh, and the errand upon which he went down, as stated by Mr. Ingraham, are all circumstances worthy of your deliberate attention. Passing down State Street, as before described, several witnesses testified that the deceased, who was standing with the cane in his hand, near the corner of the Suffolk buildings, having cast his eye upon the defendant, shifted his cane into his right hand, stepped quick from the sidewalk onto the pavement, advanced upon the defendant, with his arm uplifted, that the defendant turned, stepped one foot back, and that a blow fell upon the head of the defendant, and the pistol was discharged at the deceased, at one and the same instant. Several blows were afterward given, and attempted to be parried by the defendant, who threw his pistol at the deceased, seized upon his cane, which was wrested from him by the deceased, who, becoming exhausted, fell down, and in a few minutes expired. This is the general course of the testimony. The scene was a shocking one, and all the witnesses state to you that they were exceedingly agitated. This will account for the relation given by Mr. Lane and one other witness, I believe Mr. Howe, who state the facts so differently from all the other witnesses produced by the government, as well as by defendant, that however honest we may think them, it is impossible not to suppose they are mistaken. Indeed, the Attorney General has wisely and candidly laid their testimony, so far as it differs from that of the other witnesses, 
out of the case. There is one witness, Mr. Glover, who states the transaction somewhat differently from the other witnesses. He says that having expected to see a quarrel upon exchange in consequence of the publication against the deceased's father, in the morning he went there for the express purpose of seeing what should pass, that he saw Mr. Selfridge coming down street, saw young Austin advance upon him, that he had a full view of both parties, was within fifteen feet of them, that he saw a blow fall upon the head of Selfridge with violence, the arm of the deceased raised to give a second blow, which fell the instant the pistol was discharged. This is the only witness who swears to a blow before the discharge of the pistol, but he swears positively and says he has a clear, distinct recollection of the fact. His character is left without impeachment. If you consider it important to ascertain whether a blow was or was not actually given before the pistol was fired, you will inquire whether there are any circumstances proved by other witnesses which may corroborate or weaken the testimony of Mr. Glover. On this point, you will attend to the testimony of Mr. Wigan, who swears that he heard a blow as if on the clothes of some person, that he turned and saw the deceased's arm uplifted, and another blow and the discharge of the pistol rode together. You will consider the testimony of young Irving, who swears that the left arm of the defendant was over his forehead, as though defending himself from blows, when he saw the blow fall. You will consider that all the witnesses but Glover state that the blow which they saw and thought the first was a long blow across the head, that the blow which Glover says was the first was a direct, perpendicular blow, and that he then saw the second blow which was a cross one, as testified by the other witnesses. If you find a difficulty in settling the fact of the priority of the blow, take this for your rule, that a witness who swears positively to the existence of a fact, if of good character and sufficient intelligence, may be believed, although twenty witnesses of equally good character swear that they were present and did not see the same fact. The confusion and horror of the scene was such that it was easy for the best and most intelligent of men to be mistaken. As to the order of blows, which followed each other in such rapid succession, that the eye could scarcely discern an interval. You will, therefore, compare the testimony of the witnesses, where it appears to vary, attending to their different situation, power of seeing and capacity of recollecting and relating, and settle this fact according to your best judgment, never believing a witness who swears positively to be perjured, unless you are irresistibly driven to such a conclusion. Upon this point you will also attend to the testimony of Mr. Fales, and of Mr. Osborne and Mr. Perkins Nichols, touching the testimony of Mr. Fales. The counsel for the defendant seem, however, to deem it of little importance to ascertain whether the blow was given before the pistol was discharged or not as there is evidence from all the witnesses that an assault, at least, was made by the deceased before the pistol was fired. I think differently from them upon this point, when the defense is that the assault was so violent and fierce that the defendant could not retreat, but was obliged to kill the deceased to save himself. It surely is of importance to ascertain whether the violent blow he received on his forehead which at the same time that would put him off his guard, would satisfy him of the design of the assailant, was struck before he fired or not. I doubt whether self-defense could in any case be set up, where the killing happened in consequence of an assault only, unless the assault be made with a weapon which, if used at all, would probably produce death. When a weapon of another sort is used, it seems to me that the effect produced is the best evidence of the power an intention of the assailant to do that degree of bodily harm, which would alone authorize the taking of his life on the principles of self-defense. But whether the firing of the pistol was before or after a blow, struck by the deceased, there is another point of more importance for you to settle, and about which you must make up your minds, from all the circumstances proved in the case. 
such as the rapidity and violence of the attack, the nature of the weapon with which it was made, the place where the catastrophe happened, the muscular debility or vigor of the defendant and his power to resist or to fly. The point, I mean, is whether he could probably have saved himself from death or enormous bodily harm by retreating to the wall or throwing himself into the arms of friends who would protect him. This is the real stress of the case. If you believe under all the circumstances, the defendant could have escaped his adversary's vengeance at the time of the attack. Without killing him, the defense set up has failed, and the defendant must be convicted. If you believe his only resort for safety was to take the life of his antagonist, he must be acquitted, unless his conduct has been such prior to the attack upon him, as will deprive him of the privilege of setting up a defense of his nature. It has, however, been suggested by the defendant's counsel that even if his life had not been in danger, or no great bodily harm, but only disgrace was intended by the deceased, there are certain principles of honor and natural right by which the killing may be justified. These are principles which you as jurors, and I as a judge, cannot recognize. The laws which we are sworn to administer are not founded upon them. But those who choose such principles for their guidance erect a court for the trial of points and principles of honor. But let the courts of law adhere to those principles, which are laid down in the books, and whose wisdom ages of experience have sanctioned. I therefore declare to you, as the law of the land, that unless the defendant has satisfactorily proved to you that no means of saving his life or his person from the great bodily harm which was apparently intended by the deceased against him, except killing his adversary, were in his power. He has been guilty of manslaughter, notwithstanding you may believe with the grand jury who found the bill that the case does not present the least evidence of malice or premeditated design in the defendant to kill the deceased or any other person. I ought not to rest here, for although I have stated to you that when a man's person is fiercely and violently assaulted, under circumstances which jeopardize his life or important members, he may protect himself by killing his adversary. Yet he may, when the existence of other circumstances proved against him, forfeit his right to a defense which the laws of God and man would otherwise have given him. If a man, for the purpose of bringing another into a quarrel, provokes himself, then an affray is commenced and the person causing the quarrel is overmatched, and to save himself from apparent danger kill his adversary, he would be guilty of manslaughter, if not of murder, because the necessity being of his own creating shall not operate in his excuse. You are therefore to inquire whether this insult upon the defendant by the deceased was or was not by the procurement of the defendant. If it were, he cannot avail himself the defense now set up by him. And here you were called upon to distinguish pretty nicely, and to attend to a part of the case which I thought was going too far back to have an influence upon this trial, but which the urgency of the Attorney General and the consent of defendant's counsel finally induced me to admit. You have heard the whole story of the misunderstanding between the defendant and the father of the deceased, who was originally in the wrong. It is not for me to say, but I feel constrained to say, that whatever provocation the defendant may have conceived to have been given him, and however great the injury which the deceased father may have done him, he certainly proceeded a step too far in making the provocation which appeared in the paper which came out on the morning of this unhappy disaster. To call a man coward, liar, and scoundrel, in the public newspapers, and to call upon other printers to publish the same, is not justifiable under any circumstances whatever. Such a publication is libelous in its very nature, as it necessarily excites to revenge and ill blood. Indeed, I believe a court of honor, if such existed, to settle disputes of this nature, would not justify such a proclamation as the one alluded to. 
a posting upon change or in some public place. We have heard of. But I never before such a violent denunciation as this in a public newspaper. Neither can I refrain from censuring the managers of the paper who admitted such a publication, or so readily receiving and publishing what in its very nature would tend to disturb the public peace. But, gentlemen, it is one thing for a man to have done wrong, and another thing for that wrong to be of a nature to justify an attack upon his person. If personal wrong, done by the father of the deceased to the defendant, would not justify him in publishing a libel, neither would the libel have justified the deceased or his father in attacking the person of the author of the libel. No man can take vengeance into his own hands. He can use violence only in defense of his person. No words, however aggravating, no libel, however scandalous, will authorize the suffering party to revenge himself by blows. If, therefore, Mr. Austin himself, the object of the newspaper publication, would not be justified had he attacked the defendant and beat him with a cane, still less would the circumstances have justified the unfortunate young man who fell a victim to the most unhappy and ever-to-be-lamented dispute. For, however a young and ardent son may find advocates in every generous breast for espousing his father's quarrel, for motives of filial affection and just family pride, yet the same laws which govern the other parts of the case would have pronounced him guilty had he lived to answer for the attack which was the cause of his death. The laws allow a son to aid his father if beaten, and to protect him from a threatened felony or personal mischief, and in like cases a father may assist a son, and should a killing in either case take place it is excusable. But neither one nor the other can justify resorting to force to avenge an injury consisting in words however opprobrious, or writings however defamatory. You will therefore consider whether these facts antecedent to the meeting on change can have much operation in the cause. Let which party will be founded by you to be in the wrong. Upon the whole, therefore, of these circumstances, should you be of opinion that the defendant, in order to avenge himself upon the father of the deceased, prepared himself with a deadly weapon which he afterwards used, went upon change with a view to meet his adversary, and exposed himself to an attack, in order that he might take advantage and kill him, intending to resort to no other means of defense in case he should be overpowered. There is no doubt that killing amounted to manslaughter, but if from the evidence in the case you should believe that the defendant had no other view but to defend his life and person from an attack, which he expected, without knowing from whom it was to come, that he did not purposely throw himself in the way of the attack, but was merely pursuing his lawful vocations, and that, in fact, he could not have saved himself otherwise than by the death of the assailant. Then the killing was excusable, provided the circumstances of the attack would justify a reasonable apprehension of the harm which he would thus have a right to prevent. Of all this you are to judge and determine, having regard to the testimony of the several witnesses who have given evidence to these several points in the defense. The principles which I have thus stated are recognized by all the books which have been read, and are founded in the natural and civil rights, and in the social duties of man. The last subject on which I shall trouble you is the address which has been so forcibly urged upon your minds by the counsel on one side, and is zealously and ably commented on by the Attorney General on the other, touching the necessity of excluding all prejudices and prepossessions relative to this cause. I do not apprehend these observations were in any degree necessary, as I cannot bring my mind to fear that the verdict of twelve upright, intelligent jurors, selected by lot from the mass of their fellow citizens, will be founded on anything beside the law and evidence applicable to the case. Every person of this numerous assembly, let his own opinion of the merits of the cause be as it may, must be satisfied of the fairness, regularity, and impartiality of the trial, up to the present period, 
and sure I am that nothing which is left to be done by you will impair the general character of the trial. If you discharge your duty conscientiously, as I have no doubt you will, whether your verdict be popular or unpopular, you may defy the censure, as I know you will disregard the applause of the surrounding multitude. Least of all do I apprehend that party spirit will come to influence your opinions. However the storms of party rage may beat without these walls, I do not believe the time has yet come when they shall find their way within. Nor do I believe that a general apprehension is entertained that a man accused of a crime is to be saved or destroyed according to political notions he entertains. If ever the time should come when a general belief shall be entertained, the trials are conducted and judgments given with a view to the political character of the parties interested. Vain and ineffectual will be the forms of your constitution, and useless the attempt to administer the laws. A general resistance would be the consequence, and if this belief should be founded in fact and truth, that resistance would, in my apprehension, be perfectly justifiable. For no people would be bound to respect the forms of justice when the substance shall have vanished, when the fountains of justice shall be manifestly corrupt, and the forms and parade adhered to for the purpose of imposing on the citizens and subjecting them to oppression under the garb of law. You, gentlemen, will not be the first to violate the solemn oath you have taken and seek for a conviction or an acquittal of the defendant upon any other principle than those which that oath has sanctioned. And, as I trust, that in performing my duty, I have conscientiously regarded that oath which obliges me, faithfully and impartially, to administer the laws according to my best skill and judgment, so that in discharging yours, you will have due regard to that which imposes upon you the obligation well and truly to try the cause between the commonwealth and the defendant according to law and the evidence which has been given you. The verdict, the jury retired and returned in a short time with the verdict of not guilty. End of section 62 Section 63 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. The Trial of John Morris for Assault and Battery, New York City, 1816. The Narrative. Nash's private school for boys and girls in New York City was in the early part of the 19th century patronized by the leading citizens of the metropolis. Mr. John Morris had two children there, boys of seven and twelve. The younger was inclined to be unruly, and his father had requested Mrs. Nash, who was also a teacher in the school, to punish him if he persisted in lending his books to associates, a habit which the father evidently desired to stop. The boy having done so again, he was reprimanded by his teacher who repeated his father's order, whereupon the boy made an impudent reply on which the teacher told him to hold out his hand for the strap. He refused and swore at his teacher. When she called on Hedden, the assistant master, to put him on the table as an example to the school, a mode of punishment in vogue then, and this was done. Some time previous to this, the older Morris boy had been punished by the assistant master and had complained to his father who asked Mr. Nash not to allow his children to be punished by anyone but himself. Mr. Nash's answer was that all the scholars must be treated alike, that if his children behaved well, they would be treated well. If they behaved badly, they would be punished. Mr. Morris made no further objection and continued to send the two boys to the school. When the elder brother saw the younger one on the table of disgrace, he ran out of the room and carried the news to his father who a short time after appeared in the schoolroom and demanded in a loud, angry voice, who had put his child on the table. Hedden replied that he had. You place my child there, you rascal, returned Morris with an oath, and he ordered the child to come down from the table, which he did. Hedden ordered him to leave the room, but he refused, whereupon he seized him by the collar and tried to put him out, a struggle ensuing which Morris got the better of, 
Hedden being so injured as to be confined to his room for several days. During the affray, the entire school was in a state of great confusion and alarm, Mr. Nash's whole energies being devoted to preventing a panic and the scholars rushing down the stairs into the street. Morris, being indicted for assault and battery, was found guilty and fined, the court instructing the jury that what the master had done was right and lawful and what the prisoner had done was illegal and inexcusable. The Trial In the Court of General Sessions of New York City, March 1816, Honorable Richard Riker, Recorder, William Coulthard, Thomas R. Smith, Alderman. The prisoner, John Morris, having been indicted by the grand jury for an assault and battery on William B. Hedden, the trial came on today. John Rodman, prosecuting attorney, and Mr. Fay for the people. Mr. Wilkin for the prisoner. The jurors have been sworn. Mr. Fay briefly stated the nature of the case, alleging that it was a cause of unusual interest in as much as concerned not only the peace and good order of society, but was intimately connected with the rights of teachers, the government of schools, the interest of literature, and the general happiness of the community. It involved the important question how far and in what manner the master of a school should take the place and hold the authority of a parent, while the child is under his care, and in what way a parent, dissatisfied with the discipline of the instructor of his child, should interpose his authority, whether by threat, violence, and outrage, or by mild and rational methods. The peculiar features of the case, said the counsel, will be presented by the testimony, and I shall reserve any further comment until the evidence has been heard and the defense exhibited to the jury. The Evidence William B. Hedden I am twenty years of age and the son of William Nash. am assistant in my father's school, which is located in Broadway. This school is large, composed of about 80 scholars, young misses and young masters from among the most respectable families in the city. Mr. John Morris had two children at the school, one about seven, the other about 12 years of age. He had given orders to Mrs. Nash, who was also an assistant teacher in the school and had the particular superintendence of the class to which his younger son belonged, to prohibit that boy from lending out his book and to punish him should he disobey. Notwithstanding the orders of the parent imparted by Mrs. Nash, the child lent the book to one of his mates, whereupon the lady reprimanded him and repeated his father's order. The boy replied with some impudent, insulting words, on which she required him to approach her and hold out his hand to be punished by the feral, a knife strap. The boy preemptorily disobeyed the order, resisted the mistress, imprecated the curse of God on her, and called her abusive names. Finding it difficult to subdue his temper, she called on me to place him on the table as an example to the school. This was done. Mr. Morris's older lad had formerly been punished by me, and having complained to his father, he expostulated with Mr. Nash and requested him not to suffer any punishment to be inflicted on his children except by himself. Mr. Nash replied that the children in his school must all be treated alike, and that if the children of Morris behaved well, they should be treated well. If ill, they must be punished in the same manner as others were. To this, Morris made no further objection and continued his children at the school. The elder brother ran out of the school about the time Mr. Nash was making arrangements to dismiss the scholars and made some representation to him. The father in short time came to the door of the schoolroom, which he had burst open with violence, flew into the room with his hat on his countenance, indicating the most ungovernable rage, and demanded who had placed the child on the table. I stepped towards the defendant and informed him that the child had been placed there by my means and that he had not been treated improperly. Defendant raised his fist and said, You place my child there, you d rascal, and immediately ordered the child to come down from the table, which he did. I then ordered him to quit the room the school was in a state of alarm and uproar, and Mr. Nash, to prevent the scholars from rushing out of the door and going down a narrow pair of stairs, whereby their lives might have been endangered, and a mob at least raised about the house, was solely employed at this juncture in closing the doors and quietening the scholars. I repeated my orders to the defendant to quit the school, which being refused, I seized him by the collar and attempted to push him out. A violent struggle between us ensued, in which it appears that I threw the defendant, but permitted him to rise. Defendant then seized and threw me, beat me when down, and attempted to gouge out one of my eyes. 
By reason of the injury received, I was incapable of attending to business for several days. Attempts were made by the defendant to prove that the child had been injured in the spine, that it was weak in the head in consequence of a former complaint, and that it was punished with much severity, but the proof failed and it clearly appeared that neither the mistress nor Hedden had been guilty of any impropriety towards the child in the infliction of the punishment. Mr. Wilkin, the assistant teacher had no right to order the defendant to quit the school. That right only belonged to the master. The conduct of Hedden was calculated to invite aggression rather than to conciliate and soothe the angry passions. He was, in fact, the first aggressor. He undertook to put the defendant out of the school and first committed the assault and battery himself. The father had given orders to the master not to suffer Hedden to correct his children, and from the representations made to him, he believed the child abused by Hedden. Under this belief and possessed with the feelings of every father, he entered the school. Mr. Wilkin here detailed the circumstances of the fray, the commencement of which he attributed to the assistant teacher and concluded by urging the jury to bring home the case to themselves and to make all due allowances for the influence of passion induced by the belief of a real injury inflicted on a child of tender years by a person in school which had no right and had been forbidden by the order of the father to inflict such punishment. Mr. Fay, Gentlemen of the jury, it is not because I think my talents equal to those of the learned counsel, who in his official station advocates the rights of the people, that I appear on this occasion as the public prosecutor. This complaint was first made to me by this injured individual, who has this day appeared before you at a time when the district attorney was absent, and when it was supposed his business might not permit him to return to this city in season to conduct this prosecution. It is from no apprehension that you will not by your verdict pronounce the defendant guilty, that I undertake to reply to the ingenious arguments advanced by his counsel, nor do I entertain a fear that the court will not, by their sentence, punish this culprit as he deserves, but I feel it a duty which I owe to this injured complainant, to this court and jury, to the audience who now listen to me and the community at large, to express my utter abhorrence of this crime, this daring outrage, and to exhibit it to the public eye in all its glaring deformity. The history of this affair may be comprised in a few words. The mistress had been directed by the defendant not to suffer the young child to lend his book. The order was imparted to the child. He disobeyed, and the lady, impressed with a sense of duty, undertook to correct the child in pursuance of the order of the father. The child resists, and he resists with force. He not only resists with force, but calls his mistress abusive names, and far worse than all, he calls aloud on the name of his god and imprecates a curse, a bitter curse, on the head of his instructor. Not willing to wrestle with this young rebel, Mrs. Nash requests her son, the assistant teacher, to place the boy on the table. As a spectacle of shame to the school, this is done in a mild manner in the mode related by the testimony. Here this affair would have ended but for the malicious and wicked interference of the elder brother. He had once smarted under the lash for his disobedience, and a favorable moment presented itself for vengeance. Slyly stealing from the school, he flies to his father and no doubt tells him a most lamentable tale. What course, under such circumstances, would a prudent, discreet parent solicitous for the future welfare and happiness of his child have taken? Every good father is sensible that the surest way to ruin his child is to take his part against a master's authority. He would therefore first have inquired with calmness into the truth of such representation, and if unfounded, as the event has justified, would have punished the author, or if even there had been truth in the report, the father would rather have sought a private conference with the master and with reason have expostulated on the impropriety of such chastisement. But the defendant did not on this occasion think proper to adopt a course mild, pacific, or rational. Indignant at the fallacious idea with which his mind was possessed, or rather destitute of any definite idea, he starts for the school. Incited with rage, fury, and madness, he burst open the door and rushed like a demon of destruction into this assembly of infants. Pale with anger, his eyes flashing terror, his fists clenched, his whole frame agitated with rage. In the situation in which he has been described by the testimony, he was utterly destitute of reason, nay, more dangerous than the most ferocious animal. 
As such, it was justifiable for any person, by any means, to have expelled him headlong from the school. He enters, gentlemen, in the manner I have described, without any regard to the sacredness of the place, to decorum, to common decency, and with his hat on, impudently demands with a horrible oath, who has placed my child on that table? Mr. Nash attempts to explain. The school begins to be confused. Hedden undertakes to pacify. The defendant storms and rages, and all things assume such a threatening aspect that the master flies to prevent the scholars from rushing into the street in this state of trepidation and alarm. At this crisis, Mr. Hedden very properly requires the defendant to quit the school. He refuses with threats and bitter execrations, raises his fists in the attitude of striking Hedden, who then attempts to expel him by force from school. Here ensues a scene of disgrace, outrage, and horror so appalling to the feelings so disgusting that I shall not attempt a description, but shall leave it to yourselves, aided by the testimony to imagine the mortification of a respectable teacher, the fear of the young ladies, the terror and dismay of all, the injury sustained by Hedden, the brutality of the defendant, and the bloody catastrophe which terminated this disgusting scene. That Hedden was torn and lacerated by this tiger, as to endanger his eyesight, that the rights of a teacher have been assailed, that the sacred sanctity of a school has been polluted, and the peace of society broken by this defendant are all too clearly proved to admit a doubt. But we have been told, gentlemen, that the conduct of Hedden provoked aggression, that he injured the child in the punishment and was insolent to that parent. It is not so. The child was not injured. It is only the cunning of the father that has framed this suggestion, which is so faintly supported by the testimony, that even the ingenuity of the counsel has not given it the color of plausibility. So far was the conduct of Hedden from being aggressive, that I am surprised he did not fly instantly to this madman, and at the first sight have him thrust headlong down the steps of this entrance. The very manner of the defendant was an assault. His threatening aspect, his ungovernable fury, his entrance into this school were of themselves an indecent, unjustifiable attack on the master, whom Hedden, as a son and assistant, was bound to defend. The first step taken by the defendant was a breach of the peace, and his very look contained a declaration of war against the whole school. After the defendant came into the school with his hat on, his fist closed for battle, to say that Hedden could by any possibility have been the aggressor, brings to mind the wolf in the fable, who, drinking in the stream on the hill, first accused and next tore the lamb who stood drinking in the stream below for disturbing the water. I can only account for the fact that the master and Hedden did not instantly hurl Morris out of the school, but by the supposition that the attack carried panic and dismay into the hearts of all. Well, it might. What a spectacle did his conduct exhibit to little children, a tiger in the sheepfold exciting terror, dismay and consternation in the flock. And, gentlemen, this defendant merits the censure of the good, the frowns of all considerate fathers, the marked punishment of public justice. Before I close, I beg leave to add a few remarks by way of comment on the impropriety of this man's conduct in trampling on magisterial authority. For myself, gentlemen, from the years of my earliest infancy, I have been taught to believe that a school was a place for the improvement of manners as well as of mind. Whenever I entered a school, I was taught to pull off my hat, to make a bow of respect to my instructor, to march in silence to my station, and if I only whispered so as to disturb others, I was sure to be punished according to my deserts. It was this wholesome discipline that has formed in my mind a habitual respect for authority, a love of good order, an attachment to study, and a sacred regard for that noble institution, a public school. Here I first contemplated civil society in miniature and learned in early years that obedience and respect to superiors, that principle of subordination which binds together, cements and supports society in all its various gradations. In a school where the human mind is first placed under human care to be fitted for the grand purpose of life, the child should be taught to consider his instructor in many respects superior to the father in point of authority. The infant mind early apprehends and distinguishes with a surprising sagacity and is more influenced by example than precept. When a child, therefore, sees his parent entering the school, pulling off his hat and making a bow of respect, 
thereby acknowledging the tutor for a higher authority, the respect and obedience and love from the pupil towards the master are strengthened, and the principle of subordination is engrafted in the mind of the child by the influence of example. It is by this happy conspiracy between the tutor and the father that a new power and influence is acquired over the infant mind, which it is in the interest of the parent to cherish and support, and is of infinite importance to the welfare and happiness of society. What a wretch must he be who would aim a blow at that power? Yet of this crime is the defendant guilty. He struck at the very basis of magisterial authority. It was to support that important principle that a learned and judicious schoolmaster said to Charles the Second in the plenitude of his power, Sire, pull off thy hat in my school, for if my scholars discover that the king is above me in authority, they will soon cease to respect me. And although the turbulent and unthinking Morris on this occasion dared to trample on the sacred principle, that august and accomplished prince pulled of his hat to demonstrate by example that magisterial authority should be supported and protected even by the monarch. And now, gentlemen, what ought to be done with that rash and passionate man whose ungovernable rage has driven him into one of the most respectable institutions of our country, into an extensive school of harmless innocence, and who, in that sacred place, at the very altar of science, has displayed the ferocity of a tiger prostrating that altar, and inhumanely violating the person of the master. May he feel the weight of law in court, and out of court may he meet with merited scorn. The Recorder Gentlemen of the jury, the rules of law applicable to this case are plain and simple. Every master has a right to correct his scholar with moderation, and as long as he confines himself within proper bounds is protected in law. In this case, no fault in the mode or extent of the punishment of this child can be reasonably imputed to the master, the mistress, or hadden. The correction was mild, without passion, and not exercised with any degree of severity. The father, without doubt, had a right to go into the school to make inquiry relative to the truth of the representation made by the elder brother, but he had no right to enter the school in a passion and commit a breach of the peace. It will be your duty on this occasion to determine who was the first aggressor, and if you find that the defendant first committed an assault on Hedden, it will be your duty to find him guilty. Should you, moreover, believe that after the defendant was suffered to rise by Hedden, he again commenced the contest, or struck Hedden after he was down, and attempted to pluck out his eye, you must undoubtedly pronounce him guilty, even should you believe that Hedden committed the first assault because a man has no right to employ more force than is absolutely necessary in repelling an attack. The court also charge you to return with your verdict, should it be against the defendant, the fact, as you may find, whether the defendant during this affray did attempt to deprive his adversary of an eye, for the decision of the jury on that point will furnish a criterion to the court in affixing the punishment. The jury pronounce the defendant generally guilty. The court there are some circumstances in this case which the court has considered in mitigation of the punishment. Hedden was a very young man, the defendant a man in years and the head of a family. The conduct of Hedden in ordering a man older than himself to quit the school perhaps was not the most discreet course which could have been taken to allay the fervor of a mind under the strong influence of passion. The court also understands from the counsel that suits have been commenced against the defendant for private damages. Under these circumstances, the court thinks proper to impose a fine of $20 on the defendant and to require from him a security by recognizance himself in the sum of $500 and two sureties in the sum of $250 each to keep the peace generally and especially towards William B. Hedden. End of section 63. Section 64 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Danielle Schultz. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. On the 9th of August, 1865, John W. Hughes, physician and surgeon of Cleveland, Ohio, committed a murder in the small neighboring village of Bedford, 
which from the nature of the case, the character of the parties to the tragedy, and the antecedents of the deed forced him upon the attention of the city of Cleveland and of the whole of the state of Ohio. The public was shocked the following morning by the publication in the newspapers that Miss Tamsin Parsons, a young lady of 17 years of age, had been shot down in the streets of Bedford by this man who had been her lover and who, under the cover of a forged decree of divorce from his wife, had married her in Pittsburgh in December 1864 and suffered in the Pennsylvania penitentiary the penalty attaching to the crime of bigamy. Dr. Hughes was born in the Isle of Man, educated at a Scotch university, and emigrated with his wife to the United States in 1862. After practicing his profession of a physician for a few months in Chicago and Cleveland, he enlisted in an Ohio regiment as a private, but was very soon promoted to the position of assistant surgeon of the 49th United States Infantry. After serving for about a year, he resigned on account of the illness of a son in November 1864. He now began the practice of medicine in Cleveland, but making the acquaintance of Tamsin Parsons, he induced her to go with him to Pittsburgh after showing her a paper which he persuaded her was a decree of divorce from his wife. For this, he was convicted and sentenced to one year's imprisonment in a Pennsylvania penitentiary, but was pardoned after serving five months. Returning to Cleveland, he resumed the practice of medicine, and after having sent his wife and child back to the Isle of Man on a visit, he endeavored to win again the affections of Tamsin, who refused to have anything more to do with him. One night in July, after drinking deeply, he went to the house of her father, in the village of Bedford at night, and, by his noise, aroused the old gentleman, who tried to eject. Hughes refused to leave the house, an objective with sufficient force to give ground for a charge of assault and battery, which was brought on the following day. Tamsin herself appearing, making the affidavit against him, an act which enraged him. Personal differences, however, were at length adjusted, and legal proceedings stayed. The doctor solemnly promised that he would thenceforth have nothing to do with the Parsons family. But alas, a drunken revel with a companion, Oscar Russell, on the night of the 8th of August, ended in their driving to Bedford and drinking at all the roadhouses along the way. Hughes, Russell, and their driver, Carr, issued from a hotel in Bedford and drove to the home of Mr. Parsons. Dr. Hughes entered the house and learned that Tamsin and her mother had gone blackberrying. They drove on but soon met the women, and the doctor sought a private conference with Tamsin. A neighbor, however, came along in a wagon and took her home, while the men drove to the grocery, where they held a drunken revel for two hours. Hughes, learning that all the Parsons family had gone to Bedford for safety and to arrest him, started to the village, and seeing Tamsin come out of the home, he ran after her, calling on her to stop. She flipped the walk, saying, No, I will not stop, and rushed through the gate, endeavoring to reach the front door. But before that asylum was reached, the pursuer laid hands on her, and shouting, You won't stop, will you? fired his revolver. The ball glanced off her head, she screamed, but the piteous cry was instantly hushed by a second and fatal discharge of the deadly weapon. The noise attracted a number of persons who pursued Hughes, who jumped into the carriage with Russell and Carr, and, menacing the crowd with his revolver, succeeded in getting a good start of his pursuers. But he was captured in a few hours and landed in jail. Indicted by the grand jury for murder, after a trial lasting 18 days, he was convicted through his counsel tried very hard to prove that he was insane at the time he committed the act. On February 9, 1866, he was hanged in the yard of the Cleveland jail. The trial in the Court of Common Pleas of Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, December 1865. Honorable James M. Coffinberry, Judge, December 2nd. The grand jury, having previously, in parentheses, November 25th, returned an indictment against John W. Hughes for the murder of Tamsin Parsons, the day was occupied in impaneling a special jury, which was composed of the following. Moses Hunt, Brexville. William Barr, Brexville. Buell Stearns, Olmsted. Jesse H. Luce, Orange. Henry Fish, Brooklyn. William C. Snow, Parma. Dr. Marius Moore, Dover, in parentheses, Foreman. John G. Hasserad, Cleveland. Thomas Garfield, Newburgh. Joseph Slot, Cleveland. Lawton Ross, Brooklyn. Alfred Kellogg, Brooke Charles W. Palmer, and Albert T. Slade for the state, M.S. Castle, R.C. Knight, and William Currish for the prisoner. An application was made by the defense for the postponement, and after argument, the court continued the case until Wednesday, December 6th. December 6th, the court was opened by Mr. Palmer, 
who gave a summary of the incidents which led to the tragic death of Ms. Parsons. Witnesses for the State Joseph B. Haynes, reside in village of Bedford, knew Tamsin Parsons, who was sister of my wife, have known the defendant since December 1864. Having had information that Tamsin had gone to Pittsburgh with Dr. Hughes, I started at the instance of her parents for that place on December 20th, 1864 went to the mayor's office on 21st and, aided by policemen, succeeded in finding Tamsin in a room at the St. Clair Hotel, where I was shown by her a certificate of her marriage with Dr. Hughes. The doctor was soon after arrested in the office of the hotel and taken to lockup. He was soon brought before the mayor, where he declared he would never live with his wife again on account of her dissipated habits. He had been home two or three times and found her beastly drunk and was resolved to leave her. He proposed to me then to go as a substitute in the army and give Tamsin his bounty and leave the country if the prosecution could be stopped, adding that it would be better for her as a continuation of it would lead to unpleasant disclosures. Saw Hughes later at Pittsburgh in jail. He still expressed anxiety to have the prosecution stopped. Next saw him on the day of his trial, saw him again on the day of the murder in Bedford near the Franklin House, in the village about 2 o'clock p.m. He had seen Tabson five minutes previous as she and her mother had come to my house. Miss Parsons went out in a few minutes, and Mrs. Parsons started after Tamson. I soon followed and saw a considerable number of excited people running to and from Mr. Christian's house. Saw a carriage move off towards Cleveland with Dr. Hughes in it. People were running around inquiring what the matter was. Heard some say Tamsin Parsons was shot. I got a horse from the stable and started in pursuit of the carriage. Was joined by Alicia Matthews on horseback. Met a Mr. Scott. He took Matthews' horse, Scott having a revolver, after passing railroad about one half of a mile, saw the carriage stop and a man get out who jumped over the fence and ran towards the woods. We came back with the carriage to the railroad crossing. Scott took the carriage and I parted with him there. Went to Newburgh and with Cleveland officers came towards Bedford and when two miles this side of Bedford met a carriage containing Dr. Hughes, Andrews, and others. Did not identify the person who jumped out of the carriage and ran into the woods. When Tamsin left my house, she said she was going to Mr. Christian's, left my house in less than five minutes after Tamsin left. Eliza Crum resided in Bedford Township, just across the street from Thomas Parsons, on the Plank Road, one mile from the village of Bedford. Saw a defendant about two weeks before the death of Tamsin, about 12 o'clock at night. Mr. Parsons came to our house, woke us up, and requested me and my husband go over and stay with his daughter while he went to Bedford for her mother. We went immediately, my son and myself. Dr. Hughes stood outside on the front doorstep. Tamsin opened the front door and spoke to Dr. Hughes, saying, I see you there, behind the bushes. He advanced when she shut the door. He asked for a drink of water. She inside, he outside. She got a light, procured a glass of water, took it to the front door, and opened the same. He had driven down in front of the door in the road. She spoke to him, saying, You must be thirsty. He asked her to come out to the gate to speak. She went out and talked with him until her father returned. She went into the house, got a shawl, and went out the second time. Shortly after the doctor and she went into the house, she said, Doctor, I wish you would go away, for father won't talk with you. Mr. Pearsons, who was in the kitchen, took hold of him and attempted to put him out the door. The doctor came into the sitting room and said to her, I have a home already furnished nicely for you, and will make a lady of you. She told him she would not go. He asked my son to get a pail of water for his horse, and soon got into his buggy and drove toward the Plank Road house. He was gone an hour, saw him come back. He went into the kitchen at Mr. Parsons, sat down, and smoked a pipe. When I went in, he asked Tamsin who I was. She said, a neighbor. Went back home, leaving my son with Tamsin. Saw him go away again toward the plank house. Tamsin told the doctor that she wouldn't go with him to Cleveland, for he had deceived her once, and she was afraid he would again. He told her his wife had gone home. He had given her money, and she had gone home to her friends. When the doctor was on the steps, she went to him, and he put his arms around her and tried to coax her to go to Cleveland. Next saw the doctor at his examination for housebreaking. Saw him again the day after. 
He was at Mr. Thomas Parsons' house with a man named Parsons from the city. They took supper at my house that night, the doctor and his companion, Parsons, and left for Cleveland. Next saw the doctor the day of the murder. Came to our house about 10 that morning with a man whom he called either Major Hazen or Hansen. He asked how Miss Parsons got along and where she was. Was told she had gone blackberrying. Mr. Parsons came through our gate and they shook hands. When they went round the side of the house and talked about half an hour, when they, the doctor and his companion, went away towards the Plank Road house. Before that, I went to Parsons and found Miss Christensen, who said, You needn't worry yourself, doctor, for her affections are elsewhere placed. He got up immediately and left the room. He looked as if he felt bad and hateful. Saw Dr. Hughes drive back and stop at her gate. Tamsin had left for Bedford with her father. The doctor asked my husband to get in and ride down to the village. His companion, Major Hansen, wanted us to get them something to eat. My husband joined them and rode to Bedford told the doctor before he started that Mr. Parsons' people were going to arrest him again. He replied that he would have that business all settled and did not see Hughes again before the murder. Half an hour after they left, I heard of the murder. William Crum was at home the night Dr. Hughes entered the house of Thomas Parsons about two weeks before the death of his daughter. Dr. Hughes was in his own buggy in the road and Tamsin was standing in her father's yard by the fence. Hughes asked her to get into the buggy and go with him to Cleveland. She said he had deceived her once and he couldn't again. He said he had a room in Cleveland, well furnished, and added she had no need to alarm the neighborhood. He added, I suppose I'll go down tomorrow. They might have a talk and no one know anything about it that the old man had gone down to Bedford to get help. But better believe I am pretty damn well armed. He added, I suppose you'll go down tomorrow and spread it around. She replied that she thought she should. He said, you can tell Joe Haynes that if I meet him in the street, I'll wring his nose for him. She said, what will you do to me if you meet me? He said he wouldn't hurt a hair of her head. The conversation between Hughes and Tamsin was tender, though he called her once or twice a fool. Next Sunday, Hughes told me he had a friend over at Mr. Parsons' house who was trying to, quote, settle his difficulty with them, unquote, referring to his trial for breaking into Mr. Parsons' house. While Hughes was talking with Tamsin in the buggy, I heard him say, I am the drunkest I've been since, and that was all I heard. On the day of the murder, was cradling oats near the Plank Roadhouse, and saw the carriage driving toward the house from Bedford. Went to the house to get a glass of beer. Dr. Hughes slapped me on the shoulder and said, Old man, are you just in time to get a glass of beer? He handed me a glass, and I drank it. By the alternate orders of Hughes and Russell, the glasses were filled and drank half a dozen times. About that time, a Dutchman came in. Russell said, Mother, get us some beer for this Dutchman. He drank from ten to a dozen glasses. He had several glasses after that. Hughes and Russell went into another room, and I went home. While the Dutchman was there, he did all the drinking. The beer drinking was in the grocery opposite the Plank Roadhouse, not in that house. It was remarked then that Hughes' face was very red, and Russell, in parentheses, the major, rubbed flour on it. Do not think the beer drank at the grocery was very intoxicating. Was as sober when I drank the last glass as I was at first. After taking dinner at home, I started back to work when my boy said, There comes Hughes's carriage. The doctor asked me if Mr. Parson's folks were at home. I told him I thought not, that I heard they had gone down to Bedford, asked me to get into the buggy and go to the village, and I got in with the doctor and the major. There was a driver on the box. Hughes told the latter to drive pretty fast. When we got opposite the post office in Bedford, Hughes got out and went into Mr. Christian's tailor shop and was there a moment or two, was going to get into the carriage when he saw Mr. Thomas Parsons in a wagon just back of us. The doctor walked back and met Mr. Parsons and talked a minute and then got into the carriage, got out to go into Mr. Hammond's store. When I got to the post office, heard that the doctor had killed Tamsin Parsons, turned about and saw the carriage starting off toward Cleveland did not discover anything wrong in the doctor when he came into my house the last time from the Plank Roadhouse. Don't know that he spoke a word going down to Bedford. Dr. Ben F. Ray. No Hughes. Saw him at Warrensville two weeks before Tamsin's death. When he told me he had been to Chagrin Falls to perform a surgical operation. Had been to Parsons' house the night before, he said. Found him asleep on the sofa in my office. After dinner, he got up and wanted to know how long he had been sleeping. We went to the bar room and drank a glass of beer. 
He inquired if I knew where Miss Parsons was. I told him I did not know. He said she was calling herself Mrs. Hughes and said it was a disgrace to him. Asked me if I had a revolver or pistol. I told him I had neither one. I then said, Doc, what do you want it for? He replied that if Miss Parsons persisted in calling herself Mrs. Hughes, he would blow her d and would also do likewise by Joseph Haynes. Said at the time of his arrest in Pittsburgh, he had given some valuable papers to Miss Parsons and wished to get them in his possession again, that he was going to her father's house. Hughes at this time first said he had been at Chagrin Falls making an amputation and got $300 for it. Next saw Hughes some time afterward. He told me he had been arrested for an insult upon Parsons and asked me what time it was that he came to see me that morning and what conversation took place between us. He said that Parsons went over the way and got someone from the house opposite, that his examination on charge of assault would take place the next day and wanted me to come and attend it. Ori Carr. Live in Cleveland, Dr. Hughes and Russell came to my carriage on Bank Street between 9 and 10 p.m. the night before Tamsin was shot. They called me Bug, a nickname. Russell introduced me to Hughes, and he asked me what I'd charge to go to Bedford. Told him $10. Russell has a saloon under Hughes's old office. They got into the carriage, and I drove to several houses to get some women to go with them, but did not succeed. Hughes took some liquor from a flask he had. Then he drove down to Bedford and stopped at the Franklin house. Drove on until we came to Mr. Crumb's house, where Hughes and Russell got out. A little boy from Carm's house went over to Parsons, came back and said, They ain't there. They've gone a blackberrying. Mr. Parsons came from his house into the road, and Hughes called to him. Parsons came to Hughes and talked with him, and Hughes afterward went over to Parsons' house, staying there half or three quarters of an hour. Then we drove toward the Plank Roadhouse, and in about a mile we saw two women coming along with tin pails in their hands. Hughes called, Miss Parsons, Miss Parsons. She turned around. What do you want? Hughes said nothing, only I want to talk to you. She started on, saying, I don't want nothing to do with you. Hughes watched them a few minutes and then got out and followed them. They walking as fast as they could, he walking fast too. Could see the old lady motioning her hand toward Hughes, as if she was talking loud to him. The old lady got into a wagon. Hughes approached the girl who stood near the wagon and talked with her a minute, and then she got into the wagon. Hughes put his hand on her and talked to her for some time, until the wagon was driven off. I said to him, the old lady was laying it down to you pretty hot. He said yes, but that it is all right. He directed me to go to the Plank Roadhouse, where we stopped. We went to a grocery across the road and had some beer, drank about two glasses when Crumb came in, and we had two or three more glasses of beer. Then a Dutchman came in and all drank five or six glasses of beer, went to Crumb's and stopped. Hughes got out and asked the lady if the Parsons folks were at home, and was told they had gone to town. Heard somebody tell Hughes that Parsons folks had gone to Bedford and were going to have him, in parentheses, Hughes, arrested. He said something about settling or fixing it. We went to Bedford, Crumb going with us. Hughes said, drive on as fast as you can to Bedford. We went to the Fountain House to get some beer. Hughes saw Parsons come along in a wagon, and Hughes asked him to have a glass of beer. Parsons said, no, I don't want to be shot. They got out at the fountain house, and Hughes, as we were going in, turned around and went out. We had been there quite a little while when I started outdoors, and saw a lot of people running toward Columbus Street, followed, and saw a crowd gathering, and heard someone say that Hughes had shot somebody. I went back to the fountain house and told Russell, who said, let's go and see, drove down toward the place where the crowd was, saw Hughes coming along with a man bolding on his arm, stopped my carriage. Hughes shook the man off his arm, took out a revolver, swung it around, and said, Don't another man lay hold of me. He came to the carriage and jumped in. As he jumped in, I jumped off the carriage and went to the door and said, What do you want? He said, Drive on. I hesitated, and he said, Drive on, as I tell you. I got on the carriage and drove down a few feet when a lot of men cried out to me to stop the team. I stopped when Hugh shook his pistol at me and said, Drive on, as I tell you. I drove ahead when a man said, Stop the carriage. There's a murderer in it. I stopped when Hughes said, you drive on or I'll blow you through. I drove on at a pretty good pace, and soon Russell came up and got into the carriage. We went a few rods when Russell got out and got on the carriage with me. I mentioned to the people to come after and overtake me. It was not going very fast. Russell told me, for God's sake, drive faster or we'll shoot. I drive on as fast as we could, 
till we got to a piece of woods when Hughes got out, stood a minute, asked Russell for some money. Russell gave him some, though he said he hadn't much. He went to the woods. The people were coming on after us, and I drove on with Russell. Saw Hughes next to the fountain house after he was arrested. When last I saw Hughes before he was arrested, he was running in the woods on the right-hand side of the road. The man Russell also was called Major Hansen or Hampson. Hughes told me to call him so. When we left the Franklin house the morning of the murder, Hughes appeared very well. At Crumbs, he appeared as usual. And also when we left the grocery to go back to Bedford. Nothing attracted my attention to his manner while we were going to Bedford. While in the grocery, Hughes's conduct did not differ from that on the night previous. He didn't seem drunk. Couldn't see that the ale affected any of the party. Almeida, Eddie, live at Warrensville at the Plank Roadhouse. About two weeks before Tamsin's death, Hughes stayed at our house that night, retiring early. He got up about seven o'clock and took breakfast. Ellen Van Allen, Ellen Eddy, and myself were present while he ate. He asked me if I had seen Tamsin Parsons lately, told him she was at our house to hire Margaret Tear to work for her sister at Oil Creek, said she has been shot at lately. He asked who done it. We don't know, I answered. The ball went through her parasol. He said, it's a pity it didn't blow her brains out. It would have saved me the trouble, some time. He left going towards Bedford after breakfast. Saw him next the forenoon of the day he killed her, at a grocery opposite our house. He came into our bar room and washed himself and combed his hair. Saw them drive toward Bedford. His face was very red, eyes shone, walked straight, his voice was firm as usual. Ella Van Allen. Live in Bedford Village. Saw Dr. Hughes at the breakfast table at the Plank Road house once. Mrs. Eddy, the doctor, and Ellen Eddy were there. Mrs. Eddy wanted to know of Dr. Hughes if he knew that Tamsin had been shot at. He said, no, I didn't. Who shot her? Mrs. Eddy said the ball went through her parasol. He said it was a pity it had not blown her brains out and saved him the trouble some time. Mrs. Eddy said, why, doctor, do you intend to kill her? He said, oh, no. Ellen Eddy saw Hughes at our house about two weeks before the death of Tamsin. Doctor asked mother if she had seen Tamsin lately. She said, yes, she was up here the other day to hire a girl to work for her sister Libby. Mother said she's been shot at lately. He made the answer that mother has just related. File Salisbury. Live in Bedford Village. The latter part of July met Dr. Hughes in the door of the Franklin house in the morning. He asked me if I had seen Tamsin lately or knew where she was. He said he must come down soon and look her up, for if she wouldn't live with him, he was going to kill her. J. S. Eli. Live in Newburgh. Keep the cataract house. About 11 o'clock the night before Tamsin was shot, Dr. Hughes and Russell came to my house in a carriage with a driver. They went into the bar room, drank, smoked. They spoke of going up in the country to see a patient. The doctor had a limb to amputate. Next saw Dr. H. about four o'clock the next afternoon. He went in the washroom of my hotel, washed, combed his hair, and had something to drink. Looked as if he had been drinking a good deal the day previous. Vincent Salisbury. Kept the Franklin house in Bedford last July and August. Was at home the day Tamsin Parsons was shot. Dr. Hughes stayed at my house a part of the night previous. Arriving there between midnight and two o'clock in the morning. Saw the party, Hughes, Russell, and Carr, to speak to them about seven o'clock the next morning, when they came into the bar room from taking breakfast. Knew only Dr. Hughes. He introduced me to Russell as Major Handsome. He said he had been to Independence to amputate a limb. Asked him how business was. He said, good enough for ten more like myself. They drank whiskey twice after breakfast, and one of them, I think Dr. Hughes, had his flask filled with whiskey. Sophia Stainbridge, live opposite the Plank Roadhouse. Dr. Hughes was at my house the forenoon before Tamsin was shot. Party of three came at eleven o'clock and were drinking present-use ale at my house. They drank all I had, but my husband came from Cleveland with more a little after 12 o'clock. Dr. Hughes brought the half barrel into the grocery. He had no difficulty in standing on the barrel. The doctor quit drinking before he left the house. He would drink a little and throw the rest on the floor, and I saw him put down two or three glasses behind the scales. Notice that Dr. H's face was very red, and the major put flour on it. Notice nothing unusual in his manner. Seemed to walk straight. Francis Powell. Live in Bedford. I was working in my lot when Tamsin was shot. Dr. Christian lived on that lot. The house is about 30 feet back from the front fence. I was about 10 or 12 feet west of the spot where the murder occurred. Saw Tamsin in the yard walking rapidly toward the house, and Dr. Hughes was following her very closely. 
She tried to get into the house, but before she could reach it, Dr. H overhauled her and took hold of her dress and shot her. Asked Dr. H what he had done, he faced me and said he had to shoot her dead. He stood half a moment, turned round, and went up to the girl, turned her head around and examined the wound. He said, yes, she's dead, was looking towards them when he fired. He set the pistol right in her neck, taking hold of her dress near the shoulders with his left hand. While he was examining the wound, I jumped over the fence and ran down and alarmed the people. So I'm next going down Columbus Street. John Price had hold of his arm as they walked down together. They went clear down to the corner when Hughes jerked Price off, saw the carriage come from the tavern. Russell opened the carriage, and Hughes got in, followed by Russell, when they drove off toward Cleveland. Amos Lamson, live in Bedford, was at my house when I saw a crowd gather about the corners, saw Price catch hold of a man who jerked away from him, saw Price catch hold of him again, and once more he jerked away, saw this man, in parentheses Hughes, go to the carriage and get in, heard a cry of stop the carriage, and a cry of murder, went where the girl was shot and saw her body in the yard. Two of us got into a buggy and started in pursuit of the carriage. On Independence Road, met the carriage coming back. Hughes had taken to the woods. Some six or eight of us crossed the field several times, but couldn't find him, searched along the railroad track. Hughes was ahead of us in some bushes close to the track. Six or eight of us went up to him. He said he was willing to give himself up. Mr. Wells searched him, and we started towards Bedford. Found a common knife, a few small cartridges, and a small pistol on his person. On the way to the village, Hughes talked some. Told him all I could do or say would not make him any better or worse. Think I proposed hanging him on the spot. He said, I would as soon as you hang me here on a tree as anywhere. I knew the penalty before I did it. I bought the revolver or pistol on purpose to shoot her and have done it. He said, I have not done it under any excitement or impulse of the moment, but had studied the thing over. I think he had said for two weeks. He drew a flask out of his pocket and took a drink when I told the men not to let him drink, for he probably had poison in the flask. His manner did not differ from that which I have always seen in him. He showed no excitement. End of section 64, read by Danielle Schultz. Section 65 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Dr. John W. Hughes for the Murder of Tamsin Parsons, Cleveland, Ohio, 1865, Part 2. E.S. Libby, when the alarm was given, saw a man coming down Columbus Street, men having hold of his arms. As this man reached Columbus Street, he jerked away from the men holding him, drew a revolver, told the crowd to keep off, got into the carriage, and ordered the driver to go on. The driver started, hesitated when called on to stop, but finally drove off as though afraid to stop. Saw the carriage come back with Russell and Carr. They were locked up, and I took a double-barreled shotgun, got in the carriage with others, and started in pursuit. Hughes was found in a little ditch covered by an oak bush just large enough for a man to hide under. I discovered him lying down with his coat off. Heard him say, Gentlemen, you can do what you please with me. Hang me up to the first pole if you choose. I came out here with that intention, and I've done it. As some of them were afterwards firing off their guns, he said, Gentlemen, you can't scare me. I've been under fire before. I'm not at all alarmed. I also understood him to say, I'm a murderer, when he first spoke, but I'm not positive. He was cool and unconcerned. Cross-examined. Several of the crowd said, Hang him. Shoot him. Saw him take out a flask and drink. Think it was three hours from the time he left the village in the carriage till we found him. We were searching the field about three-fourths of an hour. Dr. D. G. Streeter. Am a physician living in Bedford. I saw Tamsin Parson's body about a half hour after she was shot. It was still warm. Saw a wound in the back of the neck, just below the base of the brain, and in the center of the neck. Next day I made an examination, the body being in a vault. Found that the wound was caused by a small ball entering the neck just below the base of the brain. The ball passed through the vertebrae of the neck into the very upper portion of the spinal marrow. The ball went upwards. About three inches from that, above the back of the right ear, there was a mark about an inch long. Don't think that which produced the first wound could have produced the second. My opinion is that the mark was occasioned by a pistol ball striking there and glancing off. A ball striking as the first did and penetrating the upper portion of the spinal marrow or medulla oblongata would cause instant death. Susan Parsons. 
am the mother of Tamsin. Tamsin and I started blackberrying between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning, the day she was shot. On our way back, we noticed a city carriage coming. Tamsin called my attention to it. We passed and looked in and saw Dr. Hughes. I said, why, Tamsin, there's the doctor. Dr. H. said, Mrs. Parsons. We made no reply. Then he spoke again when Tamsin told him to go along. We didn't want him. He next called to me, saying, Mrs. Parsons, it's you I want. On looking around, he was out of the carriage. He said he wanted to talk with me. I told him not to come nearer than he was. He said he wanted to talk with me and have Tamsin give him a paper that she would not trouble him any more. I told him, there is no paper needed. She isn't your wife, and you have no claim on her. He said he had Major Hansen with him in the carriage, that he had come to give him, Hughes, a situation in Cincinnati, and he, Hughes, wanted to give Tamsin a check on the bank to get some money. I told him, we don't want you or your money. All we ask of you is to keep away and leave us alone. About an hour after reaching the house, we started for Bedford. Got out of the wagon near the junction of the roads in Bedford. I went with Tamsin to the house of Joseph Haynes. Stayed there ten minutes or so when Tamsin started for Mrs. Christian's house. She went out of the house alone, but turned to me while in the yard and said, The carriage has come back. I went to the gate to her and saw another carriage at the fountain house, but did not see the doctor. Next saw her on the sidewalk and Hughes a piece behind. Went back into Mr. Haynes's house, took my bonnet and started out. Got up a little way on that street when the doctor came down on the other side of the road, buttoning up his coat. Saw Mr. Powell coming who said, Oh, Mrs. Parsons, the doctor has shot your daughter dead. Went to the yard as quick as I could, was the first one there. Mrs. Christian opened her front door just as I got in the front yard. Tamsin's body was lying in the yard. John Price was working with Mr. Powell in Christian's yard, digging a trench the day Tamsin Parsons was shot. Heard a pistol shot and a scream. I turned around and saw the girl fall. Jumped out of the trench and saw Dr. Hughes step about three steps from the girl toward the gate. When he walked back, stooped down and put his finger in the wound, saying, You are a dead girl. He then walked out to the gate, down street, went to the body and saw the blood flowing down her face. Followed him and caught hold of his right arm about four yards from where the murder was committed and led him down to the junction of the roads. He said, What are you going to do with me? Told him I would let him know when we got down to the corner. Nothing more was said till we got down to the corner. When there, he pulled away, drew his revolver, and said, No man touch me. Saw his carriage coming up, containing Russell and a driver. He got in, Russell helping him, when they tried to start away from the crowd. Mr. Golden and I stepped up to drag Hughes out. Russell sat on the front seat, Dr. H. on the back. Laid my hand on Hughes's shoulder when Russell pulled his revolver and putting it near my face said, Let go of that man or I'll blow your brains out. Heard Russell holler to the driver to drive on. Went back to the yard and found the body still lying there. Amelia Christian, M. daughter of William Christian and 13 years old. Came down to Bedford with Mr. Thomas Parsons' people the day of Tamsin's death. Saw Tamsin. She was in the road and Dr. Hughes was just stepping off the sidewalk on the opposite side of the road. When he got nearly to the gate at the side of the road, he pulled out his pistol, pushed the gate open, and when he got to her, put his hand on her shoulder and shot her. After he had shot her the first time, he cocked his pistol and shot her again. She screamed and fell down. Mother was standing by me. Mother said to Dr. H, how could you do it? The poor girl is dead. We then went in and shut the door. Stood at the front window and looked out. Saw Dr. H go down near the gate when he came back. He looked at her a while when he went away. Dr. H said nothing when my mother spoke to him. He was looking at her at the time. Matthew O. Christian. Am a son of Mr. Christian and 16-year-old. Between 1 or 2 o'clock on the day of the murder, saw Tamsin coming toward our gate and Dr. Hughes after her. When opposite our house, she turned her head and said to Dr. H, No, I won't stop. Then she turned across the street toward our gate. Ran and opened the gate. She passed through and I let the gate go too. The doctor crossed the road and when near the gate, took a pistol from his pocket, cocked it, and went through the gate. When about ten feet from the door, he caught hold of her, put his left hand on her shoulder, and said, You won't stop, will you? And put the pistol to the back of her head and fired. She dropped her head a little and said, Oh dear, when he cocked his pistol again, fired, and she dropped. My mother was standing in the front door and said, Oh doctor, how could you do so? Or something like that. He said nothing. Mr. Powell, standing in the ditch, said, You old villain, what have you done? He said, She is shot dead, and turned toward the gate. Saw him go down the street, followed by Mr. Price. Tamsin seemed to be scared when she went through the gate and in a great hurry. 
W. M. Heston. The day of the murder, when the alarm was raised, heard Hughes say he had done what he had intended to do if she would not be willing to consent to go with him, that she was his lawful wife. He was explaining to Wells where he intended to shoot her. He put his finger up to Wells's head and used some medical term I don't know. Hughes took a flask from his pocket and held it up and shook it, drank the contents and gave the flask to Mr. Strong. He then gave the pistol or revolver to Mr. Wells. Hughes said he had been from the highest circles of Europe to the lowest of this country, had been in the Crimean War, and had been in service in this country, that half his life was spent in the manor, and now the balance would end in a love tragedy. Handed the pistol to Hughes, and he took it apart and showed us the inside, and handed it back to Mr. Wells. He said he had replaced the cartridges he had fired from his pistol, and thought at one time he would put it in his mouth and blow his brains out, then thought he would lie down and take a nap. I said he took it very cool. He said in response that he was no coward. A.O. Strong was present when Hughes was arrested. I said to him, Doctor, you might as well give yourself up. There are too many of us. He said he would. Said he bought that revolver for the purpose of doing the deed he did if she didn't comply with his wishes. Said he had relieved his mind of a great load and that he would meet her on the other side of the great water. Spoke of sending his first wife to the Isle of Man for the purpose of getting this girl to live with him that the first time he saw her, he set his affection on her, said he was willing to give his life for her, that they could do what they chose with him, hang him, or what they chose, said he meant that no other man should ever possess Tamsin, asked Hughes if he would have shot Joe Haynes if he had seen him, said he might have done it at the time his excitement raged so high that he wouldn't wish harm anybody else. He said that some might think he was deranged, but he was not. He was in his right mind. His manner was not excited. William Christian. On the day of the murder, Hughes came to my shop about one o'clock, asked me if I had seen Miss Parsons that day, told him I had not. He asked me where my wife was, told him she had gone to Mr. Parsons' house some hours ago, and I had not seen her since. He then said, my friend, you have been too busy in my affairs of late, and related what a good friend he had been to me and my family. At this time, Cornelius Haynes entered and said he wanted me to measure him for a pair of pants. The doctor lowered his tone then, and I could not hear all he said, but it seemed to be something of a threatening character. In fifteen or twenty minutes after he, he left, I heard of Tamsin being shot. Never saw Hughes intoxicated. A.J. Wells. On the way to Cleveland, Hughes said he came out there for the purpose of killing the girl, as she didn't comply with his wishes. Asked him what reason he had, and he replied that he didn't want anybody else to possess her, that she should not become anybody else's wife. He said he had bought the pistol for the express purpose of killing her, that he had sent his wife home to the island and he wanted to live with her, Tamsin, that he understood she was going to marry somebody. He put his finger on my head and showed the place he shot her. He wanted to kill her instantly so that she would not suffer. He crossed his fingers in explaining how he shot her and said a shot given as indicated would be instant death. He said he shot twice and the last time he had his left hand on her shoulder. Asked him if he would have shot any of us that were in pursuit of him and he said no one except Joe Haynes. Asked him why he would have shot Haynes and he said Haynes had caused all this trouble. He said he had not slept well for some time back but he could sleep well tonight. That he had been thinking over this matter. He gave me the pistol to remember him by and it would probably have to come into court as evidence, and after they got through with it, I could have it. His manner was cool and calm. Witnesses for the defense. Thomas Lowe. Have known Dr. Hughes two years and a half, making his acquaintance in Warrensville. He left my house in January 1864 and went to Bedford to live and practice medicine. About a month after he went into the army. Saw Dr. H. at my house in Warrensville after he returned from the army. He came to my house in the same cutter, Miss Tamsin Parsons, with him. They occupied the public sitting room after dinner, occupied no other room together than I know of. They left about five o'clock, going towards Cleveland. Talked with them about half an hour. They seemed to be on friendly terms. Have seen Dr. H. under the influence of liquor. Never saw him so affected that his walk was not good. His face would assume a purple color. He was nervous the next day, but not when tight was always very easily excited when drunk and looked wild with his eyes. Have seen him in that condition several days and even a week on a stretch. This excitement would increase as he continued drunk. Once he acted so bad, fighting with his wife, etc., that I ordered him to leave the house. 
have seen him reel a few times when he was far gone with drink, but he usually carried himself well. Mrs. Kate Owens, reside in Cleveland, have known Dr. H. between three and four years, was at his office on the 6th and 7th of August. He was there on Sunday the 6th, but not on the 7th. Word was left on his slate that he would be back in a little while. That was his habit. On Monday evening before the murder, I found this entry. I will be back in a few moments. Dr. H. had been my family physician off and on about three years. Oscar Russell, have known Hughes about two years, was with him the day of the murder and all the night before. Met him at the St. Nicholas Saloon about eight or nine o'clock that evening. We drank there, don't know what, for I was drunk. I don't know that Hughes was drunk. We stayed there five or ten minutes and then went to several drinking places. Went to Carr's carriage and Hughes asked him what he would charge to take us riding all night and come back in the morning. Saw a pistol lying in Hughes's trunk in his office when we were there. I said, that's a nice shooter you have. Hughes said, yes, I'll put it in my pocket. He also took a flask and had it filled downstairs. When the driver said he could not find some women he had been looking for to go with us, Dr. H said he could find some in the country and we started. At Newburgh, Hughes engaged rooms at the Cataract House and said we would be back and stay there all night. I was asleep on the way to Newburgh and also when going from Newburgh to Bedford. At Bedford, we were to be called at seven in the morning. Hughes said we had better get home and attend to business. In the morning, we drank whiskey several times, both before and after breakfast. We started home and I asked Hughes where the women were he was going to see, and he said he would show them to me on the road home. At the grocery opposite the Plank Road house, Hughes and I drank ale about 25 times. At Crumb's house, Hughes proposed to me to go to Parson's house, introduce myself as Major Hansen, tell them he was out there and they would send out for him, which I refused to do. While going back to Bedford from Crumb's, I was asleep, was sitting in the bar room of the Fountain House, Hughes having gone out when the driver car came in and told me there was a muss, ran out and saw Hughes coming around the corner, keeping all off him with a revolver in his hand. He came to me just at the carriage and told me to get in, which I did. He got in and pointed the revolver at the driver and told him to drive on, saying, drive or I'll shoot. Got out then and climbed up to the driver. I never told any man to let Hughes alone or I'd blow his brains out. I hadn't anything to blow anybody's brains out with. When Hughes came up to me at the carriage, his face was red as fire, his eyes just as if popping out, and he was mightily excited told the driver to drive or we would both be shot and he drove as fast as he knew how. Don't remember of giving Hughes any money after the shooting. Hughes boarded with me from July 14, 1865 till the time of his shooting. Saw Hughes drunk once before this affair. His face was very red and he talked a great deal. Saw him only once deep in liquor. He talked fast, his face was very red, and he told me of his troubles. I came near going to the penitentiary, he said. I asked why for having two wives, he replied. J.D. Keegan. Have known Hughes since the spring of 1862. Am a druggist. Have seen Hughes quite frequently under the influence of liquor. The effect of liquor on him was always very marked. It made him very reckless. He seemed to have no regard for his character and to be indifferent as to what he might do while in that condition. When drunk, he seemed utterly demented and senseless. Was always much flushed then. Eyes bloodshot, talkative, and so offensive in what he said that I forbade him coming to my store. Didn't affect his walk much. When sober, he was very gentlemanly. Paul McGuire. Keep a grocery on Ontario Street. Hughes was in my place between eight and nine o'clock with a rustle the evening they went to Bedford. They drank something then. Dr. Hughes got a half a pint flask filled with whiskey there. Was going into the country, he said, to see a patient. Have seen Hughes in liquor. When drunk, his face was red. Never knew him to stagger any, no matter how much intoxicated. He was ugly at such times. James Brown. Keep a saloon in this city, Bolivar and Pittsburgh streets. Dr. Hughes was in my saloon the night before the murder with Russell and a hack driver, about nine o'clock. They drank there, saw nothing out of the way in them. T.J. Quinlan. Have known Dr. Hughes three or four years. He opened an office opposite my place last summer. Saw him the evening before the murder in my store. Said he was sleepy and tired and was going home to bed. Have seen him under the influence of liquor. His face would get red when drunk and his eyes grow larger, but his walk was steady. Very few would ever know he was drunk. Edward Nichols. Am 14 years old. No Dr. Hughes. Was in his employ two weeks and three days. The engagement ended on the arrest of Dr. Hughes. Ran errands, made his bed, etc. 
saw the pistol under his pillow every morning when I made the bed. Alfred Eastwood, am not acquainted with Dr. Hughes, saw him last at a grocery near Plank Road House the day Tamsin Parsons was shot. He and the rest were pretty well set up when I went in. John Coven, have lived in the city 23 years, born in the Isle of Man, knew Hughes there when a boy, and his parents was brought up in Hughes's father's house from time I was 10 years old till I came to this country. His grandmother, Jane Kenwich, was insane and committed suicide about a year after her husband's death. Other members of the family on the grandmother's side were insane. One and I think two committed suicide. The conduct of Hughes when he is sober is gentlemanly and proper. Mr. Castle, what effect had drink upon the prisoner's father? The question was objected to by the state, and the court ruled that it was not relevant. Mr. Andrews, no Hughes saw him on the day of the murder after his arrest. He looked like a man that had been drinking considerably. His face was red, his eyes looked very wild. Have seen Hughes drink several times, but never saw him stagger. He is very slow in speech when drunk. Have never seen him excited. Jazz Tear. Have known Hughes since he had been in Ohio and knew his father and grandfather. His grandfather committed suicide when insane. It was common talk that an uncle of his committed suicide in Demara, but I don't know of it positively. Edward B. Campbell. Have known Hughes for five years. Saw Hughes when a member of the 5th Dragoon Guards in the English Army during the Crimean War. Also saw him when he was assistant surgeon of the 85th Regimental Corps de Africa in the Federal Army at Vicksburg, in charge of a Marine hospital. I've never seen him stagger when drunk, and a person not acquainted with him would not discover that he was drunk. I.S. Eli. Have known Hughes about two years. Saw him at my home on the day of the murder after his arrest. He did not seem to be intoxicated, but his face was very red and his eyes wild and excited. Saw him the night before and judged he had been drinking a great deal. William Lewis. Knew Hughes when he was a boy at school and when he lived at Warrensville. Knew nothing bad of his general character. Charlotte Parsons. Have known Hughes two or three years. Am sister-in-law to Tamsin Parsons' father. Was at Hughes' office the day before his trial at Justice Porter's. He engaged to come to my house on Sunday to treat my ears. At Tamsin's house, I told her that Dr. Hughes was going to operate on my ears at my house and asked her when she was coming. She said she wanted to come the worst way, but her mother was up to Haynes's, and she said, You know I mustn't say any more. I told Tamsin Hughes was coming up Sunday and asked her if she wasn't coming up. She replied as before. Mrs. Harriet Robinson. Live in Bedford. No Hughes by sight, not personally. Was well acquainted with Tamsin Parsons. She was at my house twice after Hughes's arrest for assault. She called at my house to get a carriage to attend the trial. I said, Tamsin, I should think you would be afraid to be out at night for fear you will be disturbed. She replied she thought he would not injure her or hurt a hair on her head. She told me what had happened the night he was at her house and said next morning she was going to withdraw the suit. O. B. Judd. Have known Hughes since 1861. His reputation was that of a quiet, gentlemanly man. Saw him once intoxicated. He was apparently wild and did not know what he was about. John Burke, knew Dr. Hughes in Warrensville. His reputation was that of a good moral man when attending to his business. Until the affair with Tamsin, his reputation was good. William Crum, recalled. At the grocery near the Plank Road house, Hughes said to me he wanted to see Miss Parsons, that he wanted to have a talk with her. He said he had met them on the road, but Suxi, Mrs. P., was so full of hell he could not talk to her. He said he wanted to make provision for her support so she could draw her money every three or six months or year, or if she got married, he would give her a check for $500 on a bank. Said he had word from Governor Bro to go to Nashville and take charge of a general hospital. P. Roeder, M. Physician of the County Jail, was called to see Hughes next morning after his arrest about 9 o'clock. He labored under great mental excitement and showed some of the symptoms of delirium tremens. His face was flushed, eyes protruding, and his pulse was frequent and weak. His tongue was coated and feverish. I ordered whiskey, did not visit him again until next day, and continued to call frequently. The symptoms of delirium are those I have described. Dr. P. Thayer. M. Physician, have known Hughes since his arrival in Warrensville. Saw him under the influence of intoxicating liquors frequently. Could always notice by his face if he had been drinking. At one time in July, last I saw him perform an operation when he had been drinking. 
He was nervous, but he performed the operation. During the time, I saw no muscular effect of liquor. Sheriff Nicola, M. Sheriff of Cuyahoga County, saw Hughes at the door when he was brought in night of his arrest. Next morning, between 8 and 9 o'clock, Hughes appeared to be under great nervous excitement, was advised to give him whiskey, which I refused unless advised by the jail physicians who were called and gave him, as before stated, was present at all interviews between the prisoner and others. I had no conversation the first night, but about 10 o'clock he begged for liquor, saying, for God's sake, give me some beer. H. S. Smith M. Jailer of the County Jail saw Dr. Hughes the first time when he was brought in after his arrest. Should judge he was pretty drunk. His face was very red and he had a wild look on his countenance. Next morning he had the shakes. Called Dr. Roeder who ordered me to give him whiskey and laudanum in doses of about 25 drops of laudanum with a drink of whiskey three or four times a day for about a week. Also gave him valerian three or four times a day. While giving him the medicine, his appearance was one of being troubled with the delirium tremens. His appearance and conduct since then has been good. Dr. Strong, am a physician and surgeon, have treated cases of delirium tremens to the number of over 100. The higher and greater the development of the brain, the greater the excitement produced. Have known Hughes four or five years, have seen him intoxicated. His face was florid, language very intemperate, but when sober, found him to be a perfect gentleman. Think that the effect of liquor on him would be that of excessive excitement. He was, when intoxicated, inclined to be quarrelsome, but did not stagger. Dr. D. G. Streeter. No Hughes. I boarded with him at the Franklin House. Have seen him intoxicated three or four days at a time. Liquor seemed to increase his muscular power. Saw him once after several days' excessive drinking start to see a patient to perform an amputation. He asked me if I would not go. Had with him a mechanic's saw and a butcher knife. He said that a French surgeon had recommended them in a case of emergency. He was going to use them. Think he had surgery on the brain. Eliza Crum. Remember the night Dr. Hughes was at Parsons' house in July last. Saw his buggy in the road, searched it, and found a bottle of liquor in it. Took it home with me. It would hold near a quart. Should think it was either cherry or blackberry brandy. Thomas McKinstry, and policeman, Remember the day in August of the arrest of Hughes, left in pursuance of a dispatch received from Bedford to make the arrest. Just before getting there, met the carriage with Hughes in it, he having been arrested. Got into the carriage and came to the jail. Hughes looked to me like a man who had been on a long drunk. That was his general appearance. He is evidently a man who can stand a great deal of liquor. His walk was not affected, but his face and talk revealed the fact of intoxication. Have known him four or five years. His face was bloated a good deal and of purple color, his eyes very much bloodshot. He was very nervous, was close by him in the hotel, and when combing his hair, his hands showed that his nerves were all unstrung. He talked in a bravado manner, rather boasting of what he had done. After he washed, the doctor went to the bar and drank a glass of ale. Think he drank two glasses. Have frequently seen Dr. Hughes intoxicated. When in liquor, he was foolish and did not seem to care what he did. When intoxicated, he would talk foolishly and incoherently and do foolish things. He seemed to know perfectly well what was going on around him when I saw him in the carriage. He recognized me and spoke to me. He conversed freely and coolly about the transaction. Mary Quillman lived in Hughes's family three years ago, about five weeks. Have seen him under the influence of drink. He appeared very sullen. His eyes were glassy. His face very red. Seemed very nervous and sometimes got very much excited. His walk was never noticeably different when drunk. Saw him once when very ugly. He had been away all night. He came to me in the kitchen. I asked him what he wanted. He took hold of me with both hands and I had to defend myself. I had the stove handle in my hand, struck him across the arm with it, and he let go. Have seen him drunk several times since I left his house. An affidavit of the defendant made to support a motion for continuance of the case was here read by his counsel. It alleged that the defendant was unable to procure the attendance of J.J. Patterson and G.O.S. Kimball, medical officers of the United States Army, well acquainted with defendant, who would swear they have often seen him intoxicated, and in this state very singularly affected, suffering under total aberration of mind, while his muscular system was unaffected, that it was essentially necessary to arrest him often to prevent injury to himself and best friends and that this effect was, in their opinion, entirely due to the influence of liquor, but was involuntary. The motion for continuance having been disallowed, the allegations of the affidavit were admitted as testimony. The Speeches of Counsel Mr. Slade 
Gentlemen of the jury, after a long and patient examination of this extraordinary case, we are now drawing our labors to a close. This is a case involving the highest consequences not only to the prisoner but to the community. Subsequent developments have fully sustained the position taken by the prosecutor at the opening. Against the prisoner at the bar, we can have no personal feeling, but we must deal with him as a criminal who has committed the highest crime known to law. The prisoner has had every lenity shown him by the court. Eminent counsel has been assigned him, and nothing has been left undone to extenuate his great offense. But while every man is presumed to be innocent till proven guilty, when once shown to have violated the law, then to waver in conviction is treason to duty. The highest sanction is necessary to protect life. For the frightful increase of murder, robbery, and other high crimes, there must be some cause. What is it? It is because when crimes are detected, there is so much uncertainty of punishment. There is even admiration for the great criminal after the momentary excitement has passed away. The people everywhere are asking if a man can be convicted of murder in the first degree in Ohio. Now what is the crime alleged against the defendant? The learned prosecutor has stated that it is the highest crime known to the law of the state. Let us now turn and examine and review the law and evidence in the case. What is the crime of murder? In the common law of England, murder was the taking of life by a man in his right mind, with malice, etc. In our statutes, discrimination is made. Murder in the first and second degrees and manslaughter are recognized. Murder in the first degree is the taking of the life of another with deliberation and premeditated malice. Murder in the second degree is the taking of life purposely and maliciously, but without premeditated malice. To constitute murder in the first degree under our statutes, the act must be done purposely, deliberately, premeditatively, and with malice. Purpose means intention, the making up of mind to commit an act. The second element to be considered is deliberation. Premeditation may be ranked with deliberation. It means to weigh, consider, revolve in mind, and an act before its accomplishment. The third ingredient is malice. There are two kinds, expressed and implied. In the first, there is a lying in wait to commit the act and the committing of it with a sedate, deliberate mind and with a formal design. The evidence is circumstantial. In the second, the act may be perpetrated or consummated while the person is doing another unlawful act. This will suffice for the statement of the law in the case. Of the fact of murder by this defendant, there is no question. Let us now turn to review the evidence in the case by way of refreshing our memories. End of section 65. Section 66 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Dr. John W. Hughes for the Murder of Tamsin Parsons, Cleveland, Ohio, 1865, Part 3. Mr. Slade then reviewed the history of the affair, commencing with the seduction of Tamsin Parsons, an unsophisticated country girl whose youth and ignorance made her the easy victim of this cool, calculating man. He narrated the flight to Pittsburgh, the marriage, the pursuit of Haynes, the discovery by Tamsin that her husband was a bigamist, his arrest and trial, his incarceration and her return home, his sudden appearance four or five months later and immediate attentions to Tamsin, telling her he had sent away his first wife, that he might take her to live with him in Cleveland. He detailed his subsequent actions, his breaking into Mr. Parsons' house on the night of the 25th of July, his visit to Dr. Ray at Warrensville the next day, asked him if he had a pistol and saying on Ray's asking him what he wanted of it, if that damned bitch don't stop calling herself Mrs. Hughes, I'll shoot her, his stay at Plank Road House that night, and his remarks to Mrs. Eddy at breakfast the next morning, Wednesday the 16th, Pity it hadn't blown her damned brains out and saved me the trouble some time, in response to Mrs. E's telling him that Tamsin had a ball recently passed through her parasol, his drive to Bedford that morning and statement to Mr. Salisbury that he must hunt up Tamsin and if she won't live with me, I'll kill her, his trial before Justice Porter the next Saturday for the crime of housebreaking, his settlement of the difficulty with Tamsin through the mediation of Mr. Henry Parsons, and Hughes's solemn promise never to have more to do with or to say to this girl, his violation of the promise within two weeks, all this going to show the threat of the intention in Hughes's mind to kill this girl as an alternative. He was not intoxicated when he made these statements to Mrs. Eddy and Mr. Salisbury. 
and from them we can see the latent purpose, the absorbing thought of Tamsin, the desire to have her live with him, and his deepening intention to slay her if she refuses to comply. The precision with which Hughes fired, aiming at the vital point, his taking money from Russell as he left the carriage in flight, and his run to the woods to reach the cars, his coolness after the capture, and the statements of intention by the defendant on the ride to the city show that he was in his right mind, that the murder was a deliberate, rational act. There was nothing to show that he was in a frenzy and in such a mental state as to make him irresponsible for his act. Mr. Slade then entered on the consideration how far the question of drunkenness should enter into the palation or mitigation of crime. If a man has formed the purpose to commit murder, it makes no difference if he became drunk before committing the deed. Voluntary drunkenness is no excuse for crime committed in that state of intoxication. Though it reduces a man to a state of temporary insanity, it is no defense of crime. It would not shield a man if he was sane before he became drunk. A drunk malice is as dangerous and quite as wicked as a sober one. Intoxication must be considered, like any other fact, to discover the status of a man's mind. If counterfeit money is found on the person of a man so drunk that he knows nothing of it, the fact of drunkenness refutes the evidence of crime. But if he had it before he became intoxicated, the fact of intoxication should have no weight, and precisely the same application must be made in this case. It makes no difference whether Hughes formed the purpose to kill Tamsin Parsons two weeks or two months before the deed was committed. He is as guilty in one case as in the other. Nor does it matter how much liquor he may have drunk if he knew what he was about at the time of the murder. Gentlemen, let us for a moment pass in review of this case, bloodiest in the annals of crime. The facts cannot be denied. The defendant himself boasted over the rune he had wrought, that he should meet the murdered one across the great waters. It seems to me even now and here he might see her wandering by a shadow like an angel with bright hair dabbled in blood. Tamsin Parsons died in defense of her virtue. When the seducer came in, the person of a man pleasing address and finished education, with a forged degree of divorce in his hand, he found her a mere child yet at school. She yielded to his machinations and was lured from home and friends. The forger became the bigamist and wrote on his forehead the horrid crime of adultery. Her friends followed. She learned of his deception and was rescued from the jaws of her remorseless prostitution. And on the forger, the bigamist, the adulterer, was doomed to confinement for a year within the walls of a prison. After four months, we find his poor wife, the mother of his child, true to her womanly instincts, wending her way out to our city, procuring signatures for his pardon. She obtained it. What promises he makes we know not. Does he not come to her with contrition and gratitude? No. He banishes her and the child. For what? That he may again set his snares for the young and unsuspecting Tamsin. That he may lead her into a life of prostitution to end her days with those fallen ones who are bought with a price. The forger, the bigamist, the adulterer, seeks again his prey, plies his arts. The mother of the child hovers near. Tamsin says, you have deceived me once, you cannot again. He will not desist, counts upon his strong control. He is mistaken, she will not yield. She seeks the house of refuge given by a Christian woman, nearly entered. He sees all is lost. He cannot possess her. He draws, takes deadly aim, fires, and Tamsin dies to live in heaven. The forger, the bigamist, the adulterer, John W. Hughes, walks forth a murderer. Let a monument be raised in memory of fallen virtue, which the young and fair can look upon when we are dead and gone. From this sad tragedy we learn, quote, The triumphs that on vice attend shall ever in confusion end. The good man suffers but to gain, and every virtue springs from pain. As aromatic plants bestow no spicy fragrance while they grow but crushed or trodden to the ground, diffuse their balmy sweets around. End quote. Gentlemen, we throw upon you the burden of this case. It rests with you. You've solemnly sworn to decide this issue according to the law and the evidence. Mercy rests not with you, not with the judge, but with the governor of the chair of state. You are to do justice, nothing more, nothing less. I ask you in the name of that community so cruelly outraged that waits patiently to see whether under any circumstances the highest penalty can be enforced. I ask you in the name of violated chastity everywhere. I ask you in the name of God, whose image has been so cruelly defaced. And finally, I ask you in the name of the very law itself. To this day, mark by your verdict your estimate of the protection which shall be given to the poor man's child. Mr. Knight, 
Gentlemen of the jury, the business here committed to your charge is one of the most important that ever arises in the affairs of men. The inquest that you now hold is one that involves the life of the unfortunate prisoner at the bar, and in a matter of such great importance it is of utmost importance to the faithful discharge of that duty that you look well to yourselves and see that in making up your judgment you shall be uninfluenced in any degree by prejudice or passion and that your deliberations shall be entirely free and your conclusions totally unaffected by either passion or prejudice. A man of great uniformity of temper and strong predispositions to vice after hours of drunken revelry and dissipation and in an unfortunate moment when madness like a destroying angel has usurped the dominion of his mind and subverted reason from her seat committed what the prosecution and the populace see fit to characterize as murder. And hence there has arisen a powerful prejudice against the defendant. I ask you in behalf of justice in the name of liberty, which is your duty to shield and protect, that you shall remain unaffected by it. Let it storm walls as wildly, madly, and furiously as they may around this temple, and gather and beat until it shall rock upon its foundations. Still no breath should enter here." I pass now, gentlemen, to a consideration of the law as applicable to this case. The defendant is charged with murder in the first degree. To make that out, the state have to establish five things. First, the killing. Second, that it was malicious. Third, that it was purposely done. Fourth, that it was done with deliberation. And fifth, that it was done with premeditation. What now are we to understand by these several elements which constitute murder? It is a rule of interpretation that we are to give effect to each of the words of the statute or of an instrument which we wish to interpret. Mr. Knight cited various authorities to throw the meaning of the several words above named, and the general conclusion deduced that the meaning of the first section of the Crimes Act containing the above words and under which the defendant is charged is that the killing must be done in pursuance of an intention or design to kill which intention must have been formed before the party attempted to execute that design, and that he must have stopped to consider, to weigh in his mind that design, that if the act was committed whilst the defendant was in a fit of anger or of rage induced by the deceased, he would not be guilty of the charge, that if the intention to kill was formed whilst the defendant was subject to any passion which disqualified him for deliberation, and that intention was executed while still under the influence of that passion, he would not be guilty, that the intent to kill, although not essential to constitute murder at the common law, is by the first section of the Crimes Act made an ingredient of that crime. That deliberation and premeditation, although not an essential element of murder at common law, is by the same section made an element of that crime, that the presumption of law arising from proof of killing alone is that it was murder in the second degree and not murder in the first degree that the jury have in addition to the finding of a homicide to find expressly and from proof an additional element of deliberation and premeditation, that no extent of proof of malice simply will warrant the finding of deliberation and premeditation, but that in addition to the proof of malice, there must be proof of deliberation and premeditation as distinct facts and elements of crime, that drunkenness is competent in a charge of murder in the first degree to be proved to the jury for the purpose of showing that the defendant did not at the time of committing the act have sufficient understanding to intend the act, and that drunkenness is competent in all cases where the intention is an element of the crime. Now, gentlemen, this much with regard to the law for the present. I wish to call your attention to a few facts which have been given you in proof, and first I wish to invite your attention to a startling fact disclosed in this investigation in regard to the peculiarity of the defendant's troubles and the melancholy results, and the troubles of his ancestors and their equally unfortunate results. You cannot fail to remark it as impressive coincidence that the kind of trouble which led his ancestor, his grandmother, to commit suicide was the deep grief that gathered and settled upon her heart at the loss of her husband. Thus she became at once subject to fearful visits of awful madness, and in a few months after her loss, in one of her fits of insanity, she terminated her life. So when the defendant realized the fact that she, whom he most loved, had forsaken him, he, like his unfortunate ancestor, became suddenly wild, a maniac, and in its awful visitation he took the life of Tamsin Parsons and contemplated taking his own. It is a singular coincidence that the same character of trouble should befall him as befell his ancestor, and it is equally singular that it should fall with such fearful and yet singular effect upon each. 
It certainly indicates clearly that some infirmity, defect, or predisposition on the part of his ancestors has been transmitted to him as the hereditary accumulation of the morbid predispositions of his ancestors for generations, exalted and intensified in the organization of the defendant. And it is also a singular coincidence that the same character of trouble which led his grandmother to commit suicide led him to contemplate the same melancholy purpose. Nothing is better settled than the predispositions to insanity are transmissible from parent to offspring. Nay more, I cite you the authority of Wharton and Stell, medical jurisprudence, to the fact that the predispositions to lying, cheating, drunkenness, theft, and all other moral vices are as transmissible as gout, consumption, deafness, blindness, and almost all other constitutional diseases. And if that be so, and it is so, then I can clearly understand how the unfortunate defendant comes to be possessed of peculiarities of temper and mental tendencies and susceptibilities which characterized his ancestors, and you then have also the key to the fact that the effect of a great disappointment on him would be like the same on his ancestor. The doctrine of hereditary insanity is comparatively new. Not long ago, insanity in all its forms was simply believed to be a visitation of God, on which we might look with wonder and grief, but to which it was our duty to bow submissively. It was not thought that it was a condition of the mind, which might be traced to a proper and adequate cause, either growing out of some hereditary defect or developed by the circumstances of habits of its unfortunate subject. But now it has come to be well understood that insanity is attributable, like any disease of the body, to causes which operate to its development. And now in the light of recent investigations, the origin and causes of insanity have been searched out, and the great truth established that insanity is transmissible by inheritance. The birthright of my unfortunate client was a powerful tendency to insanity, derived from his ancestors generations ago. In the early part of the present century, insanity was not permitted to be given in defense of crime, but as its origin and extent were gradually studied and understood, its claim to a hearing and excuse for crime came to be recognized and adopted, and now not only the insanity of the defendant himself, but the insanity of his ancestors may be shown in his defense. Man is a peculiar being, and strangely compounded of different natures marvelously mixed. On the one hand is the nobility of his reason and the infinity of his faculties. He is allied to angels and to God. And on the other, in his passions and necessities, he is linked by an inevitable fatality to the beasts of the field. Quote, how poor, how rich, how abject, how august, how complicit, how wonderful is man. End quote. It was the full realization of the marvelous mixing up of large extremes which led the poet in astonishment to exclaim, quote, Oh, what a miracle to man is man, end quote. My client was subject to a wild and foolish infatuation in affairs of love, but he is not the first or only one who has become the deluded victim of infatuation. They have existed in all ages of the world, but sometimes this infatuation takes one hue and sometimes another. It has manifested itself in one person in a morbid and overruling desire for money. Midas, for some service that was rendered by him to Bacchus, was told he should have whatever he wished. And so absorbing was his desire for gold that he wished that whatever he touched might turn into gold. And from those mythological times until now, there have been these whose whole being has been absorbed and overshadowed by this ruling passion. Sometimes it manifests itself in dreams of ambition and glory. A diadem casts its maddening gleams into the eyes of ambitious men, and they long for that giddy elevation and are ready to wade through slaughter to the throne. Every desire is for that end, and every thought is how they can gain it. Sometimes it takes a religious turn, and from the time when Peter the Hermit went back from Asia to Europe and kindled a fire of enthusiasm which lighted up all Europe and which led to the famous Crusades until today, there have been religious enthusiasts who, in the wilderness and blindness of their enthusiasm, have looked on a martyr's death with indifference. Again, it takes the more tender form of love. Paris stole the Grecian Helen and fled with her to Troy, and this illicit love led to the siege and utter destruction of Troy. Mark Antony, the greatest of Rome, gave up the world for Cleopatra. Leander swarmed the Helen spot for his love. Henry VIII of England, under the influence of this passion, threw off the power of the Church of Rome in England and established himself as the head of both church and state, 
and thus led the way for the emancipation of the English people from the fearful, tyrannous grasp and authority of the Roman Church. And so all through the world's history, both in ancient fable and in ancient and modern history, we find numberless examples of those over whom the tender passion held complete control. My unfortunate client is one of the latter class. Love is the ruling passion with him. It absorbs all others. It rises out of his temperament as natural as perfume issues from the rose. To this peculiar tendency of his temperament, he adds the morbid predisposition in the same direction which he inherited from his ancestor. And to both of these, he superadds the stimulating and exciting effect of intoxication. These tendencies of temperament and hereditary morbid predisposition, excited and intensified by intoxication, give that passion a supreme and absolute control over him. And the whole strength and current of his being sets in that direction and makes the object of his love everything to him. But the prosecutions say, and truly too, that the defendant is a person of extraordinary intellect and of rare learning. We admit it. But is a great genius proof against vice and temptation? By no means. The power to control our sections lies not in the greatness of our intellect or the power and activity of our moral force. If the intellect alone is the power which exercises moral control over any individual, then the most intellectual man would be the best. But is such the case? No, gentlemen. Lord Bacon, one of the most intellectual of men, on account of his vice and crime, has been characterized as the brightest, wisest, meanest of mankind. And it was in a felon's cell that he gave birth to those wonderful lucubrations which fell on the earth like an apocalypse of nature, and from which arose the exultations of a new intellectual morning that has arisen into a still increasing day, the genial sun of which has warmed into life a giant brood of useful arts and a still more giant brood of useful sciences, and which rolled back that cloud of darkness which enveloped the earth for a thousand years." Our safety from vice cannot be found in the strength of intellect, but alone in the complete ascendancy of the moral natures. The great intellect and attainments of defendant could have no force in restraining the wild, morbid, and overpowering passions which were his inheritance. With a weak nature, the defendant was possessed of a most powerful, passionate nature, which, when it found an object meeting its fancy, made him become wildly and madly attached thereto. Tamsin Parsons, the deceased, was that object. He loved her madly and blindly, and when he found the object of that love had forsaken him and turned away from him, the awful passion of love was disappointed, and he, under the influence of disappointment, became insane, and when that fearful cloud and paroxysm crossed his mind, his intellect became eclipsed, and failing in self-control and judgment, perpetrated the fearful deed." We ask you when you retire for deliberation to so decide that when you shall separate from your labors here and return home again, you may say in your devotions and prayers to God, quote, that mercy I show to others, that mercy show to me, end quote. Mr. Castle discussed the evidence taken by the state, reviewing it generally and with analysis and criticism and putting upon it such construction as he claimed was warranted by fact or proof in the light of reason. He worked his way through this mountain of evidence with industry, persistency, and endurance. His argument abound with passages of eloquence, pathos, invective, satire, and impassioned appeal. His theory of the case came by evidence was that Tamsin Parsons was not a mere child, as represented, but a person come to responsible womanhood, that there was a mutually reciprocal passion burning in the hearts of her and Hughes, that she knew he was a married man, that the claimed forged bill of divorce must have been executed in Pittsburgh after the elopement and with her knowledge, that she never gave over her love for him, albeit she listened to the solicitations of her friends and returned home, for, on the night of the 24th of July last, she testified her willingness and even desire to keep his company when her father had gone to Bedford for an officer to arrest Hughes for housebreaking and assault, and by holding an interview of two hours' duration with him at the yard fence." that at no subsequent time did she manifest the slightest ill will toward him, that he loved her with a wild idolatry, albeit it was an illicit love, that all his day was but a thought of her and she his dreams by night, so that life was nothing to him without her, that, when baffled by the opposition of her friends and set on fire of hell by excessive drinking with his predispositions, while intoxicated to insanity, reason forsook her seat as Tamsin flitted across his path on that dark day when he slew her, that the murder was the sudden impulse of a brain crazed by drink, and no deliberate malicious act. 
Mr. Castle devoted much time to the ventilation of the alleged threats made by Hughes to take Tamsin's life. That to Dr. Ray on the 25th of July, when he said that if she did not stop calling herself Mrs. Hughes, he would kill her. That to Mrs. Eddy the next morning at breakfast at the Plank Road house, in response to her informing him that a bullet had been fired through her parasol. Pity it hadn't gone a little lower and blown her damned brains out, and save me the trouble some day. And that to Vile Salisbury at Bedford the same day, I must hunt her, Tamsin, up, and if she won't live with me, I'll kill her. He dwelt long and loud on the essential absurdity and improbability of his making such statements when his love for her is considered his desires and efforts to get her to live with him. It is inconceivable that, if he meditated her murder or desired to take her life, that he should thus drum up witnesses of the contemplated deed, and so plan things as to make his conviction fatally sure. It was the poison he had swallowed in copious droughts which killed Tamsin Parsons, not John W. Hughes. End of section 66. Section 67 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Dr. John W. Hughes for the Murder of Tamsin Parsons, Cleveland, Ohio, 1865, Part 4. Mr. Palmer, gentlemen of the jury, I stand before you for the last time in the discharge of the responsible duties connected with the investigation of this important case, not to measure rhetorical blades with my friend who opened for the defense in the shadowy region of metaphysical and theoretical speculation, in which for the greater part of his address he roamed, nor to test pinions with my other friend who closed for the defense, who has so long delighted us by his adventurous flights of eloquence. The business of this hour requires of me to render such aid as I may in elucidating the truth from the testimony rehearsed in your hearing, and to that task, impressed with the solemnity of the duty I have to discharge, I now address myself. It is truth which is at issue here. I shall show you that we have established every point made in our opening statement. That is a complete drama, with a beginning, all the consecutive stages of development, and a tragedy for a fitting conclusion. One year ago, this defendant was brought before the mayor of Pittsburgh, charged with bigamy. All this tragedy has been developed in one short year. Let us review it. The curtain rises in the quiet village of Bedford, and two characters came upon the stage a little over one year ago. Who are they? One has been before you for the last two weeks, a mature man of the world, educated and polished, the other an unsuspecting country maiden, seventeen years of age, inexperienced, confiding, who now sleeps quietly in the cemetery at Bedford. This man sought that virtuous, artless maiden in her secluded home, at a time when she was deprived of her mother's watchful care, implied the arts and fascinations at the command of a cultivated, experienced man of the world. His honeyed words meant lust, love, forgotten by him were all the lessons of childhood, solemn marriage vows, the pleadings of his innocent boy who claimed from him the legacy of a fair name. On Monday, December 19, 1864, the parties leave Bedford for Pittsburgh. The mother of Tamsin hears of the flight on the same day and sends her son-in-law in pursuit on the 20th. Lured thither by the tempter, he prevailed over this unsuspecting maiden's heart and induced her to take this step by the exhibition of a bill of divorce, which he had forged for that purpose. They had been married. On the 21st, he was arrested on the charge of bigamy and flung into jail to await trial, and she, bitterly deceived, returned to her father's house. And the curtain falls upon a felon's cell, its inmate leprous with lust, a forger, a bigamist, and an adulterer. In January, he was convicted and sentenced to the penitentiary of Pennsylvania. During those four or five months of imprisonment, what was passing in his mind? This imperious nature brooded over his failure to carry out his designs. He could not brook it. He would show Tamsin Parsons, when he got out, that he would accomplish his purpose. His will becomes more relentless and determined, and he makes a resolve not to be foiled again. For accepting an early summon, the boon of liberty from the hands of his devoted wife, whom he treated with equal cruelty and meanness, he was no sooner released from the penitentiary than he makes his appearance here in July last, and sets about completing his foiled purpose. He sends away his wife and child to his native Isle of Man. 
that they may offer no impediment. Three, several times the defendant himself expressly said that he sent them away in order that he might get Tamsin to live with him. He will live with her. On the night of the 24th of July, these characters come upon the stage again. He enters her father's house late at night, seeking an interview with Tamsin. For four long hours, he exercises all his powers of fascination and persuasion in vain. You have deceived me once, and you shall never do it again, she reiterates in answer to his passionate urgings and entreaties. He drives off, foiled again, and by this young girl, towards Warrensville. That imperious will has once more been balked, and his spirit chafes and rages at the result of the interview. He sees Dr. Ray at the Warrensville house on the morning of the 25th, and in conversation with him, the feelings of Dr. Hughes's heart are shown and his purpose vaguely expressed. He is provoked, angry, and the first sparks of a kindling revenge show themselves. He asks Dr. Ray if he had a pistol. No, why? That damned Tamsin is calling herself Mrs. Hughes, and if she doesn't stop, I'll blow her brains out. He indulges freely in drink, and when he arrives that night at the Plank Road house, he is drunk. His purpose is more distinctly stated before Mrs. Eddy at breakfast on the morning of the 26th. When, in response to her information that a ball recently passed through Tamsin's parasol, he said, Pity it hadn't gone a little lower and blown her brains out, and saved me the trouble some time. He is still brooding over his disappointment, the thwarting of his darling purpose, and in these statements we get glimpses of the state of his mind toward the girl. A few hours later he meets Vile Salisbury, and the expression of his purpose is no longer vague or even indistinct. If she will not live with me, I'll kill her. He is arrested on Thursday on the charge of housebreaking, examined on Saturday before Justice Porter in the city, Tamsin herself making an affidavit against him. This act of hers makes his failure all the more apparent, and his prospect of success now seems hopeless. He buys the pistol that day, the pistol with which two weeks later he shot her. He meets Henry Parsons that evening, who advises him to settle that difficulty and offers himself as a mediator. Here is a gleam of hope to Dr. Hughes's mind. If she can be reconciled unto him, he thinks he may still win her with his charms. They go to her house the next day, Sunday, when Henry Parsons, after a four hours interview with Tamsin, gains her consent to stay the prosecution, but on the proviso that the doctor shall solemnly promise to molest her no more. He was maddened by reason of the length of time taken to settle, even on these terms. The settlement was made, the promise given. Here was a new hope for the successful issue of another effort. That strong will, never yet balked, was not willing to acknowledge itself conquered by a village maiden. He awaited an opportunity, and on Tuesday evening, August 8th, it occurred. He met Russell, they drank. Russell proposed a drive. The defendant engaged for a ride to Bedford. Here is a twin villain who will aid him perchance. If they meet Tamsin and she refuses to go with him, they may kidnap her. The pistol and flask of whiskey are taken by Hughes. They are necessary attendants in all purposes and deeds of violence and blood. They start with a double lie of calling Russell Major Hansen, and that their errand is the amputation of a limb. Hughes was not drunk. He gave all the directions on the road. Arriving at the crossroads near Bedford, Hughes ordered the driver to stop. Why? He was debating whether it were better to go there that night or wait until morning. He had failed in one nocturnal visitation. He would try his fortune in daylight. They stop at the hotel. It is not corroborated that Hughes drinks much the next morning. They set out, see Mr. Christian in the street. Hughes sends for him with a remark, that man cost me fifty dollars. It was he, her warm personal friend, who brought Tamsin into the city to file an affidavit against the doctor. It shows that he was brooding over the manor. He evidently wished to learn where Tamsin was, whether at his house in the village or at her father's, so as not to lose his journey. They drove on, Hughes ordering the driver to turn to the left on the road where Mr. Parsons lived. He sought a private interview, believing it in his power to revive her love for him. He meets Mrs. Christian at Mrs. Parsons' house and learns that Tamsin and her mother have gone blackberrying. When she tells him not to trouble himself, for Tamsin had set her affections elsewhere, he looked venomous and drove off toward the Plank Road house. Soon meeting the object of his search, Hughes orders the driver to stop. 
The women would not stop, but he followed on, overtook them, and parlayed about matters of receiving papers, giving checks on the bank as a ruse to throw Mrs. Parsons off her guard, and gain a private talk with Tamsin. It is refused. Robinson comes along in a wagon and will take the women home. Hughes parlays. The interview is refused. He tells Tamsin he will live with her if he has to hang for it. No one else shall have her if he has to swing for it. She still denies him an interview. He puts his hand to the pocket where his pistol was, but catches Robinson's eye, drops his hand, and as they drive on, walks back to his carriage and thence to the plank road house. He needs stimulus. He falters in his purpose. They drink and post back to Crumbs, opposite Parsons' house, ask for Parsons' family, and learning that they have gone to Bedford, Hughes says drive on to Bedford. He goes first to Christian's shop. Why? To find out where Tamsin is, whether at his house, having rode to town with his wife, or at Joseph Haynes's. He accosts Mr. Parsons and asks him to drink. Why? To find out where Tamsin is. Just then, he spies her going to Christian's house and gives pursuit. She was alone. Here and now, or never, was opportunity to see her alone. If he fail now, his final avowed purpose must be executed. She flies. He pursues, she says. No, I will not stop. Rushes through the gate, opened by the boy, Christian, which is then by him closed. Hughes draws his revolver, cocks it ere he reaches the gate, opens it, speeds up the walk, and within ten feet of Mrs. Christian's open door, lays violent hand on Tamsin's shoulder and fires. She utters a cry so piteous it would have melted a heart other than adamant. He fires again, and Tamsin's spirit soars to where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Now what crime has been committed? Has any? We admit and accept the burden of proof as to deliberation and premeditation of this act. By five different declarations, four of which were made when sober— to Ray, Mrs. Eddy, Messrs. Salisbury, Parsons, and Robinson, we establish that deliberation. We have shown it by the circumstances of the act and by the declarations of the defendant after his capture. Now, what is the defense? It is hard to tell. Is it insanity? No one swears to it, but it was an uncontrollable impulse, say the defense. To what? Love? They cite Othello's love. But the love of the noble Moor was an honest love. He never committed forgery. Was it drunkenness? That was no excuse in the eye of the law, the purpose to kill her having been proven to have been formed two weeks before. If drunk as claimed, he wrought himself into a frenzy by drink as a means to an end. But nobody swears that he was drunk. He was cool, collected, deliberate. The fact of intoxication, not the amount of liquor drink, must be proven. We must proceed to consider what were the mental states of the defendant, what inspired his acts and named desire for an object, disappointment, anger, jealousy, and revenge as springs of action, and their power, natural operations, effects, consequences, etc., thus showing by his exercise of these, as well as by a consciousness of the act in all its bearings, his full memory of all the details, that the defendant acted like a rational, not an insane being, and this view is supported by his prior preparations and conduct, as well as subsequent action. Did he know what he was about? Was he mistaken when he told why he had done the deed? I will not stop to speak of the flimsy fabric reared on his appearance the morning after his arrest, and talk about delirium tremens. He was excited, it is claimed. He trembled and looked wild. Ah, We can imagine what the horrors of that night would be to his guilty soul. We can imagine in his dreams, if he could sleep at all, the ghost of his murdered victim passed before him, as did the visions of his murdered victims before the guilty, Richard on the eve of Bosworth Field. And like him, in terror, he started in his fitful sleep, exclaiming, O coward conscious, how thou dost afflict me! It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Is there a murder here? No. Yes, I am. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree. Murder, stern murder in the durest degree. All several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all, guilty, guilty. End quote. 
Pray, gentlemen, what will make murder in the first degree? What by your verdict will you say? That two weeks' deliberation, five declarations of fell purpose, the purchase of a pistol for the avowed purpose, declaring motives, and doing all ordinary acts, resulting from such motive, exhibiting motive, reason, deliberation, will, consciousness, and after the deed, clear memory, describing the act with coolness? If all this not be murder in the first degree, pray, what is it? Is there such a crime possible? Gentlemen of the jury, my duty is done. I fully appreciate the solemnity of the issue, that crowd thickly as I entrust, this case to you for the performance of your duty. The consciousness of having so done will be an abiding consolation. The serenest reflection you can have in after years, on recalling the scenes of this memorable trial, will be the conviction that you here did your duty, responsive to the solemn obligations of your oath to render a verdict, according to law and the testimony. And when these walls have crumbled, when judge and jury, counsel and spectators are gathered to meet the dread arbitrament of the future, may you each be able to say, in reference to this case, as I now can, I did my duty. End of section 67. Section 68 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Dr. John W. Hughes for the murder of Tamsin Parsons, Cleveland, Ohio, 1865, Part 5. The Charge to the Jury Judge Coffinberry, the prisoner at the bar stands charged by the indictment with the willful, deliberate, and malicious murder of Tamsin Parsons in the county of Cuyahoga and state of Ohio on the ninth day of August, 1865, by shooting her in the back of the neck with a pistol ball. To this indictment, a plea of not guilty has been entered on behalf of the prisoner, and this constitutes the issue which you are impaneled and sworn to try. The state asserts that he is guilty, as charged in the indictment. This he denies, and the burden of proof rests upon the state, and it is incumbent upon the prosecution to prove his guilt, beyond a reasonable doubt, of some of the offenses of which it is possible to convict under this indictment. And if it has failed to make such proof, it becomes your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. It is proper that I should commence my charge as to the law governing the case, by calling your attention to some of the distinctions between the rules of evidence and the measure of proof which obtain in civil and criminal cases. In a civil case, the mind of each juror should be as a sheet of white paper or clean slate, without any presumption for or against either party. But in a criminal case, such as this, it is the duty of the jury to presume the defendant to be innocent until he is proven by the evidence to be guilty. In civil cases, when a party has made out his case by a preponderance of all the evidence in the case, or by the weight of the evidence, as it is sometimes termed, he is entitled to a verdict in his favor. But in criminal cases, the state is not entitled to a verdict of guilty upon a mere preponderance of evidence, but to warrant a conviction, the evidence must establish the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. Applying these rules to the case in hand, it becomes your duty upon taking your seats as jurors to presume that the prisoner at the bar was innocent of the crime charged against him in this prosecution, and this presumption of innocence you are to adhere to and entertain until it should be overcome or rebutted by evidence tending to prove guilt. And so long as there is reasonable doubt of guilt in your minds, you are to give him the benefit of that doubt. The doubt, however, which should work an acquittal of the defendant should be a reasonable, actual, and substantial one, not a merely speculative or possible doubt for which no reason can be assigned. If, after you have carefully and impartially weighed and considered all the evidence and all the circumstances of the case, as they have been given in evidence, you do not feel an abiding conviction, a moral assurance of the prisoner's guilt, your verdict should be not guilty. But upon the other hand, if you are assured from the evidence that the defendant is guilty as charged in the indictment, or that he is guilty of murder in the second degree, or of manslaughter, no sentiment of tenderness or sympathy with the defendant should prevent you from rendering a verdict in strict accordance with your honest convictions and judgment in the premises. 
Under this indictment, the defendant may, upon proper evidence, be convicted of either murder in the first degree, murder in the second degree, or of manslaughter, as the charge for the higher or greater crime embraces charges for both the lower or minor grades of homicide. The better to apprehend the sense and meaning of either of these crimes, it will be well to give your attention to a brief analysis of each. The first section of the Crimes Act defines the crime of murder in the first degree as follows, quote, If any person shall purposely and of deliberate and premeditated malice, or in the perpetration or attempt to perpetrate any rape, arson, robbery, or burglary, or by administering poison or causing the same to be done, kill another, every such person shall be deemed guilty of murder in the first degree, and upon conviction thereof shall suffer death." End quote. The second section defining the crime of murder in the second degree provides, quote, that if any person shall purposely and maliciously but without deliberation and premeditation kill another, every such person shall be deemed guilty of murder in the second degree, and upon conviction thereof shall be imprisoned in the penitentiary and kept at hard labor during life. End quote. The third section defining manslaughter provides, quote, that if any person shall unlawfully kill another without malice, either upon a sudden quarrel or unintentionally while the allayer is in the commission of some unlawful act, every such person shall be deemed guilty of manslaughter, and upon conviction thereof shall be imprisoned in the penitentiary and kept at hard labor not more than ten years, nor less than one year. End quote. Murder in the first degree under our statute embraces two classes of cases. First, killing purposely and of deliberate and premeditated malice. Second, killing purposely in the perpetration or attempt to perpetrate a rape, arson, robbery, or burglary, or by administering poison or causing the same to be done. As it is not claimed in this case that the prisoner was perpetrating or attempting to perpetrate either of the crimes named in the second class of cases mentioned in the statute, it is not necessary to ask your attention further to this class of cases. The ingredients of the crime of murder in the first degree in the class of cases with which we have to do are, first, the killing of one human being by another, second, the purpose or intention to kill, third, that the killing be done of deliberate and premeditated malice. Murder in the second degree is when one person kills another purposely and maliciously, but without deliberation and premeditation. Manslaughter is the intentional killing of another without malice upon a sudden quarrel, or the unintentional killing of another while the slayer is in the commission of some unlawful act. The first subject for investigation in prosecution for murder or manslaughter usually is whether one person has been killed by another, but in this case it is admitted that Tamsin Parsons was killed by the prisoner at the bar on the ninth day of August last. This being admitted, you will proceed to the consideration of the circumstances preceding and attending the homicide and determine from them whether the defendant is guilty of any crime and, if of any, of what crime he is guilty. Intention You have seen from the reading of the statute that to justify a conviction for murder in the first degree, you must find from the evidence that the prisoner intended to kill the deceased, Tams and Parsons, and to justify a conviction of murder in the second degree, you must be satisfied from the evidence that he intended to kill some human being and did in fact kill Tams and Parsons. The purpose or intention to kill can only be directly shown by the declarations of the prisoner previous to or at the time of the act or by his subsequent confessions. But whilst this is the direct means of proof, it is not by any means the only evidence by which the intention or purpose to kill can be proven. The manner and purpose of the killing may afford as satisfactory and conclusive evidence of a purpose to kill as the voluntary confession of the party. If a rational person voluntarily shoots through the brain or heart, or other vital part with a pistol, musket, or rifle ball, or stabs another with a sword or dagger in a vital place, or cleaves the skull with an axe or heavy iron bar, it is almost impossible to avoid the conviction that the perpetrator of such an act of deadly violence intended to kill. The relation between such acts and the intention or motive which prompt them is well recognized, and the law implies or presumes the purpose from the act. In the language of the books, the law presumes that every man intends the natural and probable consequences of his own voluntary acts. And this legal presumption but expresses the sense and judgment of every intelligent mind. 
If, therefore, you should find from the evidence in this case that the prisoner at the bar voluntarily used such a kind and degree of violence towards Tamsin Parsons as would necessarily or in the all probability result in her death, you will be justified in presuming and finding by your verdict that he intended to kill her. You will take into consideration all the facts and circumstances of the case which go to show the intention or purpose of the defendant in doing the act which resulted in the death of Tamsin Parsons at the time and place charged, and if in your judgment they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant then and there intended to kill her, the state has made out this element of the crime of murder in either the first or second degree. But if the intention to kill is not proved, the prisoner is entitled to a verdict of not guilty. In order to constitute a homicide or the killing of one human being by another, murder in the first degree in this case of classes, there must not only be clear and satisfactory proof of an intentional killing, but the evidence must show that it was done of deliberate and premeditated malice. Deliberation and premeditation are acts of the mind requiring the exercise of reason, reflection, judgment, and decision, and these cannot exist in any case where the faculties of the mind are deranged or destroyed to such an extent as to deprive the party of his free agency and render him incapable of understanding the nature and consequences of the act he was doing or about to do or of discriminating between right and wrong. Although deliberation and premeditation are necessary ingredients in the crime of murder in the first degree, it is not necessary that it should have been meditated and deliberated on for any particular length of time. It is sufficient if the intention or purpose to commit the crime has been distinctly formed in the mind before its execution, and it is immaterial as to the length of time which transpires between the forming of the design or purpose and its execution. A moment's reflection upon it and entertaining the purpose, intention, for any perceptible period of time is all the deliberation and premeditation which the law requires. The mind must conceive the design to kill, reason must perceive the nature of consequences of the act, and judgment elect to do it. When all these concur, they constitute all the deliberation and premeditation requisite to make a killing murder in the first degree. To constitute homicide or killing murder in the first degree, there must be an intentional killing with deliberation and premeditated malice. The distinction made by our statute between murder in the first and second degree is this. In murder in the first degree, the killing must be done purposely and of deliberate and premeditated malice. In murder in the second degree, the killing must be done purposely and maliciously, but without deliberation and premeditation. In murder of the first degree, the malice goes before or precedes the act of killing, whilst to constitute murder in the second degree, the malice goes with or accompanies the act of killing. We will now ask your attention to the technical meaning of the term malice as used in the statutory definition of murder. As used here, malice includes not only hatred, ill will, and revenge, but every other unlawful and unjustifiable motive. It is not confined to ill will towards any one or more individuals, but it is evidenced by an action proceeding from a wicked and corrupt motive. To justify a conviction for murder, it is not necessary to show that the slayer entertained a malicious sentiment, or spite and ill will especially towards the person slain, but it is sufficient if the evidence proves a general malignity, a depraved inclination to dangerous and deadly mischief, fall where it may, or a reckless disregard of the lives and safety of others. In the language of another, it means that general malignity, that disregard of the lives and safety of others, which proceeds from a heart void of a just sense of social duty, and fatally bent on mischief. This legal malice may be promoted as well by motives of avarice, bigotry, or jealousy, as by hatred, revenge, or cruelty. If one human being voluntarily and unlawfully takes the life of another from any unlawful and improper motive, it is done in legal contemplation maliciously. Malice may also be expressed or implied. Express malice is where one person kills another with a sedate, deliberate mind and formed design, which formed design is usually evidenced by external circumstances, discovering or indicating that inward purpose. This kind of malice is usually shown by lying in wait, antecedent threats or menaces, evidence of formed grudges, concocting schemes or providing means or weapons to compass the death of the party slain, seeking one with a view to kill him, or by an unusual degree of cruelty, deliberation, and precision attending the act of killing. 
This is the kind or degree of malice which must be proven to make the case of murder in the first degree. Implied or constructive malice is where there have been no previous threats, menaces, or preparation, but where there are such circumstances attending the act of killing as are the ordinary indications of a wicked, malicious, and bloodthirsty spirit, as when one person kills another suddenly, without provocation or without any considerable provocation, or when a person in a sudden affray without necessity makes use of a deadly weapon and kills an adversary therewith from the proof of such circumstances, the law implies that kind of malice which is a necessary ingredient in the crime of murder in the second degree. When malice is once shown to exist toward the person killed, it is presumed to have continued down to the perpetration of the mediated act, unless there is evidence or some circumstance in the case repelling or overcoming such presumption. Evidence tending to prove that the prisoner and Tamsin Parsons were found together in Pittsburgh, and of the statements and conduct of the prisoner whilst there, has been given by the prosecution, and also evidence of the arrest of the defendant in this city for some alleged offense or some indignity to her family after his return to this city. But gentlemen, this evidence was not admitted as tending to prove the defendant guilty of bigamy, forgery, adultery, assault and battery, or immorality, and you have no right to entertain it or consider it for any such purpose, nor should it in the least affect the general character of the defendant in your deliberations, serving and accepting so much of it as was called out by the state in cross-examination of witnesses who were called in behalf of the prisoner to testify to his character as a peaceable, law-abiding citizen. That evidence was permitted to be given for the sole purpose of enabling you to judge the relationship between the prisoner and Tams and Parsons, that you may the better understand their relations to each other and the history of their intimacy, and as affording you the means to judge of the intentions, motives, and sentiments of the defendant toward her as affecting his guilt or innocence of the crime charged against him in this indictment, and you are not at liberty to use it for any other conceivable purpose. The defense of insanity is interposed in behalf of the prisoner, and if in this defense is clearly made out to the satisfactory of the jury, by the weight of the evidence, or, in other words, by a preponderance of the evidence in the case, it is a perfect bar to a conviction for any crime, whatever under this indictment. But in reference to this defense, it is met upon the threshold with a legal presumption that the accused is of sound mind, that his mind is not so diseased or alienated as to exonerate him from punishment for the commission of a criminal act. This legal presumption of sanity you are not at liberty to disregard, it is essential to justice and to the safety of society that you should entertain this presumption of sanity and set upon it until you become satisfied from the testimony and circumstances of the case that the defendant was of unsound mind at the time of the killing and therefore not responsible for his conduct. It is not necessary, however, that insanity be established beyond a reasonable doubt. It is sufficient if it is shown by clear and satisfactory evidence by a preponderance of the proof that he was in fact insane at the time of the commission of the act. But it is not sufficient to show that possibly the prisoner's mind was so far diseased or alienated as to render him incapable of committing crime. Nor is it sufficient if the evidence merely shows that it is probable that his mind was in such a condition, but to make evidence of insanity available as a defense. It must be such as to reasonably satisfy your minds that the defendant was, in fact, insane at the time of the commission of the act. Nevertheless, evidence of drunkenness, anger, jealousy, morbid conditions, and nervous excitement is admissible as affecting the question of intention, deliberation, and premeditation. For the purpose of proving the condition of the defendant's mind at the time of the commission of the act, it is competent for the prisoner to call witnesses who are familiar with his peculiar mental characteristics under the influence of intoxication, and also to call physicians and others whose professions and associations in life are such as to have made them familiar with the faculties and operations of his mind, and these persons may testify to matters of opinion or science in reference to the probable condition of his mind at the time of the commission of the act. Such testimony is legitimate, and when used for its true and proper purpose, that of affording you assistance in determining the condition of the prisoner's mind, it may be of the first importance. But after all, much of it is frequently merely a matter of opinion, and should be received and acted upon by a jury with great caution, 
and should there be a great conflict or manifest an irreconcilable inconsistency in their testimony, or if in your judgment it is not sustained by reason and facts, you are not bound to adopt their opinions. You are not to be intimidated by your homage and respect for the learning and intelligence of professional witnesses from determining the question of sanity and drunkenness for yourselves, as well as every other question of the fact in the case. The question of sanity or insanity is for you and you only to determine, and the fact that scientific men may regard the accused as sane or insane, drunk or morbid, does not relieve you of the responsibility of deciding for yourselves. It is both your right and duty to hear the evidence, to consider it carefully, and to give it all the credence and influence it may seem to deserve, but the question, after all, is left to your own good sense and judgment, and you are to determine it according to the preponderance of all the evidence and circumstances of the case. This leads to the consideration of the degree or species of insanity or mental misrule and alienation, which absolves a party from legal suit and punishment for crime. The rule of law, as I understand it to be on this subject, is this, that a man is not entitled to an acquittal on the ground of insanity if at the time of the alleged offense he had capacity and reason sufficient to enable him to distinguish between right and wrong in reference to the particular act he is doing or is about to do, and understands the act and his relation to the party injured. If he has not a knowledge or consciousness that the act he is doing is contrary to the dictates of justice and right, injurious to others and in violation of the dictates of duty, he is not amenable to punishment for his act. But although his mind may be morbid and laboring under partial insanity, still, if he understands the nature and character of his act and its consequence, and that it is wrong and criminal for him to do it, such partial insanity is not sufficient to exempt him from responsibility. If it is proved to your satisfaction that the defendant's mind was in a diseased and unsound state, and that for the time being his mental disease was such, that in reference to this mental act it overwhelmed his reason, conscience, and judgment, and that in committing it he acted from an irresistible and uncontrollable impulse, and not as a voluntary agent, he was not answerable to the law and should be acquitted. With reference to insanity from drunkenness, the law discriminates between criminal acts which are the immediate results of a fit of drunkenness, and which are committed while the party is yet intoxicated, and such acts are the result of a settled, permanent, or intermittent insanity, which has been remotely produced by previous habits of intertemperance. When the mind has become diseased by a habit of intemperance and is so far alienated as to be unstable to discriminate between right and wrong, and to comprehend the nature and consequences of a criminal act, the party is no more amenable to the penalty of the law than if his insanity were the act of God. And so it is if the act was committed during an attack of the delirium tremens, which rendered him insane for the time being, and which delirium was the result of a previous habit of intemperance, or of long-continued drunkenness. But when the crime is committed by a drunken man whilst intoxicated under the influence of drunken frenzy or madness, and who is not insane when sober, his drunkenness and the temporary insanity or madness produced by it is no excuse or palation whatever. The law will not permit him to screen himself from punishment for his criminal acts by proving his own gross vice and misconduct. A settled, fixed insanity, however caused, is a good defense. Drunkenness is no excuse whatever. The frenzy, passion, and madness of voluntary drunkenness is not that species of insanity which excuses crime. But that settled insanity or delirium, which is caused by previous habits of intemperance or long-continued drunkenness, is a good defense, notwithstanding the fact that the party have lucid intervals. But if the act were committed during a sane or lucid interval, the fact that a party is subject to intermittent insanity is no excuse. One reason for this discrimination is that men voluntarily get drunk and sometimes for the very purpose of bracing their nerves and inflaming their passions to the commission of crimes which they have mediated when sober, but which they then lack the nerve, courage, or disposition to perpetrate. But no man voluntarily becomes permanently insane, or seeks to bring on a fit of delirium tremens, and if it even were done for the sole purpose of committing violence upon another, the delirium would be more likely to defeat than to accomplish such purpose. But if a person were made drunk by the machinations of others, 
without any intention or fault upon his part, and should injure or kill another during the fit of intoxication, and whilst his mind was so disordered as to be unable to comprehend the nature of his act, or to distinguish between right and wrong, he would not be amenable to punishment. It is also competent for the defense to prove that the prisoner was drunk at the time of the killing, as leading to show whether the act was done with deliberation and premeditation. But if the evidence shows that the purpose to kill was formed before he became drunk, or if he got drunk to brace his nerves and harden his mind for the act of killing, then, however delirious he may have been at the time of the act, it can avail him nothing by way of defense or mitigation, and the drunkenness would not reduce the offense to murder in the second degree. Let me illustrate the idea I wish to convey by showing the application of this principle to another class of cases. A person charged with passing counterfeit banknotes cannot palate or excuse his crime by showing that he was drunk at the time of passing them. But inasmuch as a knowledge of the base and counterfeit character of the bills passed is a necessary ingredient of the crime of uttering and publishing counterfeit bank bills, he may prove that he was drunk as tending to show that he did not possess this guilty knowledge of their true character. As it requires some degree of skill and judgment to determine whether a bill is genuine or counterfeit, and as experience teaches that one whose senses are steeped in intoxicating liquors is not so capable of exercising the skill and judgment as the same person would be when sober, it is proper that his condition as to his intoxication should be shown that the jury may be better able to judge of his capacity to distinguish the true character of the bills he had passed. So in this case, if the prisoner is guilty of murder in either degree, drunkenness is no excuse or mitigation of the crime, but evidence of his condition as to intoxication is received as tending to show of what crime he is guilty. In all cases, where it becomes material to know, as it does in this case, whether the act of killing was done of deliberate and premeditated malice, which constitutes murder in the first degree, or whether it was done maliciously but without deliberation and premeditation, making it murder in the first degree, the fact of drunkenness may be proved. The experience of mankind proves that as a general rule a drunken man acts with less judgment and circumspection, and more from sudden impulse and passion than he would when sober, and as deliberation and premeditation are acts of the mind requiring some degree of sedateness and reflection, it is competent for the defendant to show what was his condition as to intoxication, as tending to prove that at the time of the commission of the act he was incapable of deliberation and premeditation, or if he was capable of them, that in consequence of drunkenness he was less likely to have meditated and deliberated upon the act than he would have been if sober. But if you should find from the evidence in the case that the defendant mediated the act when sober, that he prepared means and sought opportunities for its commission, that he determined that in case he should not be able to induce her to live with him or submit herself to his pleasure, he would take her life and that he finally killed her in pursuance of that purpose, such killing would be murder in the first degree, however insane or frenzied he may have been at the time from drunkenness. In passing upon the subject of deliberation and premeditation, you should carefully consider the means and the manner of the killing, the demeanor and conduct of the defendant at the time, and immediately subsequent to the act, as well as that tending to show his condition before the act. The defendant has offered evidence tending to show insanity in one or more of his lineal ancestors, and that his own mind has been frequently affected in a singular and extraordinary manner as a consequence of intertemperance. Upon this subject, you have as well the evidence of witnesses here in court as the statements of the defendant as set forth in the affidavit made for the continuance of the case, which are to be received and treated by you in all respects as if doctors Patterson and Kemble had appeared in open court and testified to those statements before you, that while his gait was unaffected and his physical powers apparently unimpaired, his reason was clouded and destroyed to such a degree that it became necessary to put him under restraint to prevent him doing deadly harm to himself and his friends, that such condition was not what is usually known as delirium tremens, but that it was a peculiar temporary condition, which some of the witnesses cannot ascribe wholly to intoxication. This evidence, it is claimed, in connection with evidence tending to prove that the defendant was intoxicated and delirious from anger, jealousy, and disappointment at the time of the commission of the act, exonerates him from responsibility before the law. 
If, gentlemen of the jury, you should find from the evidence that this temporary condition did not in fact exist, but that it was the direct result and effect of voluntary drunkenness, intensified by some peculiar taint or morbid condition of the defendant's mind or temperament, not amounting to insanity or delirium until roused to activity by the excessive use of ardent spirits, and that he knew that intoxication would produce this mental condition, and knowing it became drunk and committed the act under drunken frenzy, such temporary madness is no excuse for the crime, although it may have been aggravated by such peculiarities of temperament and morbid mental condition. But this evidence, like evidence of mere drunkenness, is admissible as affecting the question of intention, deliberation, and premeditation. The law in its humanity makes all proper allowance for the infirmities of our weak human nature, but it cannot and does not bend to suit all the morbid conditions, tempers, and idiosyncrasies of individual citizens. It rather seeks to control our tendencies to evil so that they shall not endanger the peace and safety of society. It is a rule of conduct which we are not at liberty to disregard. In the language of an eminent judge, quote, we are in a court of law, not in a school of science. Our action must therefore be governed by legal adjudication and not by the theories and speculations of the schools, end quote. The state has offered evidence of statements and declarations alleged to have been made by the accused before the death of Tamsin Parsons, as well as the alleged confessions of the prisoner after she was killed. The evidence is competent as tending to prove deliberate and premeditated malice, and tending to rebut the claim of the defense that the prisoner at the bar was incapacitated at the time of the commission of the act to deliberate and meditate upon the deed. But it is my duty to admonish you that evidence of threats or declarations indicating malice and evidence of verbal confessions of guilt are to be received and acted upon with great caution, for, besides the danger of mistake from the misapprehension of witnesses, the misuse of words, the failure of the accused to express his own meaning, and the infirmity of the human memory, it is to be remembered that they are frequently made without reflection, whilst the mind is laboring under depression, agitation, or intoxication. It therefore becomes your duty to scrutinize them closely, examine well the circumstances under which they were uttered, and the appearance, manner, and apparent intelligence, candor, and consistency of the witnesses who testify to them. But if you find in the exercise of such care and scrutiny that declarations or threats indicating malice and a purpose to take life have been deliberately made or confessions of guilt after the act, you should give them all proper weight and influence in your deliberations. For whilst this kind of evidence is to be received with careful scrutiny, it is at the same time recognized as one of the most effectual means of proof known to the criminal law. But the value of such deliberation and confessions depends upon the supposition that they are deliberately and voluntarily made, and upon the presumption that a rational being will not make admissions prejudicial to his interests and safety unless compelled to it by the prompting of truth and conscience. The prisoner is called witnesses for the purpose of proving good character. In this case, it was competent for the defendant to call witnesses to speak of his character as a peaceable, law-abiding citizen. It is sometimes argued that the evidence of good character is only to be considered by the jury in doubtful cases, and that its only office is to resolve doubts in favor of the innocence of the accused. This construction of the law would render such evidence of but little utility in most cases. It is the duty of all criminal courts to charge the jury that the prosecution must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and that if they have a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt, they should resolve such doubt in favor of innocence. So that, in a really doubtful case, the defendant needs no evidence of good character, as he is entitled to a verdict of acquittal without. But in my judgment, the effect of evidence of good character should not be confined to such narrow limits. It is competent to offer for the purpose of rendering the guilt of the accused doubtful under circumstances when it might not be considered doubtful in the absence of such proof. There may be cases in which the evidence of guilt is so conclusive and overwhelming that no evidence of good character can make it doubtful, but there may be other cases in which the evidence given against a person without character would leave a conviction in which the proof of a high and unblemished character might properly produce a reasonable doubt of guilt. The general office of such evidence is to disprove guilt, but it is also admissible in a case of murder to aid the jury in ascertaining the probable grade of the offense to wit, whether the killing constitutes murder in the first or second degree. You will then consider the evidence touching the defendant's character, recall what the witnesses said of it, 
as well as upon cross-examination as upon the examination in chief, and if you are satisfied from it that the defendant had previously and down to the commission of this act been a peaceable, law-abiding man of a mild and pacific character, one not likely to contemplate the commission of murder, it may aid you in determining whether the killing was done of deliberate and premeditated malice, making it murder in the first degree, or whether it was done purposely and maliciously without premeditation and deliberation, making it murder in the second degree, or whether it was committed at a time when the defendant was so insane as to be incapable of comprehending the nature and consequences of his act and not amenable to the penalty of the law. The purpose for which you unpaneled is to ascertain and by your verdict declare the truth in reference to the issue joined between the state of Ohio and the prisoner at the bar. Your verdict is to be made up from the law and evidence as they have been given you here in court. You are to know nothing and care nothing for popular sentiment, prejudice, or clamor if they exist. You are lifted above outside pressure, if any there be, and set apart from it. It must never invade the seats you occupy. They are sacred to truth and justice. This temple is dedicated to justice, and we are unworthy the seats we occupy if we conscientiously permit sympathy, prejudice, or fear of public sentiment to exercise the slightest control over our judgment or conduct. It is proper and right in view of the consequences to the prisoner of a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree that you should most carefully, patiently, and impartially consider the evidence you have heard and see to it that your verdict shall correspond with and be justified by the proofs. But no considerations of mercy and no weak shrinking from responsibility must be permitted to repress or stifle the honest convictions of your judgment. Upon the other hand, no zeal for the public service or the safety or well-being of society should influence you to bring in a verdict of guilty against the defendant of murder in the first degree, unless you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the killing was done by the defendant purposely and as of deliberate and premeditated malice. And so in reference to a conviction of murder in the second degree, you should not consent to a verdict of guilty unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the killing was done purposely and maliciously but without premeditation and deliberation. Nor can you convict of manslaughter until the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt the intentional killing without malice upon a sudden quarrel or that he unintentionally killed her while engaged in the commission of some unlawful act. If you find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, your verdict should be, quote, we find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, end quote. If you should find him guilty of murder in the second degree, your verdict should be, quote, we find him guilty of murder in the second degree only, end quote. If you find him guilty of manslaughter, your verdict should be, quote, we find the defendant guilty of manslaughter only, end quote. If you find him not guilty by reason of a failure of proof on the part of the state, your verdict should be, quote, not guilty, end quote. But if you find the defendant was insane at the time of the commission of the act and acquit him for that reason alone, your verdict should be, quote, we find that the defendant was insane at the time of the commission of the act and therefore find him not guilty, end quote. The verdict and sentence. The jury at once retired and the court adjourned for four hours. At two o'clock, the court resumed its sittings, a great crowd filling the room. The prisoner had been brought in with irons on his wrists. At three o'clock, the jury was let in by the sheriff and the roll was called. Judge Coffinberry, gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon your verdict? The foreman, we have. Judge Coffinberry, what verdict do you return? The foreman, guilty of murder in the first degree. Mr. Castle made a motion for a new trial, which was filed and afterwards overruled. End of section 68. Section 69 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claire. American State Trials, Volume 2 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Dr. John W. Hughes for the Murder of Tamsin Parsons, Cleveland, Ohio, 1865, Part 6. December 30th. The announcement that Dr. Hughes would be sentenced today drew an immense crowd to the courtroom. Long before the hour named the spacious room was densely packed. The spectators clambered on the backs of seats and on windows to gain a view of the proceedings. 
A few minutes before nine o'clock, the prisoner was brought into court. He looked well, was dressed neatly, and presented a very gentlemanly appearance. His manner was cool, collected, and deliberate. His overcoat and the manacles having been removed, he stood several moments conversing with his counsel. At nine o'clock, Judge Coffinberry commanded the sheriff to open court. The prisoner was conducted to a chair near the sheriff's stand and sat down among his counsel. Prosecuting Attorney Palmer moved the court that the sentence of the law be pronounced in the case of the State of Ohio against John W. Hughes. The court asked counsel for the defendant if there were any objections. Mr. Castle, none, Your Honor. Judge Coffinberry, John W. Hughes, have you anything to say why the sentence of the law should not be passed against you? The prisoner said he would like to make a statement and to read the following paper. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen, I have no reason to give against the sentence of the extreme penalty of the law being passed upon me. For though it chills my life's blood to anticipate the fearful movements of such an ignominious execution, yet when I recall the overwhelming testimony of my folly, the powerful evidence of my crime, with a consciousness of my guilt which has accumulated in weightiest cremation during the trying ordeal of my trial, sober, sensible, and truthful as I am now, I must admit the verdict of the jury, just, the sentence of the law, inevitable. To your honor, I offer most sincere thanks for the true magnanimity you have evinced in procuring me counsel, and for the unbiased deliberation and attention you have devoted to the trying requirements of such a long and tedious investigation as mine has been. And I wish you at your earliest convenience to assure the gentlemen of the jury, who so earnestly and faithfully sat day after day to listen and deliberate over the fearful amount of testimony and protracted arguments brought before them, that instead, as some may suppose, I have prejudiced myself against them. I respect them for their impartiality and honor them for the faithfulness with which they have done their duty. Sheriff Nicola is a man of tender feelings, yet very strict in the discharge of his duty. While furthering the ends of justice, he does not forget the requirements of the prisoner. Impartial, just, not tyrannical, he tempers his authority with mercy. His gentlemanly demeanor gains him the deserved respect of all. I am much indebted to him for the kindness, courtesy, and forbearance which he has shown me during my incarceration. To Mr. Palmer and Mr. Slade, who have prosecuted the case with such earnestness, I must say, that while I admire the ability and talent with which they have portrayed the thrilling incidents of the fearful drama, I cannot but acknowledge that they also have done the duty which an incensed community required of them. To Mr. Castle and Mr. Knight, who have so ably defended me, I must now publicly tender the heartfelt acknowledgments of unbounded gratitude for the untiring zeal with which they exerted themselves day and night for weeks to search out every mitigation for my crime and for the touching eloquence with which they brought the resources of their acknowledged talent, learning, and ability to bear in every conceivable form, to rebut if possible the crushing weight of the prosecution they contended with, and if possible, to avert the awful fate which now awaits me. And Mr. Karish, I cannot find expression to justify your claims on my gratitude. While those I thought to be my friends joined in the well-deserved denunciations, wildly and madly thrown on me, the perpetrator of such an outrage, even then you did not forsake me, for you know my failings. In this, as in all my troubles, you have been my truest friend, you know my domestic difficulties, you advised me. Oh, that I had but heeded your counsel, this fearful fate would never have befallen me. If the ties of nearest kindred bound us, you could have done no more. You have indeed been a faithful brother. May God bless you. If I am permitted, I wish to give a brief sketch of the unhappy circumstances of my past life since the time an unfortunate matrimonial alliance caused me to seek relief in visiting foreign lands and finally drove me to enlist in the army. While in the army, I passed through the various positions from a private up to orderly sergeant, and then, having passed an examination, I received a commission as surgeon. I returned to my home after a long absence, expecting to find a welcome and a happy home. But such a sense as met me there was enough to drive the most callous person in the world to forsake such a home. I rushed from the house and formed a determination never to return. I knew not which way I was going. I drove out to the country. I attended a party, and while there, someone told me that Harry Parsons, a cousin of Tamsin Parsons, was present and very anxious to see me. I had been drinking very heavily that day. I drove to Mr. Parsons' house that night, but what occurred there I do not know. I awoke in the morning filled with shame and remorse, for I was awakened by a tender hand. I asked, Who are you? And she told me it was Tamsin. She said, Doctor, why do you drink so? I saw in that look sympathy and pity that filled my whole soul, and I saw my feeling was reciprocated. 
While in that condition, a wild, mad love took possession of me, such an one as I had never experienced before, an illicit love, one which led to an illicit intercourse, and which love I have until this day cherished. But it was not all passion. Love destroys all baser passion. I went to Pittsburgh, and the next day Tamsin asked me to marry her, and insane as I was, I did so. I went to the mayor of the city, and the principal minister of the city married us, and it was my intention to seek some retired spot and settle down and live in quiet. And the next day, when I was making arrangements to find a place to reside, I was arrested and brought before the mayor on a charge of bigamy. I made an offer to Mr. Haynes, which, had he accepted it, it would have prevented all exposure and the unfortunate events that have since happened. But Mr. Haynes, for some reason, which he best knows, refused. Whether it was from a virtuous determination to vindicate the character of his family, I do not know. I was tried. I did not bring one word of testimony for my defense in that trial. I was brought in guilty of adultery and bigamy. Immediately after my trial, Tamsin came to the jail, and there occurred a scene I shall never forget. But I parted with her forever, and then I supposed. After she left, I wrote her a letter explaining the whole matter and told her it was best that we should not meet again. Meanwhile, I was kept in jail till March, having been sentenced for a year. Meanwhile, a reconciliation had taken place between me and my wife, and I was pardoned. I returned to this city and opened an office on Ontario Street. My former patrons returned to me. I was doing well. I practiced faithfully, and during my practice, I have never betrayed the confidence of my profession. My means were so limited I could not furnish a home, and I obtained a little furniture and fitted up a suite of rooms. In the midst of these preparations, I received information that my wife's passage had been paid to return to the Isle of Man. It has been said that I sent her, but I did not. I thought of returning with her. However, I had not the means necessary and concluded I would not go with her. My wife left, and in all this there was no thought of Tams and Parsons till nearly a week after my wife had gone. Then I received a letter from Tamsin, reproaching me for my neglect of her and asking me to come and see her since there was now no obstacle in the way. While considering the matter, I received another letter from Tamsin. I still fought against it. Then at that instant, an individual of my acquaintance came in to see me. It was Mr. Campbell, who had been an old companion of mine in the Crimean War. He asked me to take a drink with him, and I indulged in that vice, which has been my ruin. In the morning I went with him to Newburgh, and while there we drank heavily. The events of the night of July 24th, when I entered Mr. Parsons' house, have been fully revealed. But Tamsin Parsons never said to me she did not want anything to do with me, that I, quote, had deceived her once and should never do it again, end quote. On the contrary, she said that she would go with me to the end of the world. It was just after this interview that I met Dr. Ray and had some conversation with him, and I might have made some such assertion as he testified that I made. But if I said it, it was only a ruse. The next day I went to the Plank Road house, and what happened there, or what I said, I don't know. I returned to the city on the following day and was arrested for an assault and battery by Tamsin's father. It was not till I saw Tamsin and talked over the circumstances with her that I thought she had been playing false with me, and the next day Mr. Parsons, the druggist, went with me and we settled the matter up. The next night was a restless one for me. I had been drinking a good deal, and what dreadful determination might have entered my mind I do not know. In the joy I felt because a settlement had been effected, I might have made such threats as I am said to have made, but I came to the city fully determined never again to have anything to do with Tams and Parsons. I devoted myself to my business. On the evening of the 8th of August, having been busily employed in my office all day, and being very tired, I met my friend Russell in a saloon and we drank several times when I proposed to go home. On account of some quarrel, he said he would not go home, and he proposed to go to another saloon and drink, and we went from place to place and drank, and I became very much intoxicated, and Russell proposed a ride to Rocky River. Went around town on a very unholy mission and visited many places, but did not succeed in getting any companion, and on going to my room, Russell asked to see my pistol, but there was no thought at that time of going to Bedford, nor any thought of the murder of any human being. It was not till we went to Newburgh that any thought entered my mind of Bedford. Nor then did I think of such a dreadful tragedy as this would occur. We went to Bedford, and in the morning I wished to return home, but Russell then taunted me bitterly about the girl, and I told the driver to take the right-hand road, and I went to Mrs. Parsons' house, but did not find the family at home. After leaving the house, we met Tamsin with her mother on the road. The old lady was very angry, but Tamsin never uttered an unkind word. We were both very drunk from the effects of ale and whiskey, and we became mad and reckless. 
We returned to go to the 12-mile lock in Rocky River, and on the way, Mrs. Crum rushed out of the house and told us Tamsin Parsons had gone to town to have me arrested. Arrived at the village, the old man Parsons happened to pass with the wagon, and I got out of the carriage to speak with him. And at that moment, Tamsin came toward the carriage, and I rushed after her and asked where she was going. I don't know what reply she made. It has been said here that I went there with the intention of committing the dreadful deed, but that is not true. From the moment she passed the carriage, I do not remember the particulars of that dreadful tragedy. It must have been a legion of devils had taken hold of me, for it is contrary to my nature to be cruel. There never was in all my life a feeling of revenge to take the life of any person." From that moment, I don't know what occurred till I found myself in jail. When I learned what I had done, if ever a man felt the torments of hell, I did. For two or three weeks, and while the effects of intoxication were passing off, when I think what I suffered, I wonder I have any reason left. It was then, when I thought there was neither hope in heaven or on earth for me, I threw my all upon my Maker. And it was then that I received assurance that to all such sinners as I had been, there was mercy. Earnestly, I struggled, and I received that assurance. It has been said that I am a man of iron, but that power of self-command has been given me from some greater source than I have within me. I am resigned. I have reviewed the whole matter, and I know that I deserve death, but I never deliberated or premeditated the murder of Tams and Parsons. Poor girl. My worst fault was I loved her too well. But I must admit, I deserve it. I hope that this may be an example to all to keep free from the terrible vice the curse that has ruined the families and destroyed the hearts of millions. I hope indeed that the example may be a lasting one. I feel prepared. Sometimes an hour comes when I remember and think of the old churchyard at home and its long range of tombstones where my ancestors sleep. When I think of the annals of my little native island, there are many recollections of the good services of my kindred. When I think of these things, I sometimes think I would wish to be saved from this fearful disgrace, and my poor boy, this is an awful legacy to leave him, an awful legacy. For that reason, and for that reason only, I would wish this cup might pass. But God's will be done, I am resigned. Judge Coffinberry, John W. Hughes, you stand convicted of the willful, deliberate, and premeditated murder of Tams and Parsons in the village of Bedford on the ninth day of August last. You were tried by an honest jury and defended by the ablest counsel whose services could be procured for you by the court. Your counsel labored faithfully in your behalf, literally exhausting themselves in the effort to secure your acquittal, or to reduce your offense to murder in the second degree. But your conduct was indefensible. Your case was utterly hopeless. The evidences of deliberate and premeditated malice were such as to close every avenue of escape from a conviction for murder in the first degree. Your counsel labored without hope, and although many pity you, your best friends must acknowledge the righteousness of that verdict which condemned you to expiate your fearful crime upon the scaffold. I would not discourage any effort your friends may make to secure a commutation of your sentence, but in view of its apparent hopelessness, I do most earnestly entreat you to make your peace with God. It is the sentence of the law that you, John W. Hughes, be taken from the bar of this court to the jail of Cuyahoga County, that you be there safely kept until the time of execution, and that on the ninth day of February in the year of our Lord 1,866, between the hours of ten o'clock of the forenoon and two o'clock of the afternoon, of said ninth day of February, you be, by the sheriff of Cuyahoga County, hanged by the neck until you are dead. The Execution a petition was afterwards presented to Governor Cox asking that the sentence be commuted to life imprisonment on the grounds of the strong evidence of insanity presented at the trial, and that the prisoner had served the county faithfully as surgeon in the Civil War. But the governor refused to interfere. Hughes passed the time in prison reading religious books, writing verses and letters, and receiving the calls of friends. He conducted himself with such perfect propriety in jail that he received many privileges which he could not otherwise have enjoyed. He frequently addressed his fellow prisoners, and they all held him in the highest respect. A few days before the day set for his execution, he swallowed a dose of morphine, which had been smuggled into him by some of his friends. It was, however, an overdose. A fit of violent vomiting was induced by which the drug was expelled. His wrists were then manacled and his arms tied behind him as a preventative of further self-destruction. On February 9th, at half-past twelve, he was led to the scaffold by Sheriff Nicola and his deputies, and attended by the Reverend J. A. Thome, when he made the following speech to the spectators. 
My friends, this is indeed a sad fate. I would wish you to remember it not as an example, but as the acme of human justice. Do you suppose that I think for a moment that the law of man is just in taking my life? No. Men's law is but the law of a murderer like me, who made that law Moses. And who was he? The greatest murderer we ever heard of. Look in the second chapter of Numbers, and you will find some examples of murderers with premeditation and purpose and deliberation in Moses taking the life of an Egyptian, and then he comes and proclaims himself a priest, prophet, and king, and by his law I suffer, and every other murderer. I would admit that life is dear to all, and ought to be protected, but if a man takes the life of another, it is the greatest madness to retaliate upon him in this manner. If the people of Bedford had taken my life at the time I committed that deed, I would have said that it is nature's law and comes from the heart, but when after six months of preparation and deliberation over the matter by those in official position, I say then they murder, they murder, gentlemen. What is the advantage to society to take my life, or any man's, in comparison to employing him for the rest of his days in some useful employment? And if J.W. Hughes has any ability for anything, then keep him in confinement and employ him in useful labor, and make a good man of him, and turn him out a reformed man, and give him an opportunity to atone for all the evil he may have done society. This death penalty is ridiculous, and if you will consider over it, you would find it is wrong. One life is as good as another. What advantage is it to take my life? None. It is not an example to deter others from crime. Did I remember this in that wild fit of drunkenness? Did I remember pointing that pistol? No, I don't remember it this hour. Yet it is the law, and we must abide by it, the law of man, but not of God. I am convinced of it. For six months I have had every sect of religion to visit me, and they came in to tell me which is the way to heaven. Do I believe them? No. What is man's way to heaven? The same is his way on earth. Do unto others as we wish to be done to. I have thought it all over fully and conscientiously, and have come to the conclusion that my life in another world will be the same as in this with the exception that their all will be pure. I have considered this over for six months and intended to give my own life up to my exit out of this world. I intended to take my own life, but did not succeed. I took enough to take me out of the world, but it is the great spirit's will that I should not, and I have not done it. Turning to the sheriff. My brother. Gentlemen, this man has treated me like a brother from the first to the last, and Mr. Thome, my spiritual adviser, is my dearest friend. I respect him as my father. I never had a father. Gentlemen, I never knew what a father was. He is my father, and I love him as a father, and feel my whole heart born up to him as a father. And if I could, I would thank him for all his principles and doctrines. But his are not my ideas. Since I have been in this prison, I have had every sect of religion visit me. You cannot tell me of one that I have not had to talk to me. I argued with them all on their opinions and learned all the secrets of their hearts on the matters of salvation, and dare I deny them? No. I have talked with my spiritual adviser not because I believe as he does. I love him as a father, but at the same time my mind is not his mind. I don't believe today, God forgive me if I say anything wrong, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. My anatomical knowledge and everything says that the Immaculate Conception is not right. It is against nature and philosophy. It is against human nature. I believe that no purer spirit, no better man, ever lived on earth than Jesus Christ, and that in the spirit world he is next to the great creator himself, as far as we know. At the same time, I will tell my experience, tell what I know in my own soul. I know from experience that there is communication with those who have departed from this life. I am today about to suffer the extreme penalty of the law, but at the same time am sure I shall be with you after the execution as I am now. I don't believe in spiritualism particularly because I have never seen any mediums, nor have I ever seen the indications of this. At the same time, every creature, I don't care who he is, will know that at some time in his life he has been influenced by some peculiar idea or sentiment he never would have thought of himself. So far as I know, I believe the doctrines of spiritualism. I thank my spiritual adviser who has spoken to me in relation to heaven and the sufferings of Jesus Christ, and I believe in him as a mediator, but I don't believe in his miraculous birth. I believe in him as being the purest man, the purest spirit that ever ascended on high, and I have taken the advice and counsel of Mr. Thome as a friend and father. He came here in a moral way to reform everyone, and he laid such a foundation in my name that I have finally taken the belief I now have given. 
If I thought for a moment that I was going to brimstone and hell and that kind of thing for eternity, I should fear, or did I think I was going to heaven and sit there for all eternity and do nothing but sing, I should be a fool. They can kill this body, but they cannot kill this soul. This soul soars aloft to the great being that gave it being. It has its work to do, and I believe this moment that I shall be as much here after this execution as now before it, I believe I am here. I will say, just in conclusion, the sheriff has been a brother to me. The jailer, Mr. Smith, has been a father to me. If I were his own son, he could not have done more than he has done for me. God bless him. Goodbye, Mr. Smith. He commenced his speech at 1245 and closed at 1 o'clock. The sheriff then informed him that it was his painful duty to inflict on him the extreme penalty of the law. Deputy Sheriff Ridgway fastened the irons on his wrists and, with the aid of the turnkeys, pinioned his elbows and knees. Hughes tore off his collar and coat and tossed them below with a smile. During the proceeding, he said to the spectators, "'Goodbye,' and again he exclaimed, "'O grave, where is thy victory? And, O death, where is thy sting?' Before the rope was adjusted, he called, "'Mr. Carouche, good-bye.' The rope was then put around his neck and the black cap drawn over his face. The sheriff touched the arm of the lever, and the trap instantly fell at seven minutes past one o'clock. The neck was instantaneously broken. There was no indication of pain and not a perceptible tremor. The body swayed to and fro and did not come to rest until the pulse had ceased to throb. Footnote. The following farewell letter to his wife and child was written a few days before his execution. County Jail, Cleveland, Ohio, USA, February 5, 1866. My dearest wife and son, I have received yours of the 4th of January, and as my time is drawing to a close, I must be brief. I have already sent you the whole particulars of my trial. By all accounts, there never was a trial in this section of the country that created so much excitement and interest as my unfortunate one did. The whole community was moved. Crowds attended the whole proceedings. And indeed, it required, as the papers called me, a man of iron to bear the staring of the crowd, the self-debasing evidence of my own folly and crime, day after day. But enough. I am thankful I did behave as ably as any man ever did under such fearful circumstances. I was found guilty and must give my life as the penalty. Since the sentence, there has been a total change of feeling, all in my favor. The trial showed the whole matter, as criminal as it was, in some degree palliating, so that public sympathy was directed to save instead of take my life. Judge Ranny and Mr. Carouche drew up a petition founded on fact in reference to surroundings, influences, etc., which propelled the insane act. Applications were immediately made by Professor Thayer, Mr. Black, his son Willie, Russell, Mrs. Dr. Hallowell, Mrs. Colonel Crane, and 15 others for copies in about 10 days there were over 2,000 signatures of the most influential citizens, male and female. The clergy, physicians, and the ladies had separate appeals. Every hope was entertained of a commutation. Mr. Tome, formerly a professor in Oberlin College, is my spiritual advisor and most sincere friend. He, being an intimate friend of the governor, was directed to convey the public request, which he did, and, as I have every reason to believe, plead for me as a father for a son. He started for Columbus a week ago today. After a long consultation, the governor said he would be obliged to consider the matter for a few days. The professor returned in great hopes, but alas, only to be thwarted. Joe Haynes and his Bedford friends hired Palmer, the prosecutor, to draw up a remonstrance, which he did privately. He then proceeded to Columbus several days before Mr. Tome was ready, and so biased the governor's mind that my fate was sealed. There is a great indignation against those interested in the remonstrance. I have more friends today than I ever had, as you will see from the enclosed notes from sympathizing friends. I've written a poem on the, quote, evils of intemperance, end quote, which has been published in all the papers here and is considered somewhat of a literary curiosity, giving as it does my opinions of the administration of justice in this state, as also the folly of the death penalty. There is so much truth in it that some are offended, but those few conscientious ones are much impressed by the argument. Such is the law, however, and I must abide by it. On Friday next, the 9th of February, my life will be sacrificed for the one gone, only four days from eternity. It is indeed fearful to anticipate the dreadful change from life to death, yet I have had many warnings to abstain from intoxication. 
I have made many resolves only to return to the dreadful vice that has driven me to commit the act, and give you so much sorrow and misery. Earnestly and constantly have I prayed for forgiveness by the Father of Spirits through the mediation of our blessed Savior. It is not for the poor, pleasures of this transient dwelling place that I have wished to live. Oh no, they are all vanity. I wished, had it been the Father's will, to live to atone by being a good and useful servant of his, all my days, and above all, if ever restored to you again, to make up for my neglect to you, by being the best of husbands, to live with you, a good example and a true parent to my boy. But he knows best, he works all things for the best. If I was imprisoned for life, the distance would only be increased. I go home soon to be forgotten by the world. The protector of the fatherless and the widow will provide for you here, and bring us all together around his throne in peace and joy, to worship and to serve him evermore. And now let me give you my best advice. A life for a life is the decree. When mine is given, the debt is paid. In that country, the public are not acquainted with, and as a general rule, are too superstitious to weigh the extenuating circumstances of my sad case. The consequence, the disgrace, will consistently be alluded to, and by the too many ignorant, you will be a constant source of humiliating remembrance to hurt your feelings. Here, on the contrary, the whole people sympathize with you already, and after the penalty of crime is dispersed, they will do all to help you. Americans have been my best friends. They are too forgiving to let you suffer for what I have done, too hospitable to see you unprotected. Several have already promised to assist you. The Reverend Mr. Tome has given me his worthy care for Johnny, and he is a man of his word. From all I have heard and know of him, there is not another man on earth I would sooner leave the charge of my son to in preference to him. He will be a better guardian than I ever could be, and having been a professor of one of our celebrated colleges, he above all others is able to train him up in the way he should go, and as a servant of God himself will bring up my dear boy in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. To follow the example of our Savior, which is my most anxious prayer, Mr. Cubbon, his two daughters, and Eddie were to see me today. He says, and you have enjoyed it before, that while he has a home, you are welcome to it. Others, too, have said the same. Therefore, I beg you to lose no time, to mortgage or sell the cottages. They are of no use to you. And come, come to dear ones, right to this free noble country. You will be protected and provided for, and Johnny may be an honor to it. And with such an opportunity as he is here offered, may, by his virtues, wipe out the stain which his unfortunate father's crime has given to the family. Come then at once, you will be near my remains, and, if the great father of spirits allow, those of the departed to visit those below, I will be near you. My dear wife, you say that you forgive me, and that your heart still warms to me. That has been a great plea to God for his forgiveness. I feel that he has forgiven me, and that he will bless you both. Therefore do not despair. Put your constant trust in him. Be resigned, be sober, virtuous, cheerful in the performance of the duties he will give you to perform, and he will never forsake you. John W. Hughes End of footnote End of section 69section 70 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Alfred S. Pell for Assault and Battery, New York City, 1816. The Narrative A New York gentleman and his wife stopped one evening at a public garden where they sat down at a table and ordered refreshments. When the waiter brought them, he likewise brought a lamp, which the customer told him to take back. He returned with it, and the proprietor, who informed him that it was a rule of the garden that a light should be kept up when strangers were in the garden. This made the customer wroth. He abused the proprietor, telling him that he was a gentleman of consequence, and that the lady was his wife, and he ended by throwing the beer in his face. Brought before the court for assault and battery, he pleaded that the proposal of the proprietor was an insult, that such a regulation was unknown anywhere else. But the court decided that it was a proper regulation, and even if not, it was not a justification for the assault. The Trial In the Court of General Sessions, 
New York City, September 1818. Honorable Cadwallader D. Colvin, Mayor. Anthony Underhill, John Morris, Alderman. August 3rd. The defendant was indicted for an assault and battery committed on James Heaton on June 15, 1818. Pierre C. Van Wyck, District Attorney for the People. Mr. Anton for the defendant. Footnote. Anton John, 1784-1863. to Born in Detroit, Michigan. Graduated Columbia College, 1801. A leader of the New York Bar from 1820 to his death. Author of numerous law books and founder of the New York Law Institute. Brother of Dr. Charles Anton, the classical scholar. End of footnote. The Witness james heaton am keeper of a public garden at number three sixteen broadway on the evening of june fifteen by reason of a heavy rain during the day the garden was not open nor lighted up it was a regulation which i had adopted ever since i kept the garden to have it lighted in the evening whenever company was admitted i considered the rule reasonable and proper for among some of the many strangers of both sexes resorting there the want of such precaution might have invited acts which would have had a tendency to bring discredit on my establishment. About eleven o'clock in the evening, defendant and company of a woman came through the house into the garden and called for some beer, which was brought by my servant. On ascertaining that a man and woman were in the garden, I sent a light by the servant to be placed in the usual place near them. Defendant sent back the servant with a light. I again sent the light, which was again sent back. I then took the light myself, and carried it to the defendant and his companion, and informed them of the regulation. He replied with abruptness that neither myself nor his light was wanted, that the woman was his wife, and that he was a gentleman of consequence. I insisted that, as they were strangers to me, the light should be kept in the garden, in pursuance of the rule which I endeavored to convince him was reasonable and proper but after bestowing abusing epithets on me, he cast the glass with its contents of beer at me. The liquor wet me, but the glass did not touch me. Afterwards, defendant made a pass at me with an umbrella, and threatened to run me through, but the thrust was parred off by a bystander. The watch was called, and defendant sent to the watch-house. The defense was that, as defendant was in a public garden with his wife, Heaton was guilty of insult and impertinence towards them by requiring the light to be kept there contrary to their wishes, in pursuance of a pretended regulation which no other keeper of a public garden in this city had adopted. The counsel for the defendant called on witnesses stated to be keepers of public gardens to prove that no such regulation existed among them. The court rejected the evidence offered. Colden, Mayor, to the jury the keeper of a public house and of a public garden, are invested with equal rights. And in my opinion, the prosecutor had a right, and it was his duty to establish such regulations as were calculated to prevent acts of disorder and licentiousness. For it would be manifestly unjust and inconsistent for this court to punish the keepers of public places of amusement or entertainment for the occurrence of such acts in their establishments, and at the same time decide against their right of preventing disorder. Heaton, on this occasion, required nothing unreasonable. Defendant was an utter stranger, whom the proprietor could not be presumed to know as a man of consequence, and he was bound to submit to a regulation salutary in itself, and which ought to be, if it had not been adopted by the keeper of every public garden in the city. But suppose that Heaton acted entirely wrong in requiring the light to be placed in the garden. Still, this could afford no justification to the defendant for the assault and battery. The jury returned a verdict of guilty. The court fined the defendant fifty dollars in costs. Note by the reporter. A garden in the country is considered a small piece of ground set apart from the farm for the purpose of raising vegetables. But in the city, the public gardens referred to in this case are pieces of ground through which there is a walk on each side of which there is a number of small roofed apartments separated from each other by a railing calculated for the free admission of air and many of them are otherwise shaded with woodbine or other vines these apartments contain each a table and benches that several persons in the same company may be seated during the warm season in the evening the gardens are usually lighted up with lamps on each side of the walk 
as small companies frequently resort to these places and call on the keeper for mead, beer, cakes, or other refreshments. End of section 70. Section 71 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Catherine Leach. American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. The trial of David F. Mayberry for the murder of Andrew Alger, Wisconsin, 1855 part one the narrative in the early days of the state of wisconsin a man named mayberry who had been a mormon at nauvoo afterwards a horse dealer a convict and a cooper was working for a man named macomb in rockford illinois learning in some way or other that a lumber dealer one alger had sold a raft of lumber in rockford and was to get his money at beloit wisconsin he set out for that place, and being familiar with the road Alger would go to reach his home after he was paid, he bought a hatchet and waited on that road for him. When Alger appeared driving in a wagon, he asked him for a ride, which request Alger granted, inviting him to get into the wagon. Going through the woods, he killed Alger with the hatchet, appropriated his money, papers, and clothing, and rode the horse to Rockford. The next day, while drunk, he told the whole story to Macomb, who at once notified the police, who arrested him, and he was turned over to the Wisconsin authorities. Tried for the murder of Alger, his only defense was that he was drunk when he talked to Macomb, and that the whole story was false. But the evidence of his guilt was overwhelming, and he was promptly convicted. The interest of this sordid case is, however, not in the story, but in the sequel. Wisconsin had abolished the death penalty for murder. Alger had for years carried on the business of rafting in Rock River, near the town of Janesville, where the trial took place. He had become well known among the raftsmen, who esteemed him as a kind, upright man, and who, when they learned that the only punishment for his inhumane and revolting crime, the murder of their friend, while he was suspicious of no danger, and while he was doing an act of kindness to the murderer, was imprisonment in the penitentiary, they determined to avenge the crime themselves, and their desire was doubtless increased by the words of the prosecuting attorney in opening the case to the jury on the trial. At any rate, after the judge had sentenced Mayberry to imprisonment for life, and he was being taken from the courthouse back to the jail, he was seized by a great mob, which filled the streets, and hanged until he was dead to an adjoining tree. The Trial Footnote 1 Bibliography Trial of David F. Mayberry for the murder of Andrew Alger before the Rock County Circuit Court, Judge Doolittle presiding, July 10th and 11th, 1855, containing the arguments of the attorneys and a full and correct account of his death by the mob. Reported by Ira C. Jenks, Esquire, Janesville. Messrs. Baker, Bennett, and Hall, Printers and Publishers, 1855. The pamphlet gives a brief account of Mayberry's life. He was a native of Tennessee, about 30 years of age. At 21, with his wife and parents, he joined the Mormons and was living at Nauvoo when Joseph Smith was killed. After this, he left Nauvoo joined a party of horse thieves, was arrested for horse stealing, and sent to the Alton Penitentiary for seven years. His parents had meanwhile moved to Salt Lake City, and his wife, hearing he was dead, had married again. After leaving prison, he worked at Rockford, at the Cooper's Trade, which he had learned in prison, and became acquainted with the Macomb family. In stature he was six feet high, with a muscular frame, his complexion was fair, his eyes were gray and small, and his nose long and sharp. End footnote 1 In the Circuit Court, Rock County, Wisconsin, Janesville, July 1855 Honorable James R. Doolittle Judge 
Footnote 2. Doolittle James Rude, 1815-1897, born in Hampton, New Jersey, graduated Hobart College, 1834, admitted to Bar, 1837, moved to Racine, Wisconsin in 1851. Circuit Judge, 1852-1856. United States Senator, 1857-1863. End footnote 2. July 10th. The prisoner, having been previously indicted for the murder of Andrew Alger and the trial having been set for today, an immense concourse of people from all parts of the county and state assemble to see the prisoner. For hours before the opening of the court, not only the courthouse, but the hill between it and the jail was literally alive with human beings. There was no great excitement, but every countenance bespoke a determination to see that justice should not be stayed until it had fully avenged the foul deed. The court had ordered an additional number of jurors to be summoned, and forty answered to their names. At half-past eight the clerk commenced drawing the names, and at ten o'clock the following jurors had been selected and sworn. George Patchen, A.C. Randall, C.M. Messer, Levi St. John, Daniel O. Rayner, George Sherman, Uriah Schutt, John Alexander, F. A. Humphrey, Ira Fish, H. Stafford, Samuel Cadwalder, George B. Ely, District Attorney, and David Nogle for the state. Footnote 3. Nogle, David, 1809-1878, to 1878, born in Franklin, Pennsylvania, early went to Ohio, then to Illinois, where he studied law and was admitted to the bar in 1838. Went to Wisconsin in 1839, where he soon acquired a large practice, served in the Wisconsin Assembly 1857, Judge Circuit Court 1858-1866. Chief Justice of Idaho Territory, 1874. He was a man of great natural capacity and of uncommon force and will of character, and a powerful advocate before a jury. End footnote 3. James L. Loop and A. Hyatt Smith for the prisoner. Footnote 4. Smith A. Hyatt, 1814-1892, born in New York City, admitted to New York Bar, 1835, removed to Janesville, Wisconsin, 1842, elected to State Constitutional Convention, 1847, Attorney General, 1847, United States District Attorney, 1848. End footnote 4. By request of counsel for the prisoner, the witnesses on the part of the prosecution were excluded from the courtroom while others were examined and their testimony taken. Mr. Loop stated to the court that he had lately received a letter from his associate counsel saying that he had been obliged to go to the state of Vermont on business of importance and would not be able to be in attendance upon the trial of the prisoner. Mr. Loop asked to have A. Hyatt Smith assigned by the court as associate counsel. Mr. Smith I can hardly call myself an attorney of this court, having hardly been in the courtroom during the last three years, but if I can be of any service to Mr. Loop, I will cheerfully accept to become his associate in this trial. He was then assigned as associate counsel by the court. Mr. Ely, to the jury. This is the first time in a long period that the public prosecutor has been called upon in this county to prosecute a criminal for the crime of murder. It is the first time in a long period that the court has been obliged to sit upon a trial like the one which he is called on to sit today. Mr. Ely stated the fact of the prisoner being in the penitentiary of Illinois, of his being released and going to the house of John G. Macomb, near Rockford, that he left Macomb on or about the 16th day of June last for this state, 
that he was seen in Janesville and afterward in company with the deceased in a wagon going toward Milton, that the same night he was seen in Janesville with the horse and wagon belonging to the deceased, that the prisoner was afterward seen by Macomb and his two sons with the horse and wagon, a large quantity of money, articles of clothing, etc., which he confessed to Mr. Macomb and his two sons to have taken from the person of the murdered man. We shall show beyond a reasonable doubt by the confessions of the prisoner and an abundance of corroborating testimony that the deceased came to his death by the hands of Mayberry. The indictment I will not read at length. It charges that on the 16th day of June last, in the town of Harmony, in the county of Rock, one David F. Mayberry made an assault on one Andrew Alger, with malice aforethought, with intent to kill him, and did kill and murder him. I understand that the counsel on the part of the defense intend to show, if possible, that the prisoner, at the time he made the confession to Macomb, was disqualified by intoxication from making a deliberate and voluntary confession. But, gentlemen of the jury, how much it is in accordance with human nature that after having stained his hands in the blood of his fellow man, and with that enormous weight of guilt upon his conscience, he would seek some person to whom he could open his bosom, and by a full confession of his guilt, be relieved from the burden which was then crushing him to earth. Mr. Loop Gentlemen of the jury, it is incumbent on the part of the prosecution to prove the prisoner guilty of the offense charged against him, and until he is proved to be guilty, you must suppose him to be innocent. The state claims that the defendant has made certain confessions or statements upon which they intend to rely and upon which they tell us their case is based. But, gentlemen, we shall endeavor to show to you that these statements claimed to have been made to Macomb are unreasonable in themselves, and if made at all, were made by the defendant while in a state of intoxication, which would render him incapable to make a deliberate and voluntary statement. It is unreasonable to suppose this man in his drunken frenzy should give such a description of the place and the exact spot where the body of the murdered man could be found, that Macomb or any other person could come to the place without difficulty and point it out to those with him. It is too unnatural to be true. We know that we come to this trial under very unfavorable auspices. There is not a man in this courtroom whose mind is not biased by prejudice or sympathy. The newspapers have heralded through the country the fact of a cruel and cold-blooded murder having been committed here in your midst. And this man has been pointed out as the murderer. The infection has been spread throughout the whole country until it has reached every home and fireside. The very air we breathe is filled with it. We know that you would wish to give the prisoner a fair and unbiased trial. But, gentlemen, before you can do it, you will have to relieve your minds of every prejudice or sympathy, and come here as you would if you had heard nothing of this murder. We do not intend to allow the statements made to Macomb to come back to you on this trial, and if they do come before you, it must be by an order of this court, and I do not believe, gentlemen, that this court will allow it. They have brought men here to swear that they saw this man on the road near Rockford with a horse and buggy. But, gentlemen, there is not a man in this courtroom who could here recognize a stranger he may have met on his way here. They have brought a man here who saw some person on the road leading to Rockford with a horse and wagon. He has been to the jail in Rockford and says that the prisoner is the same man he saw on the road and it was just as easy for him to see the same man in the jail that he saw on the road as it is to see a, quote, nigger in the fence while you are looking for one, end quote. Whether this prisoner is innocent or guilty, I do not know. I must believe him to be innocent. At least he has ever protested his innocence to me and to every person who has conversed with him except, perhaps, the Macombs. What our defense will be, or whether we shall introduce any evidence, remains to be shown.
The Witnesses for the State John G. McComb Reside in Winnebago County, Illinois. Know the prisoner. Became acquainted with the person the last of October or the first of November, 1854. He boarded with me occasionally during the winter, and part of the time he was in Rockford. He usually deposited his money with me for safekeeping. He came to my house about the 1st of June and left Tuesday before the 16th of June. He worked for me during that time. He left my house and said he was going to Janesville. I saw him next on the Sunday following at my house. Mr. Ely Did you at that time have any conversation with the prisoner, and if so, will you go on and state what the conversation was? Mr. Loop Asked to leave to examine the witness as to the condition of the prisoner and whether when he made these statements he was not in a state of intoxication which request was granted. John G. McComb He came to my house about eleven o'clock on Sunday. He was not drunk, but his face was redder than usual. I cannot say that he drank at my house until after supper. I put questions to him which induced him to make the statements to me. I did not promise that if he would make these statements— he should be protected. My two sons and Mr. Weatherby were at my house at that time. Mr. Loop objected to the testimony of Macomb being received in evidence, on the ground that the prisoner was disqualified by intoxication from making a deliberate and voluntary confession, which would be necessary to allow a confession to be given in evidence. The court ruled that the matter was one to be commented upon by the counsel in summing up the cause to the jury leaving it to them to say how much weight should be attached to it. John G. McComb The first conversation I had with the prisoner was between four and five Sunday afternoon. Asked him where he stayed the night before, and he said at Menzies at Rockford. He arrived at my house between two and three in the afternoon. We were in the garden together when Mayberry said to me, Look here, and held out a handful of papers asked what he was going to do with them, and he said he was going to burn them. Asked him where he got them, and he said he got them from a lumberman. He then took out a woolen sock in which there was something about as large as my fist. Sock showed witness. That is the sock, but I think there is not as much in it. We then went into supper. After supper he wanted me to go to the river with him. We went down to an old house near the river. He asked me to go down to the brick kiln and see a little horse he had down there. Asked where he got the horse, and he said he got him off a lumberman. Asked what the name of the man was, and he said he did not know. He said he got in with a lumberman about Janesville and rode with him till they came to the woods and when they got in the woods on the road leading from Janesville to Milton, he struck him. Said he gave him some liquor to drink about one hundred rods before they came to the woods. I asked how he managed when he struck him, and he said that he rose up in the wagon and struck the man, that the horse sprung when he caught up the reins and drove off into the woods, that after they got into the woods he struck him three times with a hatchet and kicked him out of the wagon, and then drove off and tied the horse. He said that he then went back to where he first struck the man and got his hat, which fell off when he was struck. He told me that he stripped off all the clothes except his shirt and drawers, that he searched his pockets and took all the money, two or three wallets, two watches, a knife that there was a hundred and twenty dollars in paper money and the rest in gold. He did not show me the wallets, but he did show me the watch. We then arrived at the horse and wagon, which was about three-fourths of a mile down the road from the old house. He was quite intoxicated while we were at the wagon, asked him to describe the road upon which he killed him, and he said after he had left Janesville on the road to Milton, he passed a little piece of timber, then crossed a prairie, and came to another piece of woods, then went down a little hill, and there was the place he killed him. 
He said that he left the man lying on his back. He said it was done on Saturday preceding the day which he told me. He said he bought the hatchet at Beloit because his cane was not sufficient to kill the old cuss. In speaking of the man he killed, he always called him, quote-unquote, the old cuss. He said he came back with the old man's horse and wagon to Janesville. There he bought a new suit of clothes. From there he started for Rockford, but lost his way in the night and came out near Sugar River, where he stayed all night. We arrived at the wagon about dark and came out of the woods about eleven o'clock at night. There was a hatchet, a pair of shoes, and a bottle of liquor in the wagon. The shoes and hatchet showed witness. Those are the shoes, and this is the hatchet I saw in the wagon. When he returned, there was no one at my house except my wife and family. Soon after, about a dozen men came in and arrested Mayberry. I then went with Mr. Brown and Mr. Miller to the wagon, and they took the hatchet and shoes from the wagon. The sheriff took the knife from Mayberry at my house. Mayberry said that he struck the old man with the hatchet, and that the hat he had was the old man's hat. Cross-examined by Mr. Loop. Mayberry came to my house about noon Sunday. We had the first conversation about five o'clock in the afternoon. The first thing he said was to look here and held out some papers. Asked him what he was going to do with them, and he said burn them. He then turned partly around and took out the sock and shook it and said, I got that. We then went into the house and took supper. After supper we went down to the old house. He then asked me to go down and see what a fine little horse and buggy he had got down there. Told him I didn't want to go. Had not before heard that he had a horse and wagon. Went and watered my cows and returned to the house when I found Mayberry was there. He touched me on the leg and said, Come out here, and went out into the yard. Followed him out and asked him if he wanted anything of me, and he said he did. We then went down past the old house and took the river road and went to the horse and wagon. There we drank some liquor, conversed with him about the murder. After we went to the old house and before we went into the woods, I went to Mr. Miller's and told him the circumstances, and he said he would go right off for the sheriff at Rockford. Do not think I told Mr. Miller Mayberry was drunk when he came down to my house. Can't say that I have told anyone he was drunk when he came to my house. Think I made him drunk myself. We were lost in the woods, and I got him to drink every time we turned around. Can't say that I was intoxicated. I have lived at the place twelve years. I saw seven twenty-dollar gold pieces. I do not positively know how much money Maryberry had when he left my house. I do not know that he received one hundred dollars from Mr. Munger. I paid him $34.50 when he left beside the money he had deposited with me. It all amounted to $65. Do not know that I told Mr. Plato that he was beastly drunk. If I did, it was not true. Don't think I was intoxicated. Was anxious to get him drunk. My object was to get him so drunk that I would be safe while alone with him in the woods. The horse and wagon I deposited with Mr. Howland in this place. E. A. Howland. E. A. Howland. Two weeks ago today, Mr. McComb deposited a horse and wagon with me. It was a dark horse. Have shown the horse and wagon to Mr. Peck. Erasius McComb. Became acquainted with prisoner two or three weeks before he left. He left Tuesday morning and came back Sunday following. Saw him when he returned. I should not consider him drunk. Asked him what luck he had on his voyage. He said very good. He pulled off the hat he had on his head and said, You can see by this what kind of luck I have had. I killed a man for it. I asked him if that was all he got. He said no. He pulled out five $20 gold pieces. Asked if he killed him for that. He said no. He then pulled out a stocking with notes in it. Asked him what was the name of the man he killed. Said he did not ask him what his name was. Then asked what kind of man he was. He said he was a pinery bug. Said he killed him between Janesville and Milton, 
with a weapon he had. Asked him where it was. He said it was in the buggy in the woods. He then showed a knife and said he finished him with that, and it was the old cuss's knife. Asked him what he'd done with the man. He said he left him in the brush. He showed me two watches, the knife, pocketbook, and stocking. This was about two o'clock in the afternoon. Cross-examined. Have known Mayberry three or four weeks. Have been in the habit of visiting my father's every day. Live close by him. Am the son of John G. McComb. When I asked him what kind of luck he had had, I supposed he had been stealing horses. Had some conversation with him about stealing horses. Have never been engaged in that business myself. If I had, I have sense enough to keep it to myself. Did not notice that he was intoxicated that night. I was not in the house at the time he was arrested. Halsey McComb Shall be twenty next April. McComb is my father, I suppose. Live at home. Saw Mayberry on the 17th of June. He left father's on the 12th of June. He said he had been to Milton and Janesville. Said he killed a man between Milton and Janesville. Said he asked him to ride, and after he had rode a piece, he rose up in the wagon to put on his coat and took a hatchet out of his sleeve, where he had it concealed, and struck him three times and killed him. Said he then kicked him out of the wagon and took his clothes and money. Said the old man said, O oh Lord, have mercy, two or three times, and he told him if he did not shut his D.D. head, he would cut his throat. Said he laid down and waited an hour and a half. Remember that Mayberry said it was done on the 16th because he said it would be in the papers that it was done on the 16th. He said that he was not to be trifled with. Said he had been in Milton and picked out the place before. He showed me the clothes. Witness identifies them. Said he came to Rockford with the horse and wagon that he met a man on the road near some cattle, that he saw Smith Collier, but did not think Smith knew him. This watch is the one I bought of Mayberry. Took the watch home and hung it up. Have seen all the things on the table with Mayberry. He showed me the money. It was principally gold. He said he got the knife off the man he killed. Cross-examined was out to the barn about noon when someone said Mayberry is coming. Father was in the barn with me. Don't know how the conversation commenced. He showed me some money and said he harnessed a pinery man for it. He did not say at the house where he got the money. Went with him down into the woods, and we had most of our conversation there. While we were going down into the woods, he took the knife out of a stump and said he killed a man, and that was his knife. He said the man was small-sized, went down where the horse and buggy was, and saw the shoes there. Have seen other shoes like these, but am certain these are the shoes he showed me. He said the holes in the hat were made on the man's head. He showed me the stocking, and very sure that this is the same stocking. Bought the watch of Mayberry and gave him a trunk. Did not know when I bought it that he killed a man for it. Went down into the woods only once. Don't remember meeting a man. Did not go fishing that day. The wagon was about three-fourths of a mile down the river. Think Mayberry went down three times that day. First with me, then alone, and afterward with father. Saw him talking with father in the garden. I did not think he was drunk until about ten or eleven o'clock at night. Think he was drunk when he came back with father. Know from his looks and talk. John F. Taylor. Am sheriff of Winnebago County, Illinois. I have seen Mayberry before. Saw him in December last at Rockford. Since that time he has been at work there at the Cooper's Trade. Saw him on the 17th of June. Some man came to my house and said that Mayberry had murdered a man. I got a warrant for his arrest, and went to the house of Macomb. Was told that he was in the woods. I went in the cellar, and stayed until he came from the woods. About twelve o'clock. Went into the house, told him I had a warrant for him, 
and put the irons on him. Told Mr. Miller to search his pockets. The things taken from his pockets were handed to me. Took from his pockets two pocketbooks, one containing $176 in bills. There was five $20 gold pieces loose in his pockets. The knife was found in the pockets of some of the clothes. After searching his pockets, I told him to bring forward his clothes. These clothes were brought forward loose, told Mayberry to select his clothes, and we would take them along. He said they were all his. He has since told me that they belong to Macomb. Prisoner said the money was his, that the red wallet he never saw until I showed it to him. I stayed at Macomb's until the horse and buggy came. At least they told me it had come. I did not see it. He claimed the shoes being his. In the jail, he denied the clothes being his. William Brown. Reside at Rockford. Am state attorney for 14th Judicial District of Illinois. Saw the prisoner three weeks ago last Sabbath evening. He was at McCombs. Went down in company with the sheriff and several others to arrest him. About nine o'clock in the evening, Mr. Taylor said to the prisoner that he had a warrant for him and immediately put the irons upon him. Miller and myself searched his pockets. Someone asked where he got the money, and he said he worked for it. Went with the others into the woods, and after considerable difficulty we found the horse and wagon. The hatchet and shoes were handed to me from the wagon. Don't know whether he had the hat on or not. Next day came with Macomb and others to Janesville to search for the body. We went in a northeasterly direction from Janesville about four miles when he came to a piece of woods where he found a number of persons searching. We continued to search and found a large quantity of blood, and five or six rods from that we found a man lying on his back with his throat cut from ear to ear, three wounds on the head from which the brain protruded, and three cuts in the back and side. The body was nearly naked, with no clothes except a shirt and part of a pair of drawers. The body was taken up and put into a double wagon and taken to Janesville. Mr. McComb, the sheriff of Rock County, a constable from Janesville, and a number of others were there when the body was found. W. M. Spalding Was called upon by Sheriff Hoskins to take the body of a man which had been found in the woods to Janesville, brought the body to Janesville and deposited it in the courthouse. An inquest was held by Justice Bates. Dr. O. P. Robinson and practicing physician residing in this city, was called upon 18th June last to examine the body of a man in a room directly below where I sit. There were three wounds upon the head, two upon the forehead breaking through the frontal bone. The fracture was about three inches long and one and one-fourth inches wide. Appeared to have been made by some blunt instrument. Should think that they might have been made with the head of a hatchet. There was a severe wound in the neck, severing the arteries, another wound an inch and one-fourth in width upon the left side between the ninth and tenth rib, entering the lung, another wound similar in size passing through the fifth and sixth rib, another wound was made upon the side which was larger and penetrated no farther than the tenth rib. The wounds upon the head would have caused death, Either of the two wounds upon the back or the one on the neck were mortal. The wound on the side might have been made by a hatchet. The body had been preyed upon by vermin, and the muscles about the wounds considerably contracted. The wounds upon the back were made with a knife at least an inch in breadth. They were made before the one in the neck. I judge from the coagulated blood which surrounded them. Mr. Conrad was present at the examination. A. G. Allen. Reside in Janesville. Am in the clothing business with M. S. Smith on Main Street. Have seen the prisoner before. Saw him on the 16th of June last. He came into the clothing store about nine o'clock in the evening to buy a suit of clothes. I sold a suit of clothes to him. Witness recognized a pair of pants he sold Mayberry. Prisoner said he was going to Milton, and he lived and worked at Milton. Cross-examined. 
I had never seen prisoner before that night. Mr. McIntyre was in the store. These pants, I think, are the ones I sold him. They have our mark upon them. Seldom sell clothes to strangers. Recognize the prisoner by his general appearance. Generally recognize persons to whom I sell goods. Would have recognized the prisoner without knowing he was arrested. Mr. McIntyre. The prisoner is the man to whom Allen sold the clothes. Dr. R. B. Treat. Am a practicing physician. Made a post-mortem examination of deceased. He was a small-sized man, had no clothing on except a red shirt. The body had a healthy appearance. The principal wounds were upon the head, neck, and back. I could not tell with what kind of an instrument it was done. Perhaps two blows with the head of a hatchet might have done it. The skull was fractured, and the integument over the fracture cut in two places. It looked as if it was done with some blunt instrument. The wound upon the neck was severe, severing the arteries and extending back to the spinal column. It must have been done with an instrument about an inch wide, there were marks of a knife or some sharp instrument apparent upon the surface. There must have been several strokes with a knife to have made the wound. There were two wounds upon the back, probably made with the same instrument as the wound on the neck. The instrument passed through between the ninth and tenth rib and penetrated the pleury. Either of these wounds would have been fatal. There were also two wounds upon the side which were very probably made by the same broad instruments. The wounds upon the back appeared to have been made prior to the wound on the neck. The blood had coagulated around the wounds on the back quite extensively. The wound upon the neck would have produced death in one or two minutes. The wound upon the neck might have been made before those on the back. I do not think there is blood on the knife. There is blood on the coat and I think there is on the handle of the hatchet. Chas H. Conrad Was well acquainted with the deceased, identified the body as that of Andrew Alger, would have known it if it had been found anywhere. E. G. Fifield Was personally acquainted with Andrew Alger, recognized the body as his, had a conversation about some lumber with Alger in this city, on the 16th day of June last, while Alger was on his way home. I took the body home to his friends in Jefferson County after the inquest was held. Josiah Alger. Reside in Farmington, Jefferson County. I'm the son of Andrew Alger, the deceased. Last saw father in Beloit on Wednesday prior to his death. He had been to Rockford with square lumber. He had $580 when I left him principally gold. A number of papers shown witness with signatures of deceased and a knife was shown witness. That knife I have ate many a meal of victuals with. It is one which belonged to father and which he usually carried with him. The pocket book I have seen many times. Saw it last at Beloit on Wednesday prior to father's death. He had it and gave me some money from it. The portmoney was father's. Last saw it in Rockford. Father put some gold in it. The watch I never saw. That coat is father's. No by a hole burned in the neck. Last saw it on him at Beloit. He had the pants on at Beloit and a pair of overalls over them. Think the hat is the one he bought in Beloit while I was with him. Never saw the linen coat before. The coffin was opened after I came home but I could not recognize the features. It looked awful. I could not stand it to look at it. Cross-examined. Father was in the habit of being away from home, sometimes stay longer than he said he should, but never longer than a week, to my knowledge. End of section 71. Section 72 of American State Trials, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Catherine Leach.
American State Trials, Volume 2, by John D. Lawson. The trial of David F. Mayberry for the murder of Andrew Alger, Wisconsin, 1855, Part 2. Emery Nash Am clerk in hardware store in this city. Prisoner came into the store in the fore part of the week and inquired for Cooper's tools. Asro Stoddard. Am clerk in Pixley and Kimball's hardware store. Sold a hatchet that week. Do not recognize the prisoner. Can't see our mark on the hatchet. It is similar to those we have in the store. Charles Bell. Know the deceased and recognize his clothing and knife. S. W. Peck. Reside in Beloit. Saw Andrew Alger at that place on the 16th day of June last. Bought a raft of poles off him and turned out a horse and wagon and a watch in part payment. For balance gave him a check on the bank of Beloit. Have seen the horse and wagon at Mr. Howland's barn. It is the one I sold Alger. He left Beloit with the horse and wagon half past eleven. He started off toward Janesville and said he was going home. The check was for three hundred and sixty-six dollars. Orville Bennett Saw Alger in Beloit on the 16th of June. Kept Alger's money the night previous. Asked him if he expected anyone would rob him, and he said he mistrusted two or three. Counted his money. There was five hundred and eighty dollars. He did not give me the names of anyone he suspected. R. E. Henney. Reside at Beloit, am in the clothing business, was acquainted with Andrew Alger, last saw him the 16th of June, sold him a linen coat that day. It was peculiarly made. Should recognize it if I could see it. Coat shown. That is the coat I sold him. Alger took off his old coat and put on the one I sold him. The wallet here is similar to the one I saw him have. He gave me a bill like those in the wallet. He left my store about nine o'clock Saturday morning. John W. Williams. Reside in Utica, Winnebago County, Wisconsin. Went to Beloit on the road by the way of Milton and Janesville. Stopped at Fort Atkinson Friday night, June 15th. Took dinner the 16th with a farmer between here and Milton. Saw the prisoner on the 16th of June. On the road between here and the woods near Mr. Spaulding's. It was between 2 and 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon. When I first saw him, he was standing still. But when I came up, he was walking north. Sometimes I could not tell whether he was going north or south. He acted as if he was waiting for someone. Looked at him particularly and know that the prisoner is the same man. No Andrew Alger. I met him just before I got into Janesville, going towards Milton on the road before I saw the prisoner. Spoke to Mr. Alger as I passed him, and said, How do you do? Cross-examined. Met the prisoner about two or three o'clock. Think it was one and a half to two miles from Janesville? He had a coat on his arm, but none on. R. B. Tracy. The prisoner came to my house about twelve o'clock Saturday night, and wanted to stay all night. Went away in the morning before any of the family were up. Benjamin Allen. Reside in Winnebago County, saw a man that looked like prisoner on the road. He was going toward Rockford, about eight miles from Rockford. Had a conversation with him. He was on foot near the buggy when I first saw him. By the time I had got to where he was, he had got into the buggy. The horse looked tired. Cross-examined. Prisoner was close to the buggy when I saw him. He came from towards some cattle. Afterwards examined the cattle. Two of them were cut on the shoulder. I think I had seen the prisoner before. The cattle were John Atkinson's. Did not mistrust the prisoner until after I saw the cattle were cut. Afterwards saw him in the Rockford jail. It was about eight o'clock in the morning when I saw him on the prairie. Smith Clothier Met the prisoner with a horse and wagon on the road between the place where Allen saw him and Macomb's house. Mrs. Tubbs I reside in this city, on the road to the depot. 
have seen the prisoner at my house. He came there first on Wednesday before the murder. On Thursday he came to stay all night. He said he lived at Rockford. This was Friday morning. He left on Friday about eight o'clock. Have not seen him since. He did not remain but a few minutes on Wednesday. He inquired for Madison. Levi Rexford. Reside in Beloit. Saw prisoner at Beloit three weeks ago last Friday night. He overtook me, half mile, this side of Beloit. Stayed overnight with me. He had a hatchet with him. Think the hatchet before me was the hatchet. Cross-examined. Live on the west side of the river at Beloit. Had been north of Beloit. I was on the Beloit and Janesville Road when prisoner overtook me. It was near sundown. Prisoner was on foot. He left about eight o'clock Saturday morning. He had a hatchet, which he said he found in the road. He showed me a knife. It was not like the knife here in court. Prisoner had on a black hat. James Albert. Reside in Rockford, am deputy sheriff, had a conversation with prisoner after he was arrested. He said he stayed with a man at Beloit on Friday and Saturday nights. James W. Redman. Reside in Rock County, town of Harmony. Found a coat in the woods above Mr. Spaulding's on the east side of the road. It was a yellowish linen coat. The witness examined the linen coat and identified it as the coat he found. It was rolled up when I found it and covered with leaves. I found it on Tuesday, next day after the body was found. The coat was about halfway from where the body laid on the road. Cross-examined. The coat was under some leaves in thick bushes. Went with one of my neighbors to see where the body was found when I found the coat. Found the coat near a place that looked as if a horse had been hitched in the town of Harmony, Rock County. The court. Gentlemen, the case is with you. Mr. Smith. If the court please, I make this proposition, which, upon examination, I find has been supported a number of times on trials of this kind, that if the defendant should not introduce any evidence on his part, that the counsel for the defendant have the opening and closing argument. The court. I do not think, Mr. Smith, that rule could be enforced in this state, and I must deny the proposition. Mr. Smith. Then we rest our case without offering any witnesses, but we then ask that the cause be submitted to the jury without argument. Mr. Nogle. I am assured that persons have come here expecting the prosecuting attorney to make some remarks upon the testimony and to hold the prisoner up in his true character, but I am willing as associate counsel to submit the case to the jury after the court shall have charged them. Mr. Smith. I did not suppose when I made the proposition that it would open the door to a speech. I withdraw the proposition. The Speeches of Counsel. Mr. Ely. May it please the court, gentlemen of the jury, the tragedy of painful interest which has detained you for the past two or three days will soon be terminated. The drama which commenced in blood must find its end with your verdict. You gentlemen who have sat upon your seats and heard the awful and sickening developments, you who have seen the blood-dyed garments of Andrew Alger brought here and placed before you, and who heard the volumes of testimony coming from the side of the prosecution and fastening itself upon the prisoner without a word of evasion or denial, can hardly ask for more conclusive evidence of guilt or a more open and deliberate confession that he who sits before you is the wretch who stained his hands in the blood of his murdered victim, Andrew Alger. The law has wisely provided that no man shall be put upon his trial until he has first been presented by a grand jury, and it is also provided that no man shall be tried for any crime unless by twelve good and lawful men of his country. 
the accused is also entitled to have his accusers appear and confront him face to face. In this trial, all the forms and requirements have been fulfilled, and the case has come down to you to pass upon the guilt or innocence of the prisoner. Gentlemen, I might and was inclined to follow the suggestion of the counsel for the prisoner to submit the case to you without argument. But for some reason, the counsel have seen fit to withdraw their offer and insist upon the argument. And that they may have a fair chance, I will give you the facts which we think are established by the evidence and leave the argument to those who will follow me. The Statute of Our State at Chapter 133 page 688, provides that whoever shall kill a human being with a premeditated design to effect the death of the person killed, whether it be done by treason, shooting, stabbing, or any other means or manner, shall be guilty of murder in the first degree, and by a law since passed shall be punished by imprisonment in the state prison during life whether the law as it now stands, making the punishment for the greatest crime known to our laws, the same as that of a thief or any other felon, except perhaps in the period of duration, is such a one as is most needed, and would be the best protection to the lives of the people, is not for me to say. You gentlemen must follow and enforce the law as it appears upon our statute books and this you have bound yourselves by your oaths to do, however much it might conflict with your own personal feelings. It was said prior to the enactment of our laws, by a power higher than all, that whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For hundreds of years it has been a fixed rule of the common law. Those states which surround us, with hardly an exception, have adhered to the same rule. But in these days of cavil and selfish intriguing, men have in their legislation deemed that the law thundered from Sinai's top was no longer binding upon them. They have and do by their acts say, We are above all law except our own, away with a higher law. However much I might wish that our law at this time was different, as an ardent lover of good order and society, I shall feel it my duty to abide by it until experience shall teach our legislatures that chains and prisons are but idle mockery to the man, who will for the glittering dust of earth take the life of his fellow man. The prisoner before you has confessed to be guilty of one of the foulest murders that ever blackened the pages of history, one in which justice dealt out by human hands must fall short of an aggregate punishment. We are not here for the purpose of revenge. There is another power which has said, Vengeance is mine and I will repay, saith the Lord God of Israel. We come here for the protection of society, our families, and ourselves. Mr. Ely read the substance of the several counts in the indictment and cited several authorities where persons had been convicted upon circumstantial evidence without any direct corroborating testimony, also that drunkenness was not an excuse for committing crime, and closed with a brief statement of the facts claimed to have been proved. Mr. Loop Gentlemen of the jury, when we determined that we would introduce no testimony on the part of the prisoner, we expected to submit this cause to you on the charge of the court. But the remarks of one of the gentlemen engaged in the prosecution in according our proposition so to submit the cause, were of that character which forbid that we should do so, and accordingly that proposition on our part was withdrawn. We are not unaware, gentlemen, that there is a vast amount of testimony in this case tending to prove the prisoner guilty, and we enter upon the argument of the questions involved with full knowledge of the fact that from the time of the discovery of the dead body in your county, bearing evidence that death had been produced by violence, and the connection of the prisoner's name with the supposed murder. His case was prejudged in the public mind, and his guilt proclaimed by the almost universal voice. And we cannot suppose, gentlemen, that you have kept yourselves entirely secluded from the outdoor world, 
and from the knowledge of passing events, as to be unmindful of public sentiment, or that you are so unlike the rest of mankind as to be entirely unaffected by the reports which have appeared in the public journals, and have been proclaimed and discussed by every gathering of men, women, or children, since this community was thrilled and electrified by this supposed horrid murder. But, gentlemen, these facts have not inspired in our bosoms any feeling of distrust, or cause us to waver in our faith that you will, in the verdict which you shall render honestly and intelligently, consider the evidence adduced in all its bearings, and decide as impartial justice and the rules of law demand. The prisoner comes before you as a marked man. The human mind is so constituted that it is almost impossible to disconnect the name of the man charged with the heinous crime of murder from the fact of the murder with which he is charged. Your own citizens have seen, and in their testimony have described in not too startling and sickening terms, the body of the murdered man and the testimony of three witnesses before you tend to show that the prisoner confessed that his was the hand which had perpetrated the dreadful deed. And whether true or false, whether the confession was made or is a mere fabrication of the witnesses, the effect is the same in marking him as the man and fixing in the mind the impression of guilt. We enter, therefore, gentlemen, upon the discussion of the question involved in this case, and upon an examination of the evidence by which it is contended on the part of the state that the prisoner's guilt is established, with no false notion of the task which duty assigns us. We feel and duly appreciate the fact that when the prisoner was arraigned in this case, the statuary rule of law which declares that the accused shall be presumed to be innocent was reversed or regarded as mere fiction, and that the deep-seated impression of guilt is one of the things which we must remove, that independent of the circumstances tending to show guilt in which he is enveloped. The fact of the association of his name with so great a crime fosters suspicion upon the mind, which is almost equal to proof. We are not, then, gentlemen, entering upon this argument with any mistaken notion of our position, or of the necessity which imposes itself upon us of enforcing upon you, so far as we are able, the great importance in justice to the prisoner, and in justice to ourselves, and in justice to the law which you are aiding in administering of divesting from your minds every bias, prejudice, and preconceived opinion or impression, and giving to the evidence its legitimate force and effect, and nothing more. Of what does the evidence consist? First, of pretended confessions, and second, of circumstances, there being no direct proof of the fact of murder. The indictment charges the prisoner with the murder of Andrew Alger. The first great fact to be proved on the part of the state is that Andrew Alger is dead, that the dead body found in the thicket was in fact and in truth the body of Andrew Alger. That fact must be established beyond a reasonable doubt or this prosecution cannot be sustained. The body must be identified, and it must be proven in such a manner as to exclude the possibility of a doubt in regard to his death, and in such a manner to satisfy the mind, beyond question that the dead body is the body of the person charged to have been murdered. The identification must be of that conclusive character which will exclude every other possible hypothesis. It must be such as to fasten conviction upon the mind, not mere suspicion. It must be such as excludes the possibility that the person alleged to be dead is alive. There is no one thing, gentlemen, which is apparently so easy and yet so difficult as personal identification of even the living, and how vastly the difficulty is increased in the attempt to identify the dead. It is in life that we meet and recognize our fellow men, when the eye has its living luster and the features their accustomed play, when the expression which life gives is the great mark of distinction which separates and individualizes the great family of man, when death stamps the individual with his pallid seal, the great change is effected, and that which you have known animated, alive, expressive, joyous with life is changed to an inanimate mass. The life has departed. 
the soul has fled, and that expression which evidenced in life the individuality of the man has departed with the life which gave it. The countenance on which you gaze with admiration and pleasure in life by the great change is made frightful to behold. This is true of those who die by what is called natural causes, old age or disease, and your own observation has taught you that when you have seen one of your neighbors or intimate acquaintances wrapped in death's slumber, even in his own house, you look and look in vain for a natural feature such as distinguished the deceased before the great leveler laid him low. The descriptions which the witnesses have given you of the body found and which is alleged to be that of Andrew Alger are sickening in their minuteness and show in too strong light to admit of doubt the utter impossibility of supposed identification. Ghastly wounds are upon the body. There is no clothing to distinguish it. The vermin have commenced the work of destruction and putrefaction, is blending in one common mass of decay the whole loathsome mass of what had been the physical organization of a man. Add to these the fact that the head was nearly severed from the body by the cut across the throat, the skull was smashed in at the forehead, that the wounds, the eyes, the nose, ears, and mouth were filled with fly blows and worms. I repeat, it is utterly impossible that the witnesses, with the acquaintance they had with Alger in his lifetime, could have recognized that putrid mass and identified it as his body, that the witnesses honestly believed that the body was that of Alger, that they honestly believed, from what they could discern, they recognized both the form and feature of Alger, I have no doubt. But their belief, gentlemen, is no evidence of the existence of the fact which they believe no matter how honestly that belief may have been produced. It is the duty of the witnesses to detail to the jury facts and circumstances, to give you a description of the man in life and the appearance and description of the dead body, and from such description and all the circumstances which are adduced in evidence, it is the duty of the jury to draw conclusions and not the witnesses. The expression of belief cannot legitimately produce conviction in your minds. The object in calling in the aid of the jury in criminal prosecutions is the ascertainment of facts, not suspicions, and to avoid as far as possible the great danger of hasty convictions upon insufficient evidence. Twelve men, twelve individual minds, are to be convinced, each for himself, and each individually responsible for the verdict which the aggregate render. The responsibility on each, in a case of this magnitude, is sufficient to cause the boldest and anxious throb. Test well the facts and circumstances which come to your knowledge by the evidence of the witnesses. But remember that the belief or opinion of a witness can furnish no justification to you, individually or collectively, for a verdict. Test the testimony of the identifying witnesses by their means of knowledge and the circumstances under which this body was searched for, and its appearance when found. And then tell me whether either of those witnesses, had he never been informed of the supposed murder of Alger, and had come accidentally across the body where it was found in the woods, would ever have recognized it as his. The witness who tells you that he would immediately have recognized the body, had he thus found it in New York, talks boldly, but whether discreetly, you must judge. I have said, gentlemen, that the identification of the dead is much more difficult than that of the living, and in this case the prosecution are bound to do both. They must identify the murdered man and also the living murderer. They bring to the aid of the witnesses who attempt to identify the body of Alger certain articles of clothing, a horse and buggy, a watch, a pocket knife, some pocket books containing money, a blue stocking containing gold, and a memorandum book containing some papers shown to have been in the possession of Alger. The son of the deceased swears to many of the articles as having belonged to his father and as having been in his possession when the witnesses left him at Beloit. Of all the evidence, that part identifying the memorandum book is the strongest and the most satisfactory. The knife and the pocket book and the watch are but individual members of the great families to which they respectively belong. They have no name or names marked upon them, 
or any other mark by which they can be identified or distinguished from any others out of similar packages which have been worn and used as much as they. But the memorandum book contains the handwriting of Mr. Alger, and also of his son, the witness. How did he part with it? That is the question, gentlemen, which we are not bound to answer, and circumstances which we cannot be required to explain. He may have lost it, or it may have been stolen from him, or he may have parted with it in any of a thousand ways in which men divest themselves of their goods, without the crime of murder having been perpetrated to obtain it. In whose possession was this book found? The knife and two of the wallets containing the money and the stocking were found upon the person of the prisoner, when arrested and searched by the sheriff of Winnebago County, but not an article of the clothing unless it be the white hat exhibited here, nor his memorandum book, nor his watch and one wallet were found on him, in fact, not an article which has been satisfactorily identified as the property of Alger was found in his possession. The witness Macomb takes the clothing from a box under the stoop on the outside of the house and hands it to the sheriff, and he directs the sheriff to get the memorandum book from the pocket of an overcoat on the table in his house, whose overcoat contained the pocket book. Not the prisoner's, gentlemen, or that fact would have appeared. In whose possession was the third pocket book found? Not in the prisoner's, but after the officers had left the house they are followed, and that wallet is handed to the sheriff by one of the Macombs. By whom were this horse and buggy, which are clearly identified as the same purchased by Mr. Alger in Beloit, and the clothing in the memorandum book, etc., taken to Macombs? The person who drove the horse passed Mr. Clothier and some others when they were on the roadside, not far from the ford, on Rock River, near Macomb's house. Mr. Clothier had known the prisoner in that neighborhood some months. He passed him in broad daylight, and although he says he thought at the time that it was some person he had seen before, he did not think of its being the prisoner and cannot now be induced by any form of question to even say he thinks it was him. To precisely the same effect in the testimony of another witness who was on the road, and nearer the ford than Mr. Clothier. He passed the ford soon after the horse and buggy passed, and saw the track leading up to the place where they were found. Mr. Williams says he saw the prisoner on the road from Janesville to Milton on Saturday afternoon, acting as if in wait for someone. He had never seen him before, knew nothing of or about him, but from merely passing him in the road, he is prepared to come here and swear positively that the prisoner is the man. Mr. Allen, residing south of Harmony, on the road to Rockford, says he met the prisoner with the horse and buggy, and tells us in addition the strange story of the cutting of the cattle, and he says that he had never seen nor heard of him before, but that he knows him and can identify him as easily as he can me and that he has known me many years. Another gentleman tells you that about midnight of Saturday, during a severe thunderstorm, the prisoner stopped at his house between here and Beloit, and stayed until the storm abated, and he knows the prisoner is the man. Now each of these familiar recognitions are to my mind at least singular instances of wonderful powers of recognition, singular instances in retentive memory, and close observation. The two gentlemen who were acquainted with the prisoner failed to recognize in the man who drove the horse across the ford the prisoner, but these gentlemen who have never seen him can identify him without the least inconvenience and with a positiveness that admits of no question. The books containing the history of criminal jurisprudence are filled, gentlemen, with deplorable instances of such positive evidence of identification, followed by the fatal consequences of reliance being placed upon it. Innocent blood has been too often shed by reason of such testimony to allow of it being received and relied upon as sufficient to justify conviction. Who among this vast multitude can remember a stranger that he met on the road coming here today? I venture to say no one. How does it happen that these gentlemen, whose honesty in the matter is not questioned, can thus pretend to and believe that they really remember and recognize the prisoner? The true answer is easily made. 
when mr allen heard that a man was arrested and in jail for murder he heard at the same time the story of macomb about the confession and in it was ingeniously blended the story of the cutting of the cattle and he went to jail on purpose to find the prisoner the same man and all he remembers of the man he met on the prairie is what he has seen of the prisoner since his arrest but he fixed him firmly in his mind and honestly believes he is the same just so with the other two witnesses the story told by macomb is what produces before you the identification such as it is of the body of alger and also of the person of the prisoner it is that story which has brought together this immense multitude of your citizens and which has been told and retold until the very atmosphere we breathe has become tainted with the smell of blood the newspapers informed us as part of macomb's story that the prisoner came to his house on sunday in a state of beastly intoxication and before he was allowed to tell his story to you by permission of the court we examined the witness as to the condition of the prisoner at the time when he pretended the confession was made he failed to show that he was much intoxicated until after a part of the confession had been made and we insisted upon the right to call other witnesses to show preliminarily that the prisoner was drunk with the view of excluding the whole pretended story we contended then as we do now that the confessions of a man made in a state of intoxication when the mind is not in tune when the party is not in condition to deliberate and is not capable of appreciating danger or capable of forming a deliberate opinion when the tongue but gives utterance to the ravings of a crazed drunken brain are not admissible in evidence against him the confessions of a man in his cool sober moments in possession of all his faculties of mind and body are excluded from the jury if they are obtained from him either by threats or promises of favor because such confessions the law declares are not voluntary with how much greater force of reason can the objection we urged against this supposed confession be insisted upon to its exclusion if the fact is made to appear the court decided the point against the prisoner holding we doubt not correctly that it was a question for the jury and that it depended upon the degree of drunkenness in which the confession was made and that the court could not undertake to decide what the prisoner's condition was at the time of the supposed confession but gentlemen of the jury you are constituted judges of both the law and the fact and you are to regard such testimony as is legal and to exclude from your minds in your deliberations that which is illegal or improper mr macomb tells you that when the prisoner first came to his house on monday he was red in the face and that was unusual for him but he did not consider him drunk and that he was not drunk according to his understanding of the meaning of the term until in the evening well mr macomb may have some peculiar notions about when a party is in that condition i once heard a witness testify that he didn't consider a man drunk until he lay upon his back and felt upward for the ground and it is possible that macomb may entertain the same liberal views on the subject the old gentleman tells us he was very drunk in the evening before his arrest and the son erastus says he was no more drunk at any time than when he first came there that day according to the story of halsey macomb immediately after the prisoner came to their house when washing himself by the door on the outside while halsey himself was standing in full sight of several persons in the house not members of the family the prisoner exhibited to him a handful of gold and informed him that he had plenty more that they went upstairs and traded the stolen watch for a trunk with halsey and that they went to the river and the whole story was told and each of the family enjoyed the same blessing each one had his solitary walk with their interesting friend and each heard in full the same horrible details of murder and robbery and of the delightful journey which their pleasant companion enjoyed travelling from the scene of the murder to the residence of his friends not omitting in any instance the highly intellectual sport in which he indulged of cutting the cattle on the prairie with his murderous hatchet now gentlemen was this story ever told 
if ever told by the prisoner, and if true when told, if you look upon him, you look upon a man insane, one in the labyrinth of whose brain reason has lost her sway. And whether such insanity is caused by drunkenness, or whether constitutional, it makes no difference. It is the fact of insanity, not its cause, which places a party without the pale of accountability for his acts, and renders his words of confession powerless as evidence against him. One of two things in my judgment is certain, that the prisoner was bereft of reason, or that the story of the confession is a sheer fabrication. No man in his senses would even have loaded himself with the evidence to convict him of murder as this story loads the prisoner, taking the old clothes from the body of his victim and which were not worth picking up in the road, taking the horse and buggy and pursuing his devious way through all the towns and cities in the daytime and in the night, reaching the house of Macomb soon after noon and taking the family one by one to listen to his story and count over the fruits of his awful crime. The story is too improbable, too unnatural for belief, and whether it is in fact the truly reported conduct and ravings of a maniac or an entire fabrication, it is equally improper, inefficient, and powerless as evidence. Confessions at the best are the most unreliable and dangerous of all species of evidence known to law and the pages of judicial history are stained with the blood of innocent victims sacrificed by means of confessions honestly reported which were untrue, and by pretended confessions, the fabrication of witnesses. Every writer on the subject raises his warning voice against relying upon them, and every page of the history of the administration of criminal law shows the danger and disastrous consequences of relying upon them. We have now, gentlemen, briefly adverted to the evidence in this case, and have very frankly given our views of its legitimate right, and we roll the responsibility off from our shoulders on yours. We know that you must feel the outside pressure of an indignant public, and we have no fault to find with the great public for any demonstration of indignation which it has manifested. But while you may feel, as you ought, indignation against the murderer, justice requires that he shall be ascertained, and his identity fixed beyond a possible question. And when so ascertained, and the guilt is established on any one beyond a reasonable doubt, let your verdict proclaim the fact, and let him suffer the penalty prescribed by your laws. With these remarks, gentlemen, I have done. End of section 72